Chapter 19 Dressing himself in the morning and sense Christian. He'd had enough of wearing Durham's clothes. After a hard day of travel, even his court dress looked better, especially since the linen had been freshly washed by Brihilt. The stockings, neatly rolled, were easy enough, but by the time he'd got the velvet breeches buttoned, he was furious with himself and his fuddled brain and his hands that would not work together properly and made such a simple thing so confounding. After unending frustration, he just got the last fastening closed, using one hand, when he heard the deep boom of an outside door. He looked out the window and saw Maddie Girl, her cloak sweeping out behind her as she headed off over the sheep walk toward the top of the hill. Her direction was away from the village, her pace quick and determined, the deportment of someone leaving. Christian swore. He abandoned the waistcoat in his hand. Coatless, his shirt open, he strode out of the room. Maddie did not know quite where she was going. The storm had brought winter ready honed. A wind from the north stung her cheeks. The downpour of the night before had made a muddy, sodden embarrassment of the garden, but the turf in the field beyond sprang back beneath her feet, resilient, just beginning to freeze, so that every step had a little wet crunch in it. She held her skirt up, though it hardly made any difference now. Her best gray was so mended and stained that best was no longer a fair description. At the top of the hill she stopped and faced north, glad of the icy blow. All night she'd listened to the capricious storm. This morning she wanted only cold, steady discipline in her heart. It was a trial, that was evident. She was tried and tested, and found herself of more common metal than she'd ever imagined. Even self-censure was quicksand. To tell herself that she ought to take no delight in creaturely caresses was to remember how his hand had touched hers. To disparage the carnal earthly self was to think of his face, underlit by fire radiance, a tempest distilled to silence, midnight blue and flame. She heard a step behind her, the sound of a harsh exhalation, she turned and he was there. He stopped a few feet from her, all blown about by the wind, in his shirt sleeves, the kind of man that sensible right-walking elder women warned the girls not to recognize should he speak to them. What is it? she asked, deliberately curt. His mouth drew back a little, as if he tried to speak and then could not. He looked away from her, off and down. The wind blew his dark hair. Go back. Thou wilt catch thy death. He lifted his eyes. They were the color of the deepest heart of hurricane clouds, deeper blue than the sky behind him. Go back. Maddie turned away and began walking. He walked alongside her. For a few yards, she pretended indifference. Then she stopped. I wish to walk alone. She said it with her face to the wind, not looking toward him. Where? She knew the violence of the demand was his affliction, that the manifest arrogance was not entirely real, but some of it was, and she turned on that. Why must thou know? He stiffened a little, as a sensitive horse would bridle at a sharp word. He caught her elbow, but Maddie whirled away. What dost thou want of me? She cried. What? His jaw locked. He moved as if to curve her again and then, with a visible check of himself, dropped his hand. With a great effort, he said, Friend, I am thy nurse. That is all. A shadow of mockery came into his face. Nurse, stay, he said more easily than before. Maddie drew a breath, checkmated in her argument. It was perfectly true that no honest nurse would hair off across the countryside, insisting that her patient do without her. She pulled her cloak close around her in chagrin. He smiled slightly, having tallied a credit to his side. Come back, me. No. Please. Not now. Just no. I wish to walk alone. The smile became displeasure. Walk, he said with a jerk of his chin. Come back. She didn't understand him, couldn't find sense in the contradiction, 
until he left her and went to the dry stone wall that looped its way over the hill. He leaned against the rough structure. Walk, he said with a brief, open swing of his hand. It was a hopeless thing now, to expect to find peace in the empty fields, but Maddie stubbornly pulled her flaring cloak against herself, turned and began to walk. She went down a hollow and climbed the next slope. She traversed another hill and valley, startling a small flock of sheep on the other side. When she reached the highest point, the wind was bitter. It made her ears ache even inside the hood of her cloak. It was pointless, this small attempt at escape. He defeated her. What she wished to avoid was inside her. Not for one instant as she walked did she think of anything but Jervalks. She found that she could not go on. With a renewed determination to act as a proper attendant and see her patients safely out of the unhealthy air, she started back the way she had come, carefully holding up her skirt as she jumped the little rivulets in the bottom of each hollow. No white shirt and grim forbearance greeted her when she came in view of the rectory and church. The place where he'd waited for her was only a solitary stretch of stone piled on stone. Maddie paused, and then saw him at the crest of the hill, sitting on an outcrop of natural rock. He rose as she came toward him, a strong, elegant silhouette against the early sun. Come, she said, halting at a distance that seemed safe from any emotion beyond proper nursely concern. Tis time to go in. He held out his hand. The light behind him caught unexpected color, the long stems of wild Michaelmas daisies stirred by the wind. He made the offering without expression, either contrition nor smile. The unexpectedness of it overthrew her, the strange brightness of the daisies in the drab landscape when they should not have been there so late in the autumn, so fresh in spite of the driving storm. She felt confused, unable to command a tolerable response, a mild and impersonal gratitude. Her cheeks, hot with chafing, seemed to grow warmer still. What dost thou want of me? She cried. I am no scarlet, yielding woman. She snatched the flowers from his hand and threw them to the wind. The gust took them, tossed them end over end, bent the stems and rolled them awkwardly along the ground. Thou art unkind, to beleaguer me with thy idle attentions. He hesitated, his head turned, frowning at her. Then he came into his face, self-consciousness. Beg pardon. His expression was hot and stony. Tim's impertinent f. The end of the word got tangled with a sound like an angry groan and laugh. He looked away still, trying to speak and failing, as if the words he wanted eluded him in the field beyond her. His lip curled, and he exclaimed, Idiot! Thou art not an idiot, no! Thou art a wicked, worldly man. I've known it since I've known thee and it becomes worse and worse. Thy kisses and embraces. She was growing feverish. Thou art abominable. He looked out across the countryside, his eyes narrowed against the wind that blew his shirt and his hair. That cannot be between us, dost thou understand? She added with abandon, saying aloud what should have shocked her even to think. I am born a friend, Jervalx. Thou art born a nobleman. She had only sullen silence for an answer. Dost thou even know what would become of me? Thou dost not. Thou wouldst not even ask. She exhaled sharply. Friends would disown me. It is our way. Still he did not answer. He had that proud blankness about him, his look without center, gone away, as he had gone away in the chancery court. I would not be a friend she exclaimed, frustrated by his lack of response. I would be alone. No, he said unexpectedly. He turned and held his hand to her, palm upward, empty, a simple masculine offering. Matty girl. With me? She gazed down at it. That sharp swelling pain rose up in her, stopped any more words and denials and explanations in her throat. She hurled herself away from him and ran quickly. Down the field, slipping on the slick green turf, sliding on her. 
heels, almost but never quite falling, except in her heart. The worst of it was, he made her think of it. He filled her head with falsehood and fantasy. She dreamt not only of the garden that was not hers, but of living here with him, just the two of them and Papa, quietly, in peace and industry, with Maddie working in the house and garden and Papa and Jervolk spent with heads together over their numbers and equations. Sometimes she imagined it was Jervolk's as she had known him. That one brief night before his affliction, articulate and self-possessed and teasing, more often it was Jervolk's as he was now, except that when he fought with words and frustration, she could take his hand or touch him, and that vision led to vague and not-so-vague imaginings that made her feel stirred and licentious, ashamed. All day, Maddie avoided him meticulously. She threw herself into airing the bedrooms and cleaning the oak-paneled parlor, keeping Brunhilde with her. She spoke to Jervox only once, when she found him in the rector's cold and dusty study using an old pen and leaves torn out of sermon books to make mathematical notes. He had no fire, and the only light was through a vine-covered window. In her vexation at discovering him situated so uncomfortably, she ordered him rather sharply into the kitchen so that she and Brunhilde might make the room habitable. She would not look at him as he left, busying herself. Immediately with cobwebs. Brunhilde lingered at the door, and then suddenly turned and went away. She came back a quarter hour later, taking up the broom. She swept out beneath the desk and around the edge of the bookcases without a pause. I could give an opinion to ye mistress, if ye was to want it. Yes? Maddie responded, expecting a household hint. Ye oughtn't to speak so thoughtless to your lad. There's some as it don't make any difference to, but there's some as do well with loving kindness. Maddie bit down hard on her lip. She went on with her dusting. Brunhilde went on with her sweeping. But you're older than me, mistress, she said at length, and you know best. Perhaps you didn't see how he looked at ye. Maddie straightened the sheaf of writing paper that she'd found in a drawer. She set it in the middle of the desk, next to the freshly cut pen. Brunhilde bent down. He loves. E well, she said to the dustpan. You ought not to cut at him for no reason, mistress. We need candles here, Maddie said, keeping any inflection from her voice. Is there a pair of shears? I wish to trim away the ivy from the window. Yes, mistress, Brunhilde said. Evening brought Brunhilde's mother with fresh trout, a pudding, and cream for Jervox's chocolate. Because Mr. Langland particularly likes it, my girl says. The countrywoman sat down with a heave of pink flesh and began cleaning fish. Will ye be going to church or chapel, missus? Brunhilde has not told thee I am a friend. Aye, that she has. Chapel, then. Is there not a meeting house near? There's a grand Unitarian chapel over at Stroud. Mind you, that's seven miles. Maddie smiled. Perhaps I will stay here. I'm not accustomed to things very grand. That's a shame, then. You'll never want to see our new church in the market town. Tis wonderful grand, with a great. Organ up to the eaves. The Duke gave that. He had to, you see, to get the vestrymen to let him put up his library for the mechanical society. I must say, there's wise men and there's wise men, and our vestry are rare ones, nobody can gainsay it. It is a perfect spectacle, that organ. Maddie carefully cut a vegetable marrow. What duke is this? The Duke of Jervalx it is. I blush to repeat it, but a wild bad scamp of a gentleman, so they say, sharp as needles, but for. Common sense, I can't vouch. All this land ye see still in sheep, that's his. Oh, but it vexes the large farmers, who think they could do better with it. For myself, I don't say I know. I shouldn't like to see it change, not at my age. But I don't mind to say I'm glad to have this old place dusted out. The Reverend Durham is your relative, Mrs. Langland? He is Francis Langland's friend, Maddie said. What a remarkable fashion you people do talk, then. 
to call your own husband by all his Christian name that way. Maddie bent over her slicing. It is a public testimony. Not to give worldly compliments, nor to lie and call a man our master when he is not. The older woman chuckled roundly. You don't call your husband master? Maddie kept her face down. No, she said in a muffled voice. Don't ye indeed. My girl says he's a powerful handsome lad, very gentlemanlike. Yes, Maddie said. But his mind is weak. She put down the paring knife. His mind is not weak. He has been ill. Without doubt, without doubt, Brunhilde's mother said in a comfortable tone. That gawkhammer girl of mine, tis her mind needs improvement. But it's a good heart. He's already a great favorite with her, you know. Wouldn't have nothing but that I stop with his cream directly I finished the skimming. It's kind of thee. Think nothing of it, Mrs. Langland. I am glad to do it. The rector doesn't come but once a year and says his lesson to the widow Small's chickens that have wandered into the old parish church and troubles nobody. If I can do anything for him, I will do it. Maddie looked at her uncertainly, not sure if this was meant sarcastically, but the woman was working with a pleasant smile on her round face. My William is on the vestry, she added, and he tells me that a meddling rector is the very worst thing this parish might. Have in particular as the duke is a rash, clever man and appoints. The living, there's no saying what might come of it. We were all on pins, I'll tell you that, but we like the Reverend Durham very well. The sound of a dog barking plagued Maddie's dreams. It seemed to grow louder and louder, until it was someone pounding on a distant door. She rolled over in bed, opening her eyes to gray dawn filtering through the leaded glass. The door pounding was real. So was the dog. She heard it clearly. Catching up her cloak for a robe, she hurried across the hall through an empty bedroom to look down in the weak light outside the window. Squinting through the sleep in her eyes, she could just make out a chaise below, the horses steaming, but the jut of the old stone porch obscured its occupants. Another dog joined the first in barking. The pounding suddenly stopped. Brunhilde, surely, and a man's voice, Durham? But he'd hardly been gone long enough to turn around and come back. Maddie ran out and reached the top of the stairs just as a black and white dog came loping up the stairwell and tangled itself about her legs. Miss Timms! Instantly. It was Durham at the bottom, shouting for her as cold air rushed up from below. They're just behind me. We must go instantly. Jervox was already down haphazardly dressed in a farmer's overcoat Brunhilde had got from the ready-made. Clothes shop at the market town. The maid stood in her cloak. An apron as if she just arrived, looking as confused as Maddie felt. Durham came up the stairs two at a time and caught her hand, pulling her with him. Maddie had to put all her thought for the moment into keeping her balance. When they reached the foot she saw Colonel Fane, encloaked in blue over his scarlet uniform, standing in the entranceway as dry snow blew in the open door. Durham propelled her right out into it in her nightgown and shoes with no stockings. The wind hit her, stinging cold. But she had no time to think of it as Colonel Fane grabbed her round the shoulders and forced her to a run with him, half lifting her from the ground to keep her apace. What is it? she cried trying to turn behind and look. Have they come for the duke? Hot pursuit, he shouted, pulling her along, then suddenly sweeping her up bodily as if she were no heavier than a bag of goose down. Got to make the church. The steeple house stood black against the cold dawn, little lacings of snow clinging to the stones and sills. Colonel Fane reached the porch and set her down just as Jervox and Durham arrived, Brunhilde in tow a confusion of people and dogs in the entryway until Durham shoved open the heavy arch door, and they all stumbled inside in a sweep of wind and snow. He rammed the massive wooden bar into place, sending booming echoes through the vaulted space. The thin light of dawn was all color and darkness inside, the stained glass bright. 
slits that marched to a glorious round window of rose and gold, and blew above a cross and a barren table, leaving everything else in shadow. From somewhere, chickens muttered sleepy cackles, and a white hen fluttered up and balanced on the rail at the front of the church, eyeing them blandly. Devil stared at it, his body quivering with interest. Miss Timms, Durham said, breathing hard. They're not a quarter hour behind us. I met Fane on the road. There's no time to explain, but we only have one hope. One. Ma'am, you've got to marry him. Now. Instantly. I can do it. Maddie stood in her gown and cloak, speechless. I know it's sudden. I'd hope to avoid it, to find some other way, but they've run us to ground far sooner than I'd expected. Miss Timms, they can take him. I can't stop it, nor feign, we're nothing to him under the law. They can take him back. But canst thou not hide him? Take him farther away. No time. No time, Miss Timms. Do you hear that? Fane, check the door's bolt. Am all. That's them, their horses. Indeed, over the moan of the wind, Maddie heard what might have been the clatter of hooves on the little bridge below, but a moment later it was gone. Brunhilde was all eyes. I hear it, she whispered. Please, Durham said to Maddie. For the love of God, Miss Timms, you're the only one we can count on. Five minutes it'll take, and you'll be his nearest relation under the law. They can't touch him if you say them nay. But it's impossible. I'm a friend. I don't care if you're a bloody Hindu. It's our only hope. Eh? Madhouse, ma'am. It was you who brought him out of it. You know it as no else does. Thou dost not understand. I can't be married by a priest, in a steeple house, only to satisfy a law. I can't. We must try to hide him. Durham abruptly walked away. Maddie clutched her freezing hands under her arms. She glanced at the Duke. He was watching his friends as they checked the other entrances. When? He looked at her slantwise, their eyes met, instant raw sensibility. She hadn't known if he understood what Durham wanted, but in that glance, she knew that he did. He was stiff and proud. He said nothing, no petition, no plea for help, as distant as he had been since she had left him on the hill. The sound that had been far away and unreal a few moments before took a sudden shape, the sharp clatter of iron shoes on stone outside the door, and men shouting. The hens flapped. Devil barked, and Brunhilde yelped. Who is it? As the great latch rattled, but the wood muffled the voices outside beyond understanding anything more than excitement and anger. Durham strode back. Too late! He snapped. God damn it! The pursuers abandoned the main door. A side entrance shook under their assault, and the obscured voices outside grew bellicose. The dog cast ran toward it, growling. There seemed to be a multitude of them. The other side door rattled at the same time. The chickens panicked, running about the floor, ducking in and out of the railings. Devil lost his composure and began to chase them, barking frantically. Brunhilde gasped. Maddie turned to see Colonel Fane come down the aisle, drawing his sword. Durham unsheathed another from his walking stick, then pulled a pistol from inside his coat and delivered it to Jervalx. No! Maddie couldn't get beyond that one word in her horror. She tried to catch Jervalx and Durham both at once. The Duke was already beyond her, but she clung to Durham's sleeve. You must not! No! He jerked away. What do you suggest instead, miss? He could barely be heard over the sound of the assault on the doors and the barking dogs. He took up a station at the front, where the wood shook as if it were alive. Maddie turned around, saw Colonel Fane defending the left entry and Jervalx kneeling down behind a box pew, his arm braced on the side, taking aim at the last door. Devil's yelping barks resounded amid poultry squawks. She strode to the front of the church, 
scattering hens as she mounted the step and turned. No! she shouted, as loud as she could shout it. You will not do violence, none of ye! They all turned to look at her. Even Devil scrabbled out from beneath a pew, silenced, a chicken feather hanging from his nose. Leave those weapons where ye are. And come! Durham was the first to do it. He dropped his sword to the floor. Colonel Fane sheathed his. He followed Durham to the raised place at the railing where Maddie had stopped. She glared. Over them at Jervalx, who finally, with haughty leisure, rose and laid the pistol down on the wide box rail in front of him. The pounding on the doors had stopped. Even the voices outside grew dimmer, as if they had drawn off to a consultation. Jervalx, Maddie barked, I have received from the Lord a charge to love thee. Thou art my husband, and I am thy wife, helps meet, with no rule but love between us. The three men looked up at her as if she had gone mad. Brunhilde stood behind them, shivering, pressing her apron over her mouth, only a red nose and huge eyes visible. That is all that I am led to say at present. Maddie glared back. Durham seemed to come to sudden awareness. He fumbled. In his coat and pulled out a little book, stepped up beside her, leafed through it to a marked page, and began to read the priest's marriage ceremony. Someone outside started to pound on the front door again, this time far louder, with an implement more solid than a human hand. Devil crouched, staring toward the door, growling. As Durham came to the part in the vows where the man was to repeat, Jervalx looked up at Maddie with a wild and bitter arrogance, and for a moment she did not think he would even try. Will! he sneered. Christian Richard Nicholas Francis Langland, take thee. Maddie girl, Maddie ah. Ark ma. Maddie girl. Tim to have, to hold, from this day. Dot forward for better, for worse, for rich, for poor. In sickness, in health, to love, to cherish, till death us, do pan, according to God's holy. There too. I plight thee, my troth. Durham shuffled in the book. Um, that's right, Chev. Old man. He raised his voice above the rhythmic boom on the wooden door. Precisely right. Forgot to take her by the hand, but that don't matter. And now, Miss Timms, would you prefer to repeat after me? I have said what I am led to say. He frowned a little, and then shrugged. Good enough. All right. The ring part comes next. Fane? Colonel Fane had been standing complacently, hand on his sword hilt. When Durham looked at him, an absurd expression of dismay spread across the soldier's face. Oh, good God, Fane. You forgot. No. Just now. I give. Jervalk scowled at him fiercely. You think? The colonel looked bewildered, and then brightened. Got the papers, he said, pulling them out and offering them to Durham. His friend snatched them. You hopeless block. We'll have to use Chev's signet. Durham consulted the book, then glanced expectantly at the duke. You're supposed to hand it to her. She gives it to me, and I bless it. Jervalx looked down at his hand where the gold signet made a dull spot of richness against his dark clothes. There was a pause in the onslaught at the door, and then one sudden strike, crashing sound around the little church. Devil barked once and ran toward it. The chickens clucked excitedly, cowering under. Pews. Jervalk shoved his ring hand out to Maddie, palm up. The cold made her fingers clumsy. As she worked the signet free, his skin seemed warm against hers, his hand large and steady. The ring fell into her palm. She would have handed it to Durham, but Jervalx caught it up from her hand and pushed it. Onto her finger, where it hung so loose that he had to hold it there. Ring. Aye, the Wednesday. He looked up into her eyes as if daring her to dispute it. 
A single yelp came from somewhere at the back of the church, and a chicken flapped up into a candle stand, leaving Devil standing on his hind's legs in frustration. I will wear it, Maddie said, as God charges me to do. I was supposed to bless it first, Durham protested. None but our Lord may do that, Maddie said. Well, all right. But it's in the book. Let's keep the thing a little straight here. The pounding began again, this time at a side door. Durham raised his voice. Is it quite acceptable to you if I lead us in a prayer, Miss Timms? I am ordained if it helps. The wood of the side door began to give with a piercing crack. Both dogs rushed to it, raging and bristling. Hurry! Maddie snapped. Oh, hurry! Brunhilde echoed. Eternal God, everlasting life. Never mind the prayer. He ran his finger down the book. Hmm. Hmm-ah. He reached down and awkwardly joined Maddie's hand with the Duke's, having trouble juggling the book at the same time. What God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. He had to find his place again. The side door suffered another strike and cracking rift. For as much as Christian, damn, Chev, what's the rest of your bloody name? Christian Richard, etc., etc., the Duke of Jervalk's and. Archimedia Tims have consented together in holy wedlock, and have witnessed the same before God and this company. The door gave again, and he began to speak faster. And there too have given and pledged their troth. Another crack of breaking wood. Each to the other and have declared the same by giving and receiving a ring and by joining hand s. The door shuddered, splitting. It pronounceth out the man and wife and the name of father and doth the son and doth holy ghost. Amen. Just as if it had been a stage play in a street fair, the door gave way. Brunhilde screamed. Their pursuers burst into the church. Chapter 20 La! Oh, mistress! Brunhilde made her way through the pack of men in the rectory hall to Maddie, curtsying at each step. Oh, my lady, ought I to call? Ye lady? Oh, mistress! I didn't know. I swear I didn't. Maddie held her cloak tight about herself, terrified that it would be discovered she was in her nightgown. She was feeling odd and unreal, the full impact of what she'd done slowly creeping through her bones. In the church it had seemed a logical action. The need to prevent an outbreak of violence had overridden any other concern. The picture of Jervalx, his pistol aimed at the door, his face cold and still. Maddie knew he would die before he'd return to Blydale. In one electrified instant she'd seen what would happen when the men broke through that door, and surely, surely, she had done the only thing she could do to prevent it. And now it must be carried through. She couldn't stand up and announce that it was all a farce, performed in a moment of terror. She must be the Duchess of Jervalx, and calmly stand by him and speak for him, and maintain that she would not allow his family, his real family, to overrule his wishes and hers. We did not tell thee, she said to the maid. I'm sorry for it. T'was a wicked deception. Oh, no. It don't matter, mistress. Long as he was pledged to. Ye. Perhaps, you being Quaker, his noble folk don't like it? I don't blame ye, mistress, for wedding in secret. Me aunt and uncle did just the same, living tally till they could afford to be churched. And you kept separate rooms of a night. I can swear to that myself. She smiled shyly. Now ye needn't to do that no more, with such a handsome lad to kiss. E and keep. E warm. The Duke. I don't hardly believe it's true. Mr. Langland, well, he's not what you'd think, is he? Tis blowed about from pillar to post that the Duke of Jervalx is a clever man. Are ye? She hesitated. Are ye certain tis the real Duke, my lady? Yes, Maddy said, with at least that to say truthful. Thou must not call me lady. What am I to? Call ye mistress? Your grace, Durham supplied, 
shoving two mugs of foaming ale into Brunhilde's hands. Our guests are thirsty. Yes, sir. I'll bring up a tray. She took the mugs and turned toward the cellar. Durham, when he left off his lazy airs and suddenly took to action, gave a person no time to think. Not only had he declared to the dowager's half-dozen henchmen that Maddie was the new Duchess of Jervox, he'd even managed to march them all, along with horses and dogs, across the churchyard and into the rectory hall, ready to drink a wedding breakfast. For all their shouting and pounding, the men didn't seem very much concerned about the failure of their mission. The promise of strong spirits for celebration appeared to succeed in making them forget it entirely. In the rectory, Durham had immediately accosted Maddie and Brunhilde in the matter of where to locate this fountain of hospitality, and the three of them came back up from the cellar. Just as Brunhilde's mother arrived in the midst of everything, red-cheeked from cold and astonished at the company. Jervox was nowhere to be seen but Colonel Fane was loudly informing the bewildered matron of the special nature of the occasion, the nuptials of the Duke of Jervalx. Oh, him, she said, looking a little less perplexed. Wish and joy, then. Do ye all know himself, sir? Indeed, my dear. Very well. Ah, and here she is, the blushing bride. The colonel swept out his arm with a gallant little bow toward Mattie as if they were spectators at a parade and he were pointing out the king. The countrywoman turned to him, laughing. What a humbug. That's only Mistress Langland. Colonel Fane leaned over and whispered in her ear. She listened. She put her thumbnail to her mouth and stared at Maddie, turned white and then red. Maddie clutched the cloak tight round herself, painfully aware of having no bonnet, of her hair hanging down her back in its single loose nighttime braid. The woman drew in a breath, seeming to waver between shock and disapproval. Souls alive! She finally shook her head. The wonder of this life. I'd best see to the vittles, then, for that gawk-hammer girl won't know what to do with herself. The whole village will come calling, for the day's out. Long life and happiness to ye, my lady. And to himself. She dropped a curtsy and turned toward the kitchen. So where the devil is himself? Durham looked at Maddie. She already knew that Jervox was nowhere in the room. I'll look upstairs, she said, thankful for a chance to get away. The upper hall seemed quiet after the cheerful babble of male voices below. She found him in his room, dogs at his feet, attempting to shave. He was in his shirt sleeves wearing his velvet breeches, his collar open, standing at the looking glass over the fireplace mantel and scowling. His face was lathered on one side, the other had a few patches of foam, as if he had only remembered now and then that he had to put soap there, too. Maddie stuck her finger outside her cloak and tested the water in the basin. Thou ought to have it hot, she said. He startled, glanced the wrong way in the mirror, and then found her by turning around. Maddie couldn't bring herself to look directly at him. They both stood awkwardly for a moment, and then he moved to his chair and sat backwards in it, as he always did for her to shave him. She plunged into the task as if it were mere laundry or dusting, brisk and efficient. She would not think of what she had done. She would not pay attention to how still he sat, how he watched her, how warm and clean his skin smelled. Mostly, she would not look into his eyes, because they were so dark and blue and intent on her, as she struggled with the difficult double task of keeping her cloak closed tight around her, and shaving him at the same time. She finished. He caught the towel from her, and cleaned his face himself, rising from the chair. Maddie turned to straighten his coat, he'd got out the brown velvet, the embroidered waistcoat and blue ribbon and star lay beside it on the bed. She realized suddenly that he thought all the regalia appropriate for the occasion. And for some reason, that seemed to make it quite, quite real, this marriage. He had not wed her in his splendid clothes, but now, as if he knew what Brunhilde's mother had predicted, that the whole village would come, 
now he dressed the duke. And she was to be his duchess. Facing away from him, she looked down at herself, still in her borrowed nightgown under the cloak, her braid hanging behind her to her knees. They would laugh at her, married in a nightgown, with no bonnet. Married to a duke. Married by a priest. Married in a steeple house. Married, 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 to him. She felt a little dizzy. When she turned about, Jervalx was watching her. She took a deep breath, pulled her cloak close, and held up the waistcoat to him. He caught her hand inside the fabric. Wife, he said. I am no duchess. She hardly knew if she were apologizing or protesting. He found the massive band of the signet ring under the silk and turned it upright on her finger. Mine! She pulled her hand away. As thy dogs are thine? I'm not thy possession, Jervox, because I wear thy ring. With a flick, he took the waistcoat from her hand and shrugged it on. He worked at the buttons with one hand, making little progress but not asking for help. Maddie finally pulled it closed and attempted to button it for him. With her cloak to mine, too, she was having almost as much trouble as he'd had. After she'd struggled unsuccessfully for a long moment, he made an exasperated grimace. He caught her hands and wrenched the cloak free. He held it out, exposing her. Maddie tried to snatch the wrapper back, but he was stronger. His quick jerk popped the clasp open. Her shield slipped away. He scanned the nightgown, and then leaned his back against the bedpost, carelessly superb in his silk and lace as he made a slow inspection of her. A very faint smile curled one side of his mouth. Come, he commanded, standing up. When she didn't instantly obey, he reached out and yanked her with him, escorting her forcefully down the hall past the stair to her own room, the dogs trotting complacently ahead and behind. Jervalx flung open the wardrobe himself. He stood looking into it at her silver dress. All? he demanded, turning with his brows raised, as if Maddie must be hiding a roomful of ball gowns somewhere. Yes, she said. Dress, wife. He made a little bow. Pleasure. Maddie's. Eyes widened. She felt herself growing hot. I shall dress myself, I thank thee. If thou wilt go. He tilted his head, an instant of confusion, and then suddenly grinned. By dress, say. Dozen. Hundred. Oh. She felt mortified. I mistook thee. He went toward the door. Maddie expected him to leave. Instead he let the dogs out and closed it, turned about and leaned back. There was no visible expression to his mouth, but the ghost of his pirate smile was in his eyes. Thou must go, she said quickly. It is not seemly. He made a look of surprise. Not? Seem nurse me. Not husband wife? We aren't, truly, we are not. She couldn't bring herself to say it. Something unalterable came into his face a new and adamant focus. Before God. Maddie girl. I thee, Wednesday. She turned away. I don't see how it could be true. I'm sure it cannot be. It is to dupe the men below only. He was silent. Maddie looked at the bed hangings, at the venerable red fabric, faded on the outside of each fold, the tarnished trim, the tangle of unmade bedclothes that she'd left in her hurry. She felt hideously aware of herself, of her body inside thin linen, her plate trailing down her back and hips. The floor creaked. She felt him come behind her, standing close. She stood still, frozen in place. He tugged on her braid. He drew it lightly taut, exerting steady pressure on the connection. It didn't hurt. It teased her. She might have pulled away as he idled with it. Gentle tugs that courted her coaxed each tiny yield in his direction. She knew it. She stood with her face averted, burning, aware of how she allowed it. He twitched the plate, sending a ripple up to the nape of her neck. 
Maddie girl, he said softly, with that wicked smile in his voice. She shook her head, as if it had been a question and she must answer no. He moved closer. She could feel the warmth of him at her back. He lifted the braid over her shoulder and curled it round her throat. Slowly, slowly, he increased the pull. Maddie put her hand to her throat, clutching the braid, holding it from growing tighter. Her hips touched him, her back. She grew stiff, frantic and fixed in place. He caught her shoulders. He held her against him, a domination, his breath rough beside her ear, and then his hard grip turned to a caress. He smoothed his hands down her sleeves, laced his fingers through hers, covering her hands with his palms. A low hum, deep music, like his laughter, the sound he made as he touched his mouth to her bared throat seemed to touch a note inside her, turning quiver to resonance. He lifted his arms, their hands still enlaced, and crossed them against her breasts. Her braid lay over her shoulder and their hands. He toyed with the tip of it. He held it in one fist and ran his thumb. Against it. The single strand of hair, the tiny thread that she'd. Loop tight to hold it, the strand broke, and the plate came free. He made a sound, low and hot. And then he released her, before she could find herself in his embrace, before she could say what it felt like, only that he was solid and tall and heated and catastrophic, only that she felt bare and hollow when he let her go. He moved past her. He lounged against the bed, holding her loosened braid. As he rubbed it between his fingers, the plating spread and curled over his hand. He sat on the edge of the unmade bed, smiling down at her hair in his hands. Tower, he said. Girl, tower. I don't understand. I must dress. He opened his fingers, working the braid apart higher and higher. Let down thy hair. Shining. Hair. He shook his head. Girl. Can't remember, girl. Thou must go away. Her voice was light and shaky. With each fraction of an inch that he moved up the length of the braid, unplating it, he pulled her that much closer to him. Matty girl. He worked steadily. Princess tower. Lock. Lonely. Prince outside, no stair. His knee touched her. He had reached halfway spreading her hair loose below her waist. Call, lonely. Fairy princess, let down thy hair. Beautiful hair. Long. Climb up, come up to me. He brought her closer. She stood. Now between his legs, her plate undone higher yet. He leaned. Forward, blowing against it where it lay over her breast, sliding his fingers into it there drawing them down the whole length. Come up to me. He blew again, and then touched his lips to the fall of her hair, a soft pressure at the tip of her breast, a stolen instant of contact, so brief and exquisite that she shuddered, flinched back when he kissed her other breast as lightly, but his arm was there at her waist to hold her. Matty girl. He whispered, with that heavy moan in his throat, burying his face in her breast drawing his hands downward to touch them. Shine, princess. He held his palms to her shape, his hair black against the whiteness of her. Gown. She pulled back, refusing. No. I cannot. His fingers tightened, locked at her waist. His lips moved over her breasts, her throat. Mine. He was so close, he shattered her, made her strange to herself. Her body pulsed and ached, wantonly bare to him. She strained away. I am not thine. It was not a true marriage. The line of his mouth changed. His grip hardened. Yes. True. Not for me. True. No. He looked at her, blue flame and blackness, utterly still. I told thee, she said, holding her arms close pressing back? I told thee before. It is impossible. Her voice was shaking. Shivers ran down her limbs, 
and she pulled them tighter yet. Church. He let go of her so suddenly that she took a step to catch herself. Church, say, husband I, wife. I say, I thee wed. Love, honor, cherish, death. Say, he rose from the bed. Lie. She wet her lips. Forgot? His mouth made a scornful curve. He turned. Away. Jervalx received. Lord, a charge. Love. Husband I, thy wife. At the window, he leaned his forearm on the side of the deep, uncurtained recess. Gray light shone on him from the half-open shutter. I remember. Thou wouldst have done violence. Thou wouldst have shot at those men. I was afraid. For thee, but she did not say it. I was afraid of violence. He smiled bitterly. False word, Maddie girl. All lies. If she turned her head, she could see her hair unbraided, spreading free over her shoulder in a fan of his making. I don't know, she said. I don't know. How can it be God's will for me to marry thee? He stood at the window, lace and guilt and extravagant comeliness, the light falling on his dark hair and lashes, as sensual as his kisses, as his hands on her skin. Done. Why? Not will? A simple question, and there was nothing simple in him. Or in her anymore. I don't know, she whispered again. Done. He leaned one hand on the headboard. Mary. Wife. He pushed away and went to the door. Before he opened it, he looked back at her. It was a command, that look, and a challenge. He dared her to deny it. Jervalx, she said slowly, answer me this. In the church, if I had stood between thee and the other men, wouldst thou have shot? Between, he repeated, tilting his head intently. My body, myself, between thee and the others. His face changed, grew watchful. If I had stepped between, she asked again, would I have stopped thee from killing? He kept a long silence. And then, clipped, he said, Yes. Her heart sank. There had been another way. She had done the wrong thing after all. Even if it meant thou hadst gone back to Blydale Hall? Yes. She had erred. She should have practiced a submissive non-resistance instead of taking authority into her own hands. She had only substituted one evil for another. He came to her across the room and pulled her chin up between his fingers. Maddie girl, he said. Never stand between. Never. She pulled her face away. I cannot promise thee. You answer me, he said. Stand between, don't kill. Let take Maddie girl. He caught her again, held her painfully hard. That place? God's will? No. That answer was clear, so suddenly clear, her inner voice speaking sure. The turmoil of doubt inside her relaxed. She had done right. There had been two choices, two inevitable outcomes, to marry and keep him free, or to forbid strife only, and let him be seized and chained. She had done what God wished, then married him, and therefore it must be a true marriage. I would not let them take the Jervalx if I could stop it, she said. That is the truth. His hold eased. She could have told him more. She could have told him that now she was certain that the words in the church were words in the light, and therefore she would live in their commitment. She didn't. But she remembered the things she had said in the steeple house better than he. With no rule but love between us, she had avowed. And Jervalx, she thought, even after Blydale Hall, recognized no rule but his own. Perhaps there was a reason that God asked this of her. It had been a great commitment to be made in an instant. But she would wait to explain, because Jervalx was a duke and a child of the world and not yet ready to understand. Late in the day, 
as the carriage lumbered up over the top of a steep grade in the Welsh foothills and started down the other side, she came upon the first full consequence of the course she had taken. There, Jervalk said. Maddie had already seen it from out the carriage window. It burst upon the mind, floating on the ridge across the valley, a white circuit of towers, a dazzling and disorganized necklace strung of stone, half-tangible, huge and yet weightless, cloud drift and shadow and turrets melded into a daydream, a pale and glowing vision of fantastical chivalry. It was wild and translucent, like a vanishing reverie that somehow did not disappear but became more substantial as they drew closer. The white walls glittered, hundreds of windows in. The upper towers catching the late sun as the carriage descended into the valley below. Durham grinned at Maddie from the forward seat. Colonel Fane stretched out his legs as far as he politely could and asked, When supper? Jervalks exclaimed, Home in a voice that resonated with love and satisfaction. Maddie looked at the castle. It was beautiful. Against the sky and the hills, it was a proclamation. It declared power, announced wealth, blazed luxury, not in a shout, but in a song. There was a reason God had asked this of her, she repeated to herself. She had done the right thing. She was terrified. Chapter 21 Christian leaned his head against the carved back of a chair that had been given by Queen Elizabeth to his great-grandfather eight times removed. It was something of a throne itself, though made for a shorter man, with an unlucky projection in the claw of the phoenix crest that always poked Christian in the left ear if he was not careful. The footman took away his plate. He watched the firelight gleam through his wine glass while Fane rambled on about horses, a clumsy topic with a lady present, Christian thought which reminded him that he was host and responsible to do something about it. For three and a half centuries, the earls and dukes of Jervalks had presided over the table in the great chamber. It was four floors up over the gatehouse, a hundred and fifty feet above the base of the cliff that dropped away below, with a bank of windows that commanded the border for twenty miles in both directions. He could remember all that, but he could not depend on his own tongue to say something civilized. Maddie girl, seated at the foot of the long table, had her eyes lowered. She looked strangely small and meek. He decided that he had to do something about the overly masculine conversation. Tired day. Maddie girl? He asked, interrupting Fane mid-sentence, because he couldn't time his words to a pause but had to take them when they came. She looked up. Little she said, barely audible in the large. Room. Courses, said another voice. Christian remembered Durham on his right and glanced that way. He'd known Durham was there. It was just that he sometimes forgot it if he didn't keep looking. Long fatigue journey on top wedding, Durham added. Won't dawdle port. Port, Christian said. Drawn room. Excellent notion. Fane agreed, nodding sagely. Port in the drawing room, ladies. He cleared his throat. Retire early. All three of them looked at Maddie, expecting her to rise. She looked back, absurdly small in her chair that matched Christian's, with the phoenix wings poised above her head. Durham figured it out before Christian did. Duchess, fellows can't get up till give word, he said kindly. She stood and the rest of them followed suit. She still appeared hesitant. Christian went down the table and took her arm. He escorted her into the adjacent drawing room, where the shutters had been closed and the drapes let down to hold the heat from the big stone fireplace. The dogs leaped up from there. Rug before the fire, tails wagging in welcome. With a sharp syllable, Christian made them sit. Maddie appeared to be more concerned with the tips of her toes than with the rich tapestries of back canals and war that decorated all the inner walls. She took the chair he offered without the usual compliments on their fineness. She seemed, in fact, entirely disinterested in her new home. Christian was accustomed to giving the history of the place to. House guests, 
he had his short, medium, and comprehensive discourses on the topic, depending on whether it was merely after-dinner small talk or a full-scale tour. He was to be spared either, it appeared, which he found rather vexing, even knowing he would have made a hash of the business. Fain myself off town morning, Durham said, backing up to the fire. Maddie girl showed the first sign of life that she'd shown since their arrival, turning to Durham. Thou take letter me? Certainly. If you wish. Please. To my father. Father? Durham hesitated. He met Christian's eyes. Thou alt he have to read him, she said apologetically. If be so good. Durham had a helpless expression. He fidgeted. Course, must understand maybe short trip, right, Christian interrupted. He went to the table and found pens and paper, spread them out on the writing desk and carried a candle to it. Maddie girl, right? Durham calling. Tim's. He gave Durham a meaningful look. Ask. Tim comes here. The pleasure and relief in her face gratified him. Oh, can come here? Your home. Come live, do you want? A pink flush rose into her cheeks. Father, live here? Yes. She dropped her eyes. Want? Christian asked again. She lifted them. Yes. Want him me. Only, so strange. Here? I can't become accustomed. Christian picked up the pen. Right, he said. She gathered her skirt and took the place he'd created. He stood beside her for a moment and then walked away. He wanted to write to her father himself, but was afraid he couldn't do it. Not now. It had been mortifying enough to sign his name to the parish register. He wasn't certain yet that he'd spelled all of it right. He'd kept losing part of it in his hurry. In private he would write when he could take time and make the sons of bitches' letters come out straight. The door from the great chamber opened and the steward appeared with coffee and port. Christian motioned for him to serve Maddie at the writing table. He would not speak to the staff unless he had to do it. So far it had been surprisingly. Easy, Jervox ran like clockwork, from the moment the carriage had swept beneath the gatehouse, the mechanism had gone into motion. The party had been met in the hall by the steward and housekeeper. Christian had only to present Maddie on his arm with four words that he'd been practicing under his breath from Gloucester to the border. The Duchess of Jervalx. He had a feeling that he'd forgot the little words, but he'd got out the important ones with a suitable authority. The head servants had instantly responded with proper courtesies and their names. Now Calvin Elder acknowledged Christian's silent nod with immediate compliance pouring Maddie's coffee and placing it next to her on the table. Christian reckoned he could. Rely on the fact that a substantial breakfast would be laid at the usual time in the morning, and rooms had been made ready for Durham and Fane. A thought struck him. As Calvin Elder withdrew to the door, having left the port, Christian followed him into the great chamber. He held the door closed behind him. Tonight, bedchamber he said. My duchess. Chamber. That wasn't right. Christian felt heat in his face. Not his duchess, he meant his chamber. She'd sleep there. After an excruciatingly long moment he got out. The bed. Christ. Coarse idiot. The room, duchess. She is. Another interminable pause. Mine. Worse and worse. He gave it up, glaring at the steward. Calvin Elder put his hands behind his back and bowed. As you say, your grace. Furiously embarrassed, Christian retreated to the drawing room. Fane helped himself to the port, while Durham still rocked on his heels by the fire. Anything else want town for you, Chev? Durham asked. Accepting a glass from Fane. Christian took a breath. It tried him, wearied him, to batter at the wall of his weakness, but he had to keep going. Tell. 
He groped for a way to say it. And vest. Maddie. I the Wednesday. Right, Durham said promptly. Ready Philistines up on, eh? Upon him, indeed. His whole family, beginning with the she-dragon, as soon as they had the word. God's blood, his mother and sisters, they'd be in a frenzy. His jaw hardened into a sardonic smile. A silence fell. Maddie was oblivious, at work on her letter. Fane fondled Devil's ears assiduously, pushing the dog off his knees at every third stroke. Durham rocked gently before the fire. Play me billiards, Colonel? Durham asked suddenly. Aye. Fane looked cheerful at the notion. Guinea game? What, think me a nabob? Durham was already at the door, his port in one hand, the handle in the other. He gave Maddie a little bow. Will excuse us, your grace? She looked up at him. Thou must not call your grace. Duchess, he said placatingly. Duchess, mean. Archimedia, she said stubbornly. Maddie girl, Christian suggested, with a slight smile. Good night, Durham said. Before dig this hole deeper. Wish you joy, Duchess Archimedia Maddie girl. You, Chev. Fane echoed his sentiment, settling for. Ma'am, with reference to Maddie. Dogs, Christian said. Out. Fane whistled, the Pied Piper of the canine world, and the dogs hopped up and slipped through the open door with him. Durham. Christian spoke as it was closing behind them. Thank. He wanted to say more, but the words would not. Come. In the shadow of the door, Durham turned his thumb up and grinned. The handle clicked shut. Christian poured himself a glass of port and sat down. He closed his eyes. A relief to be alone. In his own place. He allowed himself to drift. His right hand tingled, the levy of exhaustion. He listened to the intermittent scratch of Maddie's pen, noting distantly that she didn't seem to be having an easy time with her letter. The familiarity of everything was bizarre, the way the place functioned even as he mangled and fumbled his orders. He felt at home, and yet an imposter, as if it were the not-real man who lived here, and the real one, himself, the muddled scared wounded one belong back in the bare room and the lunatic house with the other broken beasts. And yet the mad place itself had already receded to a bad dream. He was himself, normal. It was just that a part of his head was off in some obscure and misty cloudland, beyond reach. It was coming back. He had got here to Jervox, so it must. Be coming back. He could remember himself worse than he was. Now, but the now was so maddening, and the future. He had not until this moment even thought of a future beyond reaching home and safety, each moment unraveling before him, flashing past like a steeplechase, like riding hell for leather point to point, over strange country with the light failing and nothing to do but give her her head and pray. He smiled at himself with his eyes closed, but it had seemed that way, all a rush, obstacles and decisions and words that leaped up at him and then were gone and he was over them and down on the other side. Over and down. Married. God. So far, it was all right. Everything was the way he'd envisioned it, home, safe, quiet. Loyal Maddie girl, hen scratching at the writing table. He opened his eyes and looked at her. She had stopped her pen and held it poised, caressing her lips with the feather tip as she considered. She seemed very careful. From where he was he could see that she had not crossed out anything on her page, though there was plenty of paper for her to have composed all the drafts she liked. Christian always used reams of paper to get his thoughts down before he settled on a final version. He set his glass on the table beside him and watched her cautious authorship. He supposed that it was her Quaker upbringing, not to be extravagant. Or perhaps it was because she had learned economy in difficult circumstances. Or perhaps it was just Maddie, herself, and she was a natural pinchpenny. It came as a revelation to him that he didn't know, 
that he had married this young woman, neat and simple and plain except for her hair and her hedonistic eyelashes, and he knew almost nothing of her at all. Prim and decent, chaste, careful, loyal, moderately brave in some things, a lion in a few, and when he touched her, she fluttered, nice feminine flutter, modesty and passion. As he watched her, she put her tongue to the tip of the feather and stroked it thoughtfully, unselfconscious, all unknowing, and he began a slow liquid dissolve in his loins. It could not quite banish the leaden weariness that held him down, but he took pleasure in imagination. He had time. She was his wife. Any time, any place that he wanted. Here if he liked. He smiled. He lay in the chair and pictured himself rising and going to her, talking down that amazing hair and letting it fall in a cascade to the floor, discarding the white spinster collar that hid her throat, pulling fastenings free, her stark dress in a confusion at her waist, her belly and breasts and shoulders all white and soft, and that hair. He drew a breath deep inside himself and let it go, almost but not quite a sound in his chest. He would take her here, he thought, right here in the drawing room, his duchess. He would push her skirts to her waist and touch her, kiss her, and she would flutter like a soft bird, flutter and sigh and stretch out her legs and lie back in her chair at the writing desk, that hair a sheen of firelight, and honeyed ale from the arch of her throat to the axminster. Carpet, bare feet and toes that would flex and dig into the silk as he tasted her, so sweet, warm secret curls, bright and saucy. And inside her, God inside her, he imagined it. Spreading for him, opening like a flower, in his mind the dress had disappeared and she was perfectly, gloriously naked, slim pretty nymph in the drawing room, eager, arching back in the chair and pulling him into her, her lips parted, wanting closer, wanting deeper and deeper and harder. The Duke made a faint sound. Maddie finally put down her pen, defeated. She could not explain to Papa, not in any words, that she would want Durham to read aloud. When she looked over at Jervalx, he was sleeping, his head turned a little toward her, his face relaxed, as if he had pleasing dreams. Maddie could not help herself, he made her smile. His hands rested on the carved arms of his chair. On her own hand she felt his heavy signet, suspended inside her finger, too large, but not too large for him. His fingers were strong and sound, they made a slight twitch as he slept, a thing insignificant and private, an intimacy. He breathed deeply, quietly, not precisely even, still on the edge of full sleep, but as she watched, the rhythm eased into the cadence of profound slumber. His head declined a trifle lower to the side. She felt a rush of confusion and tenderness. It could not be true. It simply could not be. She was not his wife. The absurdity of the idea, the magnificence of this place, the food, the servants, the uncountable candles and paintings and crystal. Bowls of fruit and flowers, the great harp standing in a corner of. The room the endless corridors, there was even a water closet all richly tricked out in marble, and seventeen more elsewhere in the castle, all of the modern patent variety, as she had been informed matter-of-factly by the housekeeper. She could not be the mistress of this place. Something would happen that would prove it all to have been mistaken. The wedding, so hasty and preposterous, that would not be legal, even if Durham insisted that the special license he'd caused Colonel Fane to procure in anticipation of pursuit was in order. And even if it were, friends would not accept it. When they found out, she would be disowned, married by a priest, and a church, without her father's permission, worst of all, married to a man of the world. Yet in his sleep, he did not look so diabolic. Earthly, yes, the sensual line of his mouth, the straight strong nose, the elegant jaw, his hair falling over his forehead, and those dark lashes, as long as a child's, but with a child's innocence made reckless in a man grown. Her words in the church had come from Quaker weddings she had attended. Whether they were her own words or God's words in her, how was she to know? She could reason both ways, as she had reasoned this morning, 
that to refuse him was to condemn him to Blydale Hall, or as seemed so apparent. Now, that there was no possibility she had any power to protect him, or any grounds to belong to this place. She had never been so unclear before, caught between what friends would say and what seemed to hold her heart. For a long time, she watched him sleep. If it weren't for this place. If he were just an ordinary man. Just an ordinary man, for ordinary Archimedia Tims. A man the meeting would approve, a practical garden and a bell pull that worked. The Duke of Jervalk's in plain dress. Whenever pigs might learn to fly. Standing up softly, she pulled the bell rope that adorned the Duke's drawing room, a thick black cord of silk, braided and tasseled in gold. It worked. In a very few moments, the steward appeared, the door opening on oiled hinges. Dressed in long skirted white satin livery, with his hawk nose and long chin, his stockings as white as his wig and coat, he bore a strong resemblance to the Duke's butler in town. Maddie supposed the likeness of Calvin Elder to London Calvin was not coincidence. She gave him a small, embarrassed smile. Your Grace wishes to retire? he asked in a low voice. So late, in such a circumstance, it did not seem worthwhile to argue the title. She glanced uncertainly at Jervox, and then nodded. Calvin Elder turned, holding the door open for her. Maddie followed him, led from the rich warmth of the tapestried and firelit room into a frigid corridor illuminated by torches, the smoky light shining down upon polished suits of armor that lined the walls like a mute army. At the end, a broad stone staircase curved downward into blackness. Calvin Elder stopped at a small table, lit a candle that had been provided ready there, and started down. The candle's bobbing rays illuminated the arched vault overhead as they descended. At the foot of the stair, the ceiling abruptly gave way to a huge darkness, a hall cold and resonating in the dim candlelight bigger than the biggest meeting house she had ever been inside, bigger than a church, its vast space rising into unseen realms above where the peaks of soaring lancet windows were lost in gloom. Calvin Elder walked across it on soft slippers, but Maddie's sturdy shoes made crude clapping sounds that she could not seem to silence. The noise echoed. It almost seemed as if someone were following them as they crossed the vast floor, a thought that raised prickles on the back of her neck. At the other end, he led her two floors up a tight winding staircase, the uneven stone steps worn away in the middle by countless feet. Before she had caught her breath from that ascent, they went through a door into another blackness. The floor creaked beneath the carpet, and Maddie startled at the sudden looming up of a white face and staring eyes. Elder Calvin simply walked on, and his candle illuminated a bright haughty figure, a portrait of a man in studded armor and robes. Another rose up beyond it, a rich stilted profusion of jeweled cloth and pearl headdress, with a woman's pale and expressionless face beneath it. Maddie realized she was in a long gallery, icy, lined the whole length by these staring portraits. Their eyes followed her, appearing out of the shadow, lit for a moment by the passing candle, and fading into ghostly silence. The hairs on her scalp rose. She felt their antagonism like a living presence. Finally, through a door, another corridor, and Calvin Elder opened a room. He gave her a grave look. The Duchess Boudoir. Maddie did not think Calvin Elder approved of her much, either. They hid it well, he and the housekeeper Ellen Rhodes, but the staff must be in something of an uproar, perhaps even uncertain of the Duke's sanity. Maddie thought she would have questioned it herself under the circumstances. She stepped meekly through. The room ought not to have shocked her after all the rest of the feudal splendor, but it did. The light from the single candle darted among huge shadows. Glowing momentarily on walls hung in rose damask, plaster and gilt at the ceiling, abundant with chairs and plush settees. A fire smoked in the open hearth, helpless to warm the big room much better than the gallery and halls. Calvin Elder walked through and opened another door. The bedchamber, your grace. Maddie followed him. Another outburst of luxury, 
this time in a bed with cloth of gold hangings lined in pale pink, the walls adorned by tapestries and silver sconces. She was becoming unnerved by it. Over the upholstered bench at the foot of the bed, her nightgown lay spread neatly, a plain white contrast to everything else in the room. The bell rope is here, your grace. He walked across, reaching to pull it. A woman will come up to serve you. Oh no. I need no one. I can serve myself. He bowed. The Duke. Maddie made a vague gesture, not sure which direction was the right one after all the halls and turns and. Staircases. Is there someone to help him? When he doesn't bring his own man, his grace has commonly preferred to valet himself on those occasions that he retires late. The staff is not to disturb him. His room has been made ready in the manner that he usually desires it. She had to make a conscious effort not to bite her lip. There was no guessing what the staff here had been told about Jervalks's affliction, or if they knew anything at all. It would not be possible to hide for long. Calvin Elder looked a solemn inquiry at her. Will a valet be required, your grace? His expression said that it was unusual, unwelcome, and against all natural expectation, and that such oddities and anomalies were under particular scrutiny in the present circumstance. No, she said. He bowed and withdrew. As soon as he was gone, Maddie wished he were still there with her. The candle he'd lit for her cast feeble light doing little more than making the bed seem twice as large by its shadow on the ceiling. She quickly changed into her night rail and carried her dress and the candle into the smaller dressing closet off the bedchamber. As she was laying out her dress, she heard a sound in the bedchamber. She hastened out, glad of any company, expecting the duke. There was no one there. Something creaked behind her. She whirled around. The door of the dressing closet stood open black now, empty. She didn't want to go back in it, she didn't. Wanted to stand open like a gaping mouth. She slammed it shut. Refusing to look inside. She set the candle on the bedside table, knelt down, and prayed very hard for common sense. She tried to find the inner light, but strange sounds, faint shuffles and breathings, sounds like nothing she'd ever heard in other houses— kept dashing her attention away from a calm concentration. She wished for Jervalks. For Durham and Fane. For anyone. Using the gilt and bamboo steps, she climbed into the cold bed. It sank beneath her, enfolding her. The candlelight brushed a deep gleam of color on the underside of the canopy. She heard footsteps. They were above her, a sluggish step that crossed the room, paused overhead and then moved on. They did not return. Maddie's eyes watered. She squeezed herself down in the bed. Oh. She didn't believe in ghosts. She did not. If only Jervalx would come. Christian awoke chilly. The room had gone to shadows, the candles guttering, the fire a red glow of fading coals. It was hard to rouse. He kept drifting back into odd and forbidding dreams but with a blank habit he got up and spread the coals out with a poker, snuffed all the candles, and went by feel through the door from the drawing room into his bedchamber. He was half asleep. He vaguely realized it when he couldn't. Unfasten his waistcoat. But it was too much trouble. In the dark. His bed waited, turned down and warmed. He dropped his coat and his shoes and spread himself full length on it. He rolled over and pulled a pillow to him, got his feet beneath the bedclothes, and slid back down into the deep. Chapter 22 In the morning, Maddie found her own way as far as the immense medieval hall with its dark beams and stone walls. It was almost as forbidding as it had been last night, with its ominous height and echoing floor, the silent beams of light that fell down from slits of windows. Fortunately, she encountered Colonel Fane just entering it with the dogs and had their amiable escort and direction to the breakfast parlor. Durham was already there, engaged with porridge, which he was eating standing up, looking out a window that had a commanding view of the countryside. 
Good morning, ma'am, he said cheerfully. Have some kedgeri? India or China tea? Coffee? Somehow, he had her seated at the head of the linen-covered table, serving her himself from the silver dishes on the sideboard, persuasive as always in his active mode. He sat down next to her and motioned Colonel Fane to pull up his chair. We can talk private here. Servants don't come unless we... Ring. He passed her cream. How do you think it's going so? Far? I don't know, Maddie said. I feel so odd. Fane reached over and patted her hand. Jitters. Marriage. First night's always the worst. Durham cleared his throat. Really, Fane. Have a little delicacy. Beg pardon. The colonel flushed and busied himself with feeding a sausage to devil. Forgot myself. What do you know about marriage anyway? The colonel kept his eyes down. Sisters. My mother said that too. Hmm. Begging your pardon, ma'am. It's all right, Maddie said. I would be glad of thy mother's advice. I haven't had my own mother for many years. I'm sorry to know it, ma'am. His momentary embarrassment vanished. Too bad mine ain't here. She'd set you straight on things in a snap. Well, she ain't, Durham said. Thank God. He looked at Maddie. Chef coming along soon, do you think? I don't know. She looked down at the congealing porridge in her dish. After ye left, he fell asleep in a chair. The steward said he doesn't usually have help when he retires, so I thought it best. I didn't want to make them wonder about him more than they do already, so I thought. She pushed her plate away. So I left him there, she said all at once, and I shouldn't have done so. It was because I was afraid of the steward and didn't want to ask where the duke would sleep, so I just went where I was taken, and he didn't ever come, and I couldn't find my way back. An uncomfortable silence greeted this information. Maddie stood up and went to the window. Through the expanse of wavy antique glass, she could see all across the valley below, the trees and fields in morning shadow, the twisting glint of a river amid gray and brown. Look at this, she said hopelessly. Look at this place. No one will ever think I belong here. Oh, I want to go home. She pressed her forehead against the casement. Devil came and nosed her hand. She pulled it away hugging herself. Archimedia, Durham said. Chev's getting better, isn't he? Yes. I could tell it. Even in a few days. She stared out the window. Every day is better. When I first saw him at Blythedale Hall, he didn't speak at all. So, perhaps soon, he'll be well. He'll pass their bloody hearing, and this will be over. She said nothing. There are some obstacles directly before us, Durham acknowledged. His family will come the instant I tell them. Lady de Marley, but you know about her. Chev thinks she won't mind the marriage. I don't know, but you'd best be prepared for anything. The rest of M. No doubt about it. I'd be lying if I told you there won't be the devil of a dust-up. But if you will just stand firm, I'm sure there's nothing they can do. Nothing. If they try to haul him away, why, we'll call in the Lord Lieutenant. Chev is the Lord Lieutenant, Fane said. Egad, yes, must be. He owns the whole bleeding county. Is he justice of the peace too? But never mind, I'll find out. Just stand pluck, and we'll get through it to the other side. She whirled around. What other side? There is no other side for me. I cannot be married to him. I cannot be a duchess. Durham watched her intently. You don't want to be a duchess, or you don't want to be married to Chev. Thou wilt not understand, she cried. I cannot. I cannot be the one. I will be disowned when friends know of it. He nodded slowly. I see. 
he took a breath. I didn't know that. I knew you were a little disinclined by your beliefs. Disinclined? Maddie echoed. She turned back to the window and gave a small laugh. Devil jumped up onto the window seat and pressed himself against her. She could not help but stroke his head. It was the only way to prevent him from planting his paws on her shoulders and licking her face. The marriage, Durham hesitated. That won't be solace enough for your loss. He asked it gently, but she could hear the argument in his voice. He thought wealth in a castle and being a duchess should compensate for anything. Thou dost not understand, she said softly. Thou wilt not understand. She stroked the dog's silken ears. I will never belong here. You have to give yourself a little time. You aren't accustomed. It's a big old haunt of a place, I know. Bloody cold, too. We've all got lost in it now and then. Oh, she said, her voice trembling. I'm lost right now. He needs you. Needs me? Dost thou truly think I can stop anyone from doing anything? Look at me. At this castle. No one would listen to me. She bit her lip hard. She would not indulge in tears of weakness over what was already done. But if it were not done, not truly. She spoke without turning around. I ask thee, is there a way to undo this marriage now? Is it too late? There was a pause. You wish to undo it? Yes. Listen to me, Durham said. Just for an instant, forget your religion. Forget everything but Shev. His family will find out he's here, whether I tell them or not. When they come, Fane and I can do our best, but if he can't speak, if he can't act for himself yet, they can put us out on our ear. But you, the Duchess of Jervalx, you can put them out. You can protect him. Legally. Until he is himself again. Art thou certain of that? She stared at the sparkling river until her eyes began to hurt. Devil left her suddenly, pulling away and leaping down from the window seat. It makes sense, don't it? Durham asked. Just let the thing. Stand. At least until he is well enough to protect himself. Then there is a way to undo it. Possibly. Thou must tell me how. Will you promise to stay as long as he needs you? Tell me how. For God's sake, Maddie. Will you leave him? Tell me. She gripped her hands into fists. The river made her eyes water, so bright and silvery in the winter landscape. She could not break her gaze away from it. Durham said in a low, flat voice, You haven't slept with him. It was only half a question. Maddie felt her cheeks burning. She shook her head. Then don't. Don't consummate it. And when you decide you can't bear with being a duchess and his wife any longer, then come to me, your grace. His voice had gone bitter. And I'll tell you the rest of what you need to know to nullify the vow you made. She heard the sound of his chair scraping. Then he swore softly. She turned and found Jervox, with devil and Cass at his feet, standing in the closed doorway, watching her. Christian went out on the battlements when he wanted to be alone. He knew them all, kept them in repair and kept them to himself, reserving the keys for every staircase door that led onto the roofs. The higher the better, and the highest tower at Jervalks put him above anything else he could see. Muffled in his greatcoat, he leaned on the whitewashed stone embrasure of a crenel. From here he looked down on the circuit of the curtain. Wall to the White Lady Tower, oldest, square and squat, a border sentry joined by the Knight's Tower, and beyond that the tower called Phoenix, circling to the Northwest Tower, and its range of Elizabethan lodgings rebuilt and redesigned by Christopher. Wren, where they'd put Maddie in his mother's room last night, and Beauvisage and Mirabile, out of sight round the curve of Bellatol that he stood on. He knew them. He loved them. When he'd awoken this morning, he hadn't even remembered that anything was different, 
that he was any one but the Duke of Jervalks and master of his life and this castle and his own fate. Then he tried to speak to the footman who brought his tea. He was glad that he hadn't been able to say anything at all. He passed for surly, no doubt, instead of an idiot. But it was only a reprieve. He couldn't go on silent with the staff forever. And Maddie. He put his arms on the wall and his head down in them. In all honesty it had taken him a little while to remember her. It was when he got out of bed and found himself still dressed that he began to realize. And even then, he'd not been really disturbed, only a little chagrin to have fallen asleep on. His wedding night. He'd bathed and dressed, using the services. Of the footman, who was passably good, and serenely agreeable in the face of Christian's moody silence obviously having been selected for this impromptu post on the basis of having ambitions to valet. On the way downstairs, Christian had thought of how he'd make it up to her. Even at the risk of sounding a dimwit, he determined to make it clear where his wife was to sleep. He'd been considering how to accomplish that when he'd walked in and found Durham advising her not to sleep with him at all. Christian had feigned not understanding. Easy enough. He just stood there, and they took him for stupid. Mute. Deaf. Dumb. She'd looked guiltily at him. But he'd given her a smile, gone to the sideboard and poured himself chocolate. I understand, Maddie girl. Between white stone and a sky of watercolor gray and blue, the wind funneled around Bellatil, blowing Christian's collar against him. It was a novel notion that anyone could dismiss Jervalks. Not dismiss it, reject it. And him. He could understand that part, damaged as he was, but it hardly made the wound any less. He had thought, he had assumed, that what he was missing would be amply recompensed by what he had to offer. Jervox itself, and all that went with it, no small treasure. He had thought, when she was here, when she beheld it, she would see in it what he saw. Well, if she did not, she didn't. Maddie girl. Will you go then? He stared at the sky. He felt impotent, aching and angry. And helpless. With a curse, he rammed his fists into the pockets of his greatcoat. If she wished to nullify what she'd done, let it be nullified. Durham pleaded with her to stay until she was not needed, but Christian did not even require that. It had been a decision made out of weakness and muddle-headedness to make her his wife. She was a Quaker. A nobody. She did not, as she so plainly stated, belong here. Let her go. He was better. He was going to be perfect. Let her go. He did not need her or what flimsy protection she could offer. He would not miss her. He would hardly know that she had gone stubborn little primkiss sweet. He gazed at the winter hills. He'd taken it, this castle, his heritage, for granted in his life. He had tried not to do it, but he had. Trifling in reform, fighting sham battles, all the time safe in his impregnable tower. All the time not knowing what a fortune he had. He could lose it again. He felt a new and bone-deep chill. Was it even his now? He'd fled to Jervalks by instinct. The place functioned at his command by inbred custom. But they'd stripped him to nothing in chancery. If they came here, if they tried to take him, imprisoned, chained, defeated. Crushed. He would not let it happen. He knew everything there was to know about Jervalks. He knew that it was 273 feet from the Ramparts of Bellatoire to level ground. He kept the tower key. He found Maddie alone in the Duchess' morning parlor, looking up at a portrait of Herodias with the head of John the Baptist. Below it hung a cross of the graphically bloody variety. Cheer, he said, with a dry intent. She looked round at him. It is a sumptuous room. Thank. He dared her to say it had not been meant as a compliment. She turned to another portrait of a pair of boys leaning on a mastiff that was taller than both of them. That one pleasant. He made a small bow. 
Brother. Your brothers? He looked at the portrait. James was real. It was Christian's own side of it that seemed nebulous, until he made himself concentrate, lifted his hand and indicated the boy in curls and short coat. I, me, Anne. Brother. Ten. James, six. Long time, gone. Red. Red, scarlet fever. He remembered sitting for that portrait. Oh, the pain to be still, when there were games and fields and toads. Dog was. Kill Buck. He smiled. Never killed, that dog, not a butterfly. She gazed at the painting silently. This morning she was severe, her hair tight, as if she wished to be as different from her surroundings as possible. You want to know. He could not approach the subject any more subtly than that. Wedding? She looked at him sharply and put her hands behind her back. Understand, he said. Breakfast. Durham undo. Wedding. I believe would be wise. She kept her eyes on him, level. But I will stay thou art well enough. Now. Well enough. Go now. Thou wouldst have me leave now. He set his jaw angrily at this twisting of accountability. I don't say. You. Breakfast at. Durham. The wedding undo. He walked past her. Don't sleep with. I heard. He turned. Bed last night was not. So. Undo. Call Durham now undo. He reached for the bell rope. They gone she said. They waited thee, but thou couldst not found. Gone. That checked him, left him suddenly without a practical intent, bereft of action to release the hostility inside him. Christian dropped his hand. Gone. He realized what it meant. Too late. They. Call. Say wed. Family. Devil take, and both. I've thought. She sat down in a chair and laid her hands over one another in her lap. I believe I'd stay, at least until thy hearing. If thou wouldst agree. Her ringers slid between one another and tightened. He saw the band of his signet ring on her hand. I ask, if thou wouldst agree we will not consummate this marriage, then it can be undone when thou. Art well. She moistened her lips. Thou wilt not need me then. I would be a burden and a sorrow thee. I do not belong in thy world. When thou art whole. Again, thou wilt see. He wanted to argue with her, but he had no grounds. There was a great defeat in him, a distress that he had no words for. If not well, he asserted. What if never whole? Leave? I don't know. I can only say, I will stay until new hearing. Until, new, thy hearing, before Lord Chancel again. His whole body had gone still. Again? Yes. Thou art go again. When? I'm not certain. Several months yet. Lady de Marley will know. He strode two steps toward her and stopped. New. Why? His aggressive approach seemed to startle her. She sat back in the chair. Thy brothers-in-law. They insist to try again, judge thee not fit. Christian gazed at her. He had thought. He had thought it was done already. He began breathing in a rush, unable to make the words reeling in his head into a question. He thrust himself into a turn, paced the room, and came back. Mean fit, now? She didn't seem to understand. Now! He shouted. Comp now? Free now? He grabbed her shoulders and leaned over her. Tell. Until thy hearing, she said, sitting still beneath his hands. Thou art the same as anyone under the law. He stared at her, unable to let her go, to move. How else couldst thou think to marry? She asked. Of course. Of course. 
He'd been too befuddled. He hadn't. Even questioned it. He thought he was stripped of his legal existence, made into an imbecile. He'd been hiding behind. Durham and Fane and Manny and Jervalk's castle itself, stupid confused hiding, as if any of that could have saved him when they came to take him back. Another hearing. Months. Maddie. He gripped her harder. Help me. Well. Ho. I want, agree, no bed. Stay in helping. Agree. You go then, when I, whole. Hearing. She lifted her eyes to his. Will not consummate? He found her hand, caught it, and clenched it. Not. Hearing. Whole. No, con, mate, bed. Undo Wednesday. She lowered her lashes, those erotic eyelashes. He looked down at her, gripping her hand, regretting what he promised even before she made a small nod to confirm it. The agreement made things easier between them. Maddie did not feel so uncomfortable in the surroundings, knowing that it was only an interval and not a real commitment. When the Duke suggested that he show her over the castle, she was willing enough to accompany him. She even consented to have one of the Dowager Duchess' simpler gowns refitted for her, as she could not continue to wear her faithful gray silk forever. The one she chose was a dark blue satin. In the wardrobe closet, it had not looked overly rich compared to the others, especially since she insisted that the maid remove the trimming, but when she had it on and saw herself in the daylight in a looking glass, the opulence of the color was dramatic. The girl waited. Very nice, your grace she said, holding the sewing box. It was beautiful. Maddie had never in her life worn anything like it. She smoothed her hand down the vivid fabric. Yes, she said, gazing at herself in wonder. Aye, it is very nice. With the hem lengthened, the flounces and trim removed, and a shawl of white India silk over the puffed sleeves and exposed neckline, she was ready to meet Jervalks in the gallery. When she saw him, she had a moment of hesitation, certain that he would think her foolish to choose such a lavish dress, but he only looked at her longer than he ought to have done, and then smiled with one corner of his mouth as he took her arm. The dress matched his eyes. Maddie, he said. Sorry I, consent, no con. She thought she might understand what he meant, but let it pass without inquiry. The disapproving portrait stared down from the gallery walls, a prickling reminder of the eeriness she'd felt here in the night. He stopped before one of the most imposing, a huge painting of a grave and condescending personage dressed in red. Robes and a wide white ruff, bejeweled and kingly, holding a wand of high office. Lord Jervalks, he said. First, rule power, great earl. He is very distinguished, Maddie said in a small voice. Mary seventeen. A girl, he, got a rich heiress Mary. She write before, to him, letter. I have it. She writes my sweet life, say my mind, consider allowance. Pray beseech thee, kind love, she wants. Twenty-six hundred quarter. Oh, she said dubiously. Was that not a large sum for the day? Very large? Jervalx grinned. Also, to make things clear, she writes, I want three horses own, two gentlewomen, horse each them, six or eight gentlemen, two coaches, velvet, for horse each, two. Dot footman. Gentleman usher, six hundred a quarter for charitable, all to be. Defrayed by him. Very sensible, Maddie said, beginning to smile. Also, yearly, she would have twenty gowns, eight country, six good, six excellent good. Also, six thousand by jewels, four thousand pearl chain. Also, all houses furnish chambers. Fit beds, stools, chairs, cushions, carpets. Hanging canopy. Also, he would kindly pay all her debts. Also, purchase land. Also, lend no money. 
Lord Chamberlain. Also, pray, when rise to. Earl, allow two thousand more, double attendance. All this was in the letter. Maddy was holding back a laugh by the end of this recital, not quite so awed by the poor kingly gentleman. Yes. He gave, Jervalk said. All. And never lend to. Chamberlain. Wise advice. Die Earl. Counselor, treasurer to the king. Rich. Power. He building. Northwest Tower. Good wife. She made a face. Thy idea of a good wife. Yes. Rich. Shrewd. Spoilt. Fine dress. Ambition. Good wife. Thou hast certainly married the wrong woman. He gave her a considering look. She felt herself growing warm and wished she had not said it. As she lowered her eyes, he took her chin between his ringers, bent and kissed her lightly on the lips. Maddie pulled away, drawing in a quick breath. He shook his head as she began to protest, smiling like a rogue. Bed, only promise. He took her arm again and walked on as if nothing had happened. Chapter 23 Lady de Marley arrived without warning five days after Durham and Colonel Fane had left. Maddie and Jervox were in the hall. Maddie was lying on her back on the floor next to him, looking up and up and up to the fantastically carved tracery in the timber roof, while he pointed out the heraldic beasts fashioned there, the trefoils and fleurs de lis and intricately rendered flowers and foliage shaped in the beams so far above them. The castle seemed a different place with Jervox. He knew it as if it were his own self. He talked about it the way women talked about their offspring, with endless interest in the most minute particulars, with love and humor enough to make even details entertaining. She liked it in the daytime. It was only at night, when she had to retire alone to the Duchess' rooms, lying in bed, listening for the footsteps to walk the floor above. It was only then that panic rose in her throat, and she wished she had not asked to sleep alone. Go up. Five, rafter, Jervox was saying, describing. Where she was to look, since they had long ago determined that his ability to point accurately was unreliable. The dogs. Face, do you see? Mmm, yes. I see it. Dog. Dragon. Henry Tudor beasts. Which Henry? Henry, seven. Lilies. Ah. She had become quite familiar with Elizabeth, that lively wife of Francis Langland, the first Lord Jervalx, who, in return for her husband's docile compliance in the matter of her allowance, had not hesitated to further the family interests by becoming a clandestine mistress to their mysterious and clever king. Between Lily's wealth, discretion and beauty, and her husband's astute loyalty to a monarch who had come from the same mists of Wales as the young knight himself, the dynasty established by Francis Langland enjoyed an auspicious beginning. Grey dog. Greyhound dragon, look to the side. He twisted his head around on the floor. Lily. See? Under the firm guidance of his hand, Maddie contorted herself. Oh, yes! There was the lily, hidden amid the heraldic carvings until one looked at it at just the proper angle. Henry sent a to cut. A man to cut wood. A carver. Carver. Was it a secret trick? His head was turned around close to hers. Secret, he said. He slipped his hand into the curve of her waist. Maddie shrieked at the tickle, her voice echoing around the vast hall. She skittered away, but he caught her, rolling half on top of her, teasing her waist with one hand and clasping her cheek with the other. Maddie struggled, but not too hard. She was about to be kissed, and she liked it. His mouth touched hers, warm in the cold hall, as velvet gentle as the stone beneath her was hard. He stopped the tickling. Her body softened, she closed her eyes and felt him over her, breathed his heat in the chilly air, heard the low sound of pleasure he made as he explored her. 
She had not kissed him back, she had not quite yet, but she was going to soon. It was singular, this being wife and not wife, free to be kissed, to tussle about the floor like puppies. It was not chaste, she knew that well enough. But he did it so sweetly, so playfully, that she never found a place to demand that he stop. No bed, he promised her, whenever she drew back, and that eased her. It was only trifling, and pleasant, and if it was a worldly and carnal pleasure then at least it was only for a little while, and then she would go back to being ordinary, scrupulous Maddie Timms. Exemplary Maddie Timms, with a secret memory of her. Own to keep, a lily hidden among the dragons of virtue. She lifted her chin and kissed him back. He had been her teacher. She knew how to taste his mouth, search the corners while he grew still, his lips parting a little. His body seemed to respond with a slow tautness, a tightening over her, his hands pressed into her skin. Yet he lay motionless, suspended, his mouth acquiescent to hers, as if his whole concentration was on what it felt like. His lips opened more with each contact, allowing her to seek further, inviting it. She touched him with her tongue. He was foreign and familiar, so close and yet so strange to her. A nobleman, with fairies and Welshmen and kings in his history, lord of this hall and castle, but most alien and potent of all, a man. Sandalwood. And strength and aggressiveness she could feel held in check? His breath mingled with hers, light with anticipation. Maddie tasted deeper. He met her with his tongue, with a visceral note in his chest and a penetrating answer. He took command of the embrace. His body closed with hers. On the floor of the hall, with his weight pressed down on her, he kissed her wholly, all play and lightness vanished. And she returned it, opening her mouth across his. The low music beat against her, a primitive sound in his throat. He responded to her taking what she surrendered as easily as if he knew her mind, knew the moment that her body and her heart awakened to sensation. He locked his hands with hers and spread them out on the cold stone. His signet ring drove into her finger, caught between his hand and hers, painful pressure down to the bone, but she wanted it. She wanted it there, as she wanted him. Everything. Inside her arched upward to meet his kiss. It seemed that she had been bound up, held tight by threads that he had broken with a touch. She heard herself, like a whimpering child, moaning with the terrible pleasure of it. She moved, she could not help it, taking the rhythm that he gave her with his tongue, arching to find more. Most edifying. Lady de Marny's voice was like a cascade of ice water. Maddie jerked. Jervalk stilled for an instant, but instead of springing away, he held tighter against Maddie's convulsive effort to extricate herself. Without looking up, he kissed her ear. Calm, he said, muffled against her. Calm, Maddie girl. Then he kissed her briefly again, and lifted himself away. She scrambled to her feet. Jervalk stood. Lady de Marley, with a maid behind her and her stick planted in front, was a white, grim face painted upon a black statue. And Vesta, Jervalt said, with a slight bow. He took Maddie's arm. She could not move of her own accord. He pulled her closer to him and drew her forward. Welcome, he said, amazing Maddie with his composure. All of her own self-possession had vanished. Pleasant trip? Maddie saw the way his speech caught Lady de Marley's attention, a gratifying respite from focus on herself. The elderly woman stared at him a long and arctic scrutiny. You are recovered, she said at last. Better, Jervalk said. The pressure of his hand forced Maddie forward. Duchess. Ark Mead. Honor of wife. His speaking had regressed. With Maddie alone, he could already express himself more smoothly. Than that. Not much better. Lady de Marley said dryly. She glanced at Maddie. And you, Mississippi. You have outfoxed us all indeed. 
I had not taken you for an adventuress. Duchess, Gervolt said, with an emphasis more of warning than of effort. Where are the documents? Gervolt smiled darkly at her. He said nothing. Impudent boy, she snapped. Legal, he said. Age. Resident. Special. Paper. Church. Witness. Register. Right sign. No lawful. Stop. Except perhaps your sanity, she responded, but it sounded less a threat than a grumble. Bedlamite. You might have taken the girl you were offered and saved us both a peck of trouble. Miss. Trothorse. Miss Trotman whose father threatens to sue you for breach of promise. Me! He laughed outright. You promise. You pay. By the set of her jaw, it was obvious that he had made a point. She hit her stick on the floor, and the sharp sound echoed round the hall. Maddie found herself the object of that cold-hearted stare. I will retire to rest. You, Miss Duchess. You will attend me in one hour in my chamber. There was no evading it. Maddie nodded. Lady de Marley creaked and tapped her way across the hall. The maid, almost as elderly as her mistress, gave Maddie a quick glance and hurried after. Strangely, it had almost seemed as if... The maid had smiled. Call you, Duchess. Jervox looked at Maddie sideways. She will conceded. Occupying all of one of the oldest ranges of the castle, Lady de Marley's customary apartments still had the chill of disuse. Blanketed and swathed up to her chin, she had established herself in the inglenook of a mammoth hearth. The fire was robust, but in most of the room one's breath still frosted. Lady de Marley might have conceded that Maddie was the Duchess, but she gave no extra deference to the fact. Under the all-encompassing title of Girl, Maddie was ordered into a straight-back chair that did not quite fit into the nook, where in a very short time, her front was roasted and her back freezing. With no other overture, Lady de Marley said, I took pains to stop at this St. Matthew's on my way. The marriage is registered in the parish book. Yes, Maddie said. She had signed herself there the worst and most concrete of her offenses, she feared. I also inquired into the notice book at Doctor's Commons. The issuance of a special license for the marriage of the Duke of Jervalx and Archimedia Timms is duly remarked. T'would appear that it is as he said. All is in order. Is it? Maddie knew nothing of the formalities of the process outside of France. She felt an odd relief that Durham had after all been truthful. That comforts you, I see. Did you think it was not? Maddie looked at her skirt and then up again. Verily, it would not have surprised me to find it unlawful in some way. It was done in much haste at Durham's urging. And was it indeed? Within the hood of her shawl, Lady de Marley's eyes were sharp. Yes. Maddie took a deep breath. Thou knowest that the duke will do anything to avoid confinement. He has done this in order that I may help to protect him from it. I would not have consented. I would have searched for. Another way, but with half a dozen of thy men breaking in at the door of the church. My men? Breaking in? You're mistaken, miss. No one in my service had to do with this debacle. There were men there, intent to take him. Take him. Lady de Marley hunched down in her blanket. His mother is a fool. Her lips wrinkled in contempt. As if he were a common criminal. I knew nothing of this. Durham told us that when he returned to London, hirelings had been asking after him and the Duke. He feared that they would follow him out of town, and he could think of no answer but to arrange for the special license in case they should, so that someone might be able to say them nay. Cocklehead. He should have come to me. I could have said them nay, and soon enough. Unexpectedly, the old woman chuckled. But Jervox prefers to hide behind a prettier face, does he? 
his appetites outweigh his judgment. Those jackals that his sisters married will have him yet, if he don't show more wit. Mark me, if there were hired men brought in, we can guess who put that pretty notion into his mother's head. Wretched vulgarians. Hired men, do you believe it? We'll have a reward in the newspapers next. Wanted, the mad duke. It's a blessing that his father never lived to see this, God rest him. She took a deep inhalation of salts, and then her hand disappeared among the blankets and shawls again. The new petition for a writ has already been filed. Did he have you first before the wedding or after? Have me do what? Matty asked. Lady de Marley snorted. Have relations with you, Duchess, she said in an ironical tone. As if her body understood before her mind, Maddie grew flushed all over. When full comprehension of the question burst upon her, she had to make a conscious effort to keep herself still in the chair, although it scraped back over the hearth a little with the force of her reaction. She was vividly aware of the maid sitting somewhere further from the fire and Lady de Marley's acid surveillance. Not before, she mumbled. Tell me the truth and speak up, girl. I'm not interested in your morals. I'm interested in an heir. Maddie lifted her chin. Not before, she repeated, with more emphasis. What was your last monthly? Thou art intrusive, Maddie said. When one becomes a duchess, my girl, one finds oneself intruded upon in these matters. When? Maddie stayed stubbornly silent. I wonder at your reserve. Considering the public display to which I found myself treated this afternoon, Lady de Marley leaned back and pushed the shawl from her head, revealing a black cap and jet ribbons. Although I suppose it bodes well for the fruitfulness of the marriage. Tell me about Jervalx. He is much restored. Maddie was relieved to go on to another topic. Yes. He's better even than thou hast heard, when he is at ease. Lady de Marley nodded. I'd pondered bringing in another physician, but where's the good of it? We've had a hundred. I think he does well enough with you. She lifted one white, twig-like finger. Make no mistake, girl. This marriage is a disgrace. I'd have had better for him, but as long as it's been made legal— One breeder's as good as the next in the circumstances. She shrugged. He seems to like you well enough. Your mother sent a letter, Lady de Marley announced in the drawing room after dinner. She produced a paper from beneath her shawl and held it out to Jervalx. Just as he was about to take it, she held it back a little. Shall I read it for you? He plucked it from her hand. I read. He took it to his chair and sprawled there. He held the sealed missive between his hands, then put it on his knee. Lady de Marley watched him intently, as if to judge whether he was truly going to read it or just make the motion. He turned the letter over. He pushed it onto his other knee. Finally he stood up, brought it to Mattie, and commanded, Open! After she'd broken the wax seal, he returned to his chair and read. He took a long time about it turning his head slightly to the right as if he could not quite see the writing straight on. Finally he sighed, rolled his eyes, and tossed it on the table beside him. Then he gave Maddie a sly grin. Not coming. She says no more than that? Lady de Marley asked. Jervalx picked up the letter again and let it unfold from his fingers. Pray. Pray. Lots of pray. Set. Not foot, with same house, my miss. Mistress. He glanced at Maddie. You. He consulted the letter again. Sisters, not allow. Unnature, son. He crumpled it in one hand and lobbed it into the fire from across the room. She is not pleased with your choice. Lady de Marley commented. Legal, Jervalk said. Not mistress. Wife. To be sure, his aunt said. But you leave yourself open, you know. 
there is the question of whether you are in your right mind. What are the provisions? Is the estate protected? What if Miss Timms is a fortune hunter who has trapped an imbecile in her web? He is not. Lady de Marley interrupted Maddie. I speak only of questions, Duchess. Your position is weak. This marriage can only tell against him at his hearing. No rational man of his rank would have contracted it. The Duke stood up suddenly. He went to the writing desk. Picked up the pen and held it out to her. Settlement now. Right. What you want? What I want? Maddie asked. Lady de Marley snorted. Jervalk smiled suddenly. My sweet life, he said. Three horses own, two gentlewomen, twenty gowns, all chambers fit, beds, cushions, carpets, six or eight. Gentlemen. He laid the pen in her hand. Matty girl. What you want? I want nothing. Lady de Marley laughed outright, as if she had made a joke. Jervalk's gazed down at Maddie a moment and then knelt beside her chair. Nothing? She shook her head helplessly. Of course not. He looked into her eyes, his head tilted a little. He had the ghost of a gentle smile on his lips. Father? He asked. Not you then, support father? Oh. She bit her lip, sorely tempted. No. It would not be right. Lady de Marley spoke abruptly. You had best not carry this pretty act too far, girl. If he died tonight, there's not a provision for you anywhere. Not a shilling would you get, and you may believe it. State some reasonable and provident sums, and the court will think the better of you for your common sense. Calvin and I can witness your hand, and the Duke's. But, Maddie looked to him. I want no sums. The end. Me, we aren't to. He put his hand over hers, a sharp squeeze. She understood that well enough. For a moment the room was silent. Maddie girl, he said. I owe now everything. He smiled at her, such a smile, it made her heart ache. Give back. You, a little. Thou dost not owe anything to me, she whispered. He let go of her and stood up. How much? Trotman? He looked at his aunt. She brought ten thousand, Lady de Marley said. He made an impatient gesture of his hand. How much? A jointure of fifty-two hundred. Allowance the same, and life interest in a quarter of the Monmouth rents upon your death. Mind you, Miss Trotman brought ten thousand with her. Fifty thousand to be distributed among female issue on marriage with consent. Seventy-five thousand among second, third and fourth male issue, fifty among any other males, the same terms. Remainder to the heir. He laughed. Busy, wife. Lady de Marley lifted her thin brows and scanned Maddie. She looks in prime health for the task. Tomorrow, he said. I send for. Bailey. You tell settlement. Right same, what you said. At two thousand annual life, Mr. John Timms. Careful. Mistake. I can read. But, Maddie said. Want, Jervalx interjected. I want. She sat back in her chair. It was all a parody. She had gone so far into falsehood that it had come to the writing of preposterous documents providing for the children of a marriage that would not exist. With a sudden spirit, she stood up. I will retire. Jervalx bowed. Lady de Marley actually smiled. She held out her hand. Good night to you, Duchess. Maddie took it. The old lady squeezed her with gaunt fingers, turning up one cheek. Maddie hesitated and then bent, and gave her a brief kiss. Lady de Marley started to let go, and then grasped the Duke's signet, lifting it upright on Maddie's finger. Is this the best you could do, Jervalks? For heaven's sake, boy, get her a proper wedding ring. 
Well, he agreed. Maddie withdrew her hand as Lady de Marley released it. She went to the door, already not looking forward to the long walk down dim corridors and across the dark hall. It's the other door, girl, Lady de Marley said irritably. Don't open that one, you'll let the chill in, Maddie faltered. She was quite certain that this was the correct door. Maddie, the Duke said. She looked at him. He inclined his head toward an entrance that she had not used before. Obediently, she crossed the room and opened that door. It led into a room as magnificent as all the rest, a bedroom, done in the phoenix colors of white and blue. Above the formidable tall bed, a golden coronet crowned the canopy. Belatedly, she realized what it meant. She stopped in the doorway. This was Jervox's chamber. She turned around and came out. I prefer. Lady de Marley interrupted her. Nonsense, she said, as if she knew exactly what Maddie had intended to say. Why should he have to chase you across half the county? Sleep in there, girl. There'll be years enough ahead for your own chamber. Jervalk said nothing. He stood in the middle of the room, his hands locked behind his back, tall and elegant. He just looked at her, deep blue eyes and mystery. Years enough, girl, Lady de Marley repeated, in a voice that had grown old and time-worn. You mark my words. Maddie sat up in a gilt chair with a knobbed and railed back, well calculated to prevent anyone from falling asleep. The Duke's bedchamber had a more lived-in look than any of the others she had seen. In addition to the intimidating bed and the coronet, a low case held books that lay tilted and piled on one another as if they were used often. Stacks of papers and journals on a writing desk before the window had the look of real work instead of company show. An oil lamp was lit there. The neat banking of each pile seemed likely to Maddie to be a servant's contribution rather than Jervox's. She recalled the quick disarray he had made of the study at St. Matthews and felt sympathy for the responsible maid, who would have to take care not to displace anything in her tidying, no doubt caught between the housekeeper's standards and the duke's jumble, which he would certainly claim was perfectly organized in his own abstruse system. Maddie was familiar with such arrangements. It would consist entirely of shoving whatever he was not working on out of the way, heaping more work on top of that, creating another stack for a new project, pushing them back and forth as needed, taking the top off of one and putting it onto another when a journal was required from the bottom of the first, and then blaming the servants for their meddling rearrangements when some necessary paper could not be found. She looked mostly at the desk, because she felt embarrassed to look at the paintings. They were just what friends found worst about the vain representation of worldly things. Even the ostensibly religious ones were lascivious. One whole wall was covered with a full-length figure of Eve, the apple at her feet, and only a coyly placed hand for covering. There was a panel of women bathing in a stream, with satyrs peeking from the woods around, and one of Lady Godiva riding through the city on a white horse, with her hair spread, concealing more of the horse than herself. The only work Maddie could observe without blushing outright was a small painting of a young woman in a Dutch headdress, turning toward the viewer as if surprised in the act of observing herself in the looking glass she held. Her smile was a blend of self-consciousness, mischief and welcome, so real, and with such shy pleasure in it that it made one want to smile in. Return Maddie looked at that one for a long time, beguiled by the magic of mere paint and flat canvas made into such a living. Presence The table next to her chair held a decanter and glass, and several miniatures, all of ladies. She supposed they must be his sisters, though they did not much resemble the ladies Maddie had seen. Next to one was a watch glass with no watch, but instead a lock of bright yellow hair pressed within it. Not one of his sisters had yellow hair. She stood up and went close to the little painting of the girl in the looking glass, trying to distinguish the brush strokes that created the impression. It hung close to the wainscot, so that she had to lean down to look. As she bent there, the door opened softly. Maddie turned around. 
Jervox closed the door behind the dogs, who both trotted forward, gave Maddie a brief greeting and then leaped upon the bed, curling up at the foot with the familiarity of long possession. Jervox stood a moment, looking at her. Like the girl, paint? he asked. It's a very creditable image, she said. Credit. Rembrandt. Oh, yes. He is very famous, is he not? Somewhat. He seemed amused. I don't know much of paintings, she said shyly. We aren't to have them. No? He came close and stood beside her, looking at the portrait. Why? She frowned a little. The Bible says no graven image. And they are, creaturely. She cast a quick, meaningful glance round. The room. There was hardly a collection of images conceivable. Which could have been called more creaturely than his. I like them, he said, and smiled, and touched her cheek lightly, and kissed her. Maddie stepped back, moistening her lips. Thy aunt is retired? I should go. No. He shook his head. Stay. She is there. This is a very awkward arrangement. Maddie made a helpless gesture toward the adjacent drawing room. Old fashioned. Great chamber, with drawing room. Bedroom. He made three marks in the air, lined in a row. Old lords, eating feasting great chamber. After eat, I ate. They ate, then invite, friends, withdraw private to, drawing. He nodded back toward the drawing room. It was. Sign of favor. Good friends only, invited. Same, the same. Never changed here. Great chamber, to drawing, to bedroom. Old-fashioned jervalks. Hundreds years. Still, it is awkward now. Perhaps thou art weary, and wish to go to bed. He shrugged off his coat. Gone days, the best of friend. Invited, all the way, come into, here. He swept out his coat in a bow. High honor to, you. I should depart. Is there another way I might go out? He laid the garment over a chair and started to unbutton his waistcoat, then dropped his hand. He looked at her. Can't. Fasten. One button was already undone. Maddie pursed her lips. Thou canst. Thou ought to begin to try. I can't, he said serenely. You. He came and stood in front of her, his sleeves white and full, the waistcoat exquisitely embroidered with tiny silver flowers, a contrast with the solid masculine outline of his body. He was so matter-of-fact that it was hard to be uncomfortable. She reached up and undid the buttons, then loosened his neckcloth. There were buttons on his cream. Colored trousers, too, but she ignored them. When she finished, he moved promptly away, leaving her with the waistcoat and neckcloth. She relaxed a little more, catching up his coat and carrying the clothes into the dressing closet. When she came back, he was sitting on the chaise lounge, leaning down to remove his shoes. His shirt loose and his collar open, half-dressed and cavalier, he stretched his legs out on the chaise and leaned his head back. Tired, he said, and gave a deep sigh. Plague of she-dragon. The last trace of Maddie's unease vanished. She has a forceful character, she said with a small smile. He reached and dragged the desk chair next to him. You sit, me. Maddie sat down. Perhaps it was best to stay a while longer, to make certain his aunt had left. She folded her hands in her lap. He looked at her sideways. Prim. Matty girl. Before she could prevent him, he leaned over and tweaked her skirt aside, revealing her sturdy shoes and woolen stockings beneath the elegant blue silk. Off, he said and sat up. He bent down and began to unfasten them. Indeed thou canst unfasten, she said in accusation. He grunted noncommittally, holding her ankle when she tried to pull her foot away. Let, he said firmly. 
His hand was warm and solid on her, unyielding. Maddie bit her lip and stopped resisting. He took off her shoes and tossed them one by one away. Done up, Maddie girl? He clasped her feet within his palms and lifted them onto his lap, rubbing his thumbs into the arches. It instantly felt so wonderful and rejuvenating that her protest died on her lips. She tried to remain sitting straight, but the combination of his delightful kneading of tired muscles and the angle of her position would not allow it. Oh, that is very easing. He made no answer, looking down at her feet as he rubbed them. Her skirt fell in a sapphire sheen to the floor, rumpling a little as he compressed her heels and then slid his hands up to the back of her ankles. Oh, Maddie murmured with another sigh. She closed her eyes. He kneaded her calves, and then slipped one hand back to her toes, wriggling them apart one by one in a maneuver that was as delicious as it was singular. She gave a breathless small laugh, her eyes still closed. I didn't know such a thing, felt so agreeable. Mmm. He shifted. Maddie opened her eyes. He was repositioning himself stretching his legs out on the chaise again. She started to withdraw her feet, but he held them, settling back. He closed his eyes and went on with his smooth massage. Wouldst thou prefer that I rub thy feet instead? She offered. No. Looking at him, she might have thought he was asleep, except that he continued the strong, steady circles with his thumbs against the soles of her feet, then up the sides, and all around her heels. Then her toes again, one by one, until her feet began to tingle with pleasure. She closed her own eyes again and sat still, allowing herself to be immersed in the sensation. The hearth in his room was of the modern sort, a raised grate that sent warmth to the comers. She let the silk shawl she'd worn all day slip down off her shoulders. Could only Rembrandt paint you, the Duke said. She found him watching her. He ran his palm along the length of her leg, a light stroke, from her ankle to her knee. This way, paint, so I can remember. His hands ceased their motion. The room was silent, except for the slow, faint hiss of steam from the coals. In the light of the oil lamp, curves of indigo and cobalt draped down her skirt. Rich color against the stark white of her stockings. His hand lay across her exposed leg motionless. He was watching it, his face dark and harsh in the lamplight. He looked up sideways at her. Friend? She made no answer, too full of feeling to put words to it. Friend you, Maddie, always. Don't forget. No, she whispered. I will not forget thee. He moved abruptly, setting her feet away. She drew them underneath her as he rose. Sleep here, he said. I bedding closet. There was a sleeping cot in the dressing room. Maddie had seen it when she took his clothes. Oh, no. That would not be fair. I will go when thy aunt is retired. Go? Long way, Maddie girl. Dark. Not alive. Ghost. Stay here. Ghost? Maddie said. Bad ghost. He looked at her, all pirate innocence. Didn't tell? There is no ghost. He made a sound in his throat, the most blood curdling low moan. Devil lifted his head, looking up alertly from a comfortable curl on the bed. There is no ghost. One step, one step. Jervalk stood in half light, his eyes glittering. Paul walked slow up the stairs. She took a deep breath, found her shoes, and stuck her feet into them. She marched to the door. I shall go back with Lady de Marley. She won't like. Want you here. Sleep. He grinned. Choice. Dragon ghost me. There is no ghost. He did not say there was, and he did not say there wasn't. Maddie peeked out into the drawing room and found that lady. De Marley had already gone. The chamber was dark, 
growing cool, with only the last orange winking eyes of the coals casting a dim light over the carpet. She thought of ringing for Calvin Elder and realized how late it had become. Besides, it was ridiculous and unchristian to fear ghosts. Devil hopped down from the bed and came to her. Wilt thou attend me? she asked the dog. Devil wagged his tail. He jumped up and put his paws on her skirt. She looked up at Jervalk's archly. We'll take a candle. He bowed and opened his hand. Fair. Well. Come, she said to the dog, who trotted obediently ahead of her out the door. Frigid air washed in the drawing room door as she opened it into the corridor. Devil slipped out and disappeared instantly beyond the wavering globe of candlelight. Come back, she demanded in a hiss. Her words echoed, returning as sinister whispers. The dog, its nails clicking on stone, came back and jumped up on her. She petted it and started ahead. Devil fell away, trotting on again, vanishing. She quickened her steps, squinting into the quivering shadows cast by the candle. Her shoes, unbuckled, made scuffling clunks against the floor. She stopped once. The corridor was full of reverberations. That died away, leaving cold silence. If there were another person. In the entire mammoth pile of stone besides herself, there was no sign of it now. Her breath frosted. She turned behind her. A man was standing there. She gave a gasp, jumping back, realizing even as she did that it was one of the suits of armor at motionless attention, the flux of her candle giving it the illusion of strange life. Devil! She called softly, urgently, forcing herself to turn her back on the figure. In a moment, she heard the reassuring click of dog paws, and Devil's familiar white speckled shape appeared out of the gloom. This time, she bent a little and grasped the animal's ruff, forcing it to stay with her. They went forward together to the top of the stair. Maddie stopped there. She heard nothing but Devil's tongue as he took advantage of the moment to lie down and lick at one of his. Pause. The stairs swept downward in a broad curve, an invitation into blackness. The memory of the Duke's chilling moan came to her, so vivid that she whirled around again to see if he had followed her to tease her with it. The wide corridor stood empty. As Maddie turned to the stair, Devil's ears lifted. He stood up staring down into the dark ahead. Maddie felt a terrible prickle come over her. Her eyes began to water. The dog leaned over the stair. He bristled. A low, menacing growl rose in his throat. Maddie's breath seemed to leave her all at once. He leaped forward with a snarling bark. Maddie broke and ran. She had her skirts in one hand, the candle in the other. Her shoes slapped awkward, echoing as if there was something treading sharply after her. Devil came beside her and ran ahead into the dark. She rushed faster, making little whimpers in her throat, feeling the footsteps behind catching up, when she saw. The dog scrabbling at a door, she shoved it open, through the candle onto the stone floor behind her, and slammed the barrier shut. She found herself in the duke's chamber. He was turning around, his shirt in one hand. Maddie hurled herself against his bare chest, whirling so that he was between her and the door. There's something there, she cried. The dog, the devil, there's something in the hall. Chapter 24 Maddie girl, Maddie girl. He held her hard, rocking her, chuckling quietly. It's all right. There's nothing nothing there. In his arms, the convulsive shivers were subsiding. She felt silly even as she clung to him. There was nothing there. Of course there was nothing. The dog growled. She lamented, her voice still holding a high-pitched break. He was looking down the stairs. Another shiver took her. She drew in a deep breath, trying to gather her wits. Devil had jumped on the bed and sat looking at her, absurdly unconcerned. The watering of her eyes had wetted her cheeks. 
He touched a tear with his forefinger. I'm sorry, she said. I know there's nothing there. I'm so stupid. At night, in my room, I hear footsteps. He folded her closer into his shoulder. Maddie girl, I'm sorry. It's my fault. He hugged her. Come, let's go see what it was. Oh, no. I'd rather not. But with his arm around her shoulder, he took her to the door. Just outside, the candle she'd thrown down lay in the stone corridor, still burning. He picked it up, not letting go of her. The light flared as he held it up high and fed one of the oiled flambeaux to life. He kept her against him, striding across. To the next torch and lighting it, illuminating the corridor as they progressed. The dogs ranged ahead and back. At the top of the stairs, he snuffed the candle against the wall and pulled the last torch from its bracket. With Maddie beneath his arm, the whole staircase lit by the intense flame, they went down. As bright as it was, the darkness in the hall ate up the light of the single torch. Jervalx let go of her at the foot of the steps, handed her the flambeau, and went to a huge crank on the wall. He pulled the brake free, and with a clanking of gears, a rope began to pay out from the wheel. The torch caught the shadow of a mass descending, illuminated the two immense iron chandeliers declining ponderously from above. When they were within reach, he set the brake again and took the torch, walking from candle to candle, lighting the whole range of both pendants. Slowly the great room began to brighten, lighting him as well, the golden. Blaze on his bare skin, his hair as dark as the deepest corners of shadow. Finally he stood back, holding up the torch, a pagan god in the barren hall. Better? he asked. Maddie had long before begun to feel very, very foolish. Oh, yes, she said in a tiny voice. Thank thee. Devil suddenly let out a bark and scrambled after a shadow that thumped down from the minstrels. Gallery onto a table below. The two raced across the floor, the tabby cat making a tremendous leap and disappearing into a niche inside the fireplace just an inch ahead of Devil's nose. The ghost, Jervalk said. A bewildered young footman in his shirt sleeves appeared in one of the arched doorways beneath the gallery. The Duke looked toward him. We dispatch, specters, he said. When the servant came into the hall, he held out the torch. Snuff them. The candles. Up the morning. The footman took the light and bowed. Jervalx came to her. Thank thee. I was silly. Perhaps I should go to my room now, she said. He took her around the shoulders and started for the stairs that led to his own. The dogs came, running ahead. Maddie thought of the dark gallery and the halls and stairs between her and the Dowager Duchess apartment. She thought of the footsteps. She didn't believe in ghosts, but in a place like this, it was a fine thing to have too. Dogs and a large, vigorous and very substantial male striding. Along the reverberating passages beside her. Ghosts. Christian rested his arms behind his head, grinning up into the darkness of the dressing room. Maddie girl. His prim, righteous, practical Maddie girl was afraid of ghosts. Jervalk's castle had them, of course. Any number. He'd had to lie extravagantly in reassuring her. His favorite was the staghound that stuck before the tremendous. Hearth in the hall on Christmas Eve. He'd seen it himself, when James was still alive, one cold night after Massachusetts. They thought it was a stray gotten past the gatehouse but when they'd called out to it, it had risen and stretched and loped away to vanish right through the carved wood of the screen's passage. The story, that the dog's place of honor by the fire had been earned saving the lord's child from drowning and that the ghost appeared as guardian, a signal that the lady of the castle was soon to produce and safely raise another offspring. He thought the tale overly maudlin for any self-respecting apparition. But it was true that his youngest sibling Catherine had been born that next year and was still alive and in perfect health at twenty-five, 
unlike three of his brothers and two sisters not so fortunate. He sighed, thinking of James, and Claire, and Anne, and sweet William Francis. His mother had her reasons for curdling into a religious zealot. Perhaps they should have left a leg of mutton out to entice the ghostly hound to come more often. He hadn't told Maddie about the staghound. On his own account, he'd let only one small truth slip, that above the Duchess' bedchamber was the black guard's walk. He didn't even have to tell her the story that went with it. He could see that the mere name was enough. He smiled. She would stay with him from now on. Maddie snuggled down in the Duke's bed. She was in her chemise, having no gown with her, but still warm and secure. Devil and Cass lay at the foot of the bed, breathing soft occasional sighs. She did not instantly go to sleep, as comfortable as she was. There were several pillows. She'd shifted around among them until she'd found the one she was certain was Jervox's. She lay on it, breathing in the scent of him. Somewhere between upright Archimedia Tims and total wanton surrender to fleshly temptation was someone new to her, a person who liked pretty colored dresses, and having her feet rubbed, and kisses. And a pillow that held the presence of the man who slept in the next room, close enough to come to her aid if she should be threatened by the black guard. Harbored as she was, the trepidation was only a delicious. Tremor, an excuse to recall how solidly he'd held on to her when she'd burst into the room in her headlong flight. There were no ghosts. Jervalk said there were not. Devil had growled at a cat, and the Duke had lit the whole hall and sent specters into oblivion against his glowing solid reality, his body in torchlight, in the incandescent flame of two hundred candles. She tried to listen for his breathing from the other room. But of course the door was shut almost shut, he'd left it open a crack for her, and she couldn't hear anything but the dog's quiet inhalation. She gazed upward into the dark. And then she did a reckless thing. She pushed the bedclothes back and rose, climbing down from the high bed. The last of the fire cast a color that did not light anything, but she remembered the path to the dressing. Room door. She slipped her bare feet over the floor, feeling her. Way. She felt the wall and the doorframe. She stopped. Jervox? She whispered. If he were asleep, it was too soft to wake him. But he instantly said, Maddie girl? She took a breath. I'm. She could not quite lie and say that she was still afraid. I'm shaky. That was true enough. She shivered as she stood there from cold and agitation. She heard the creak of his cot. In a moment the door slipped from beneath her fingers and he was there, a warm shadow. He touched her, finding her arm, outlining her, holding her up close against him. Scare? She said nothing, only pressed herself into the embrace. He was still bare-chested, and she felt a surge of guilt for not seeing that he was properly taken care of. It was a kiss that she'd wanted, and he gave it to her, light and gentle, his tongue briefly tasting her lips. With you? he asked, exerting a pressure against her, guiding her into the main room. Maddie drew back, not certain what she wished, beyond her. Flimsy pretext, her excuse for carnal kisses. He stood close to her, not quite touching. Scared? he asked, offering her such easy justification. Want stay with you. She shivered again. He chuckled softly. Poor Maddie girl. Come here. So warm and bare and smooth he was as he enclosed her in his arms, his shoulder, his skin against her cheek. When he prompted her to move toward the bed, she went with him. In the dimness, he knew it better than she. He turned when they reached it and hiked himself up onto the high bedstead. The dog shifted about sniffing at Maddie as Jervalks gave her his hand and drew her up with him. Off, the duke ordered them firmly, at which they retreated as far as the foot of the bed. Maddie could only see him as an indistinct outline of motion against the paler bedclothes as he settled into the bed. 
He made a luxurious low sound of pleasure. Warm here. You. Maddie girl. She was still sitting up among the sheets, nervous and doubtful at the way things had gone beyond her intention. He caught her, drawing her down next to him. His body seemed to come all around hers, her back pressed up against him, his leg raised in the hollow of her knee. He leaned over her, kissed her shoulder and her throat. He slid the sleeve of her shift downward. His fingers slipped over her skin, drifting to her breast. Behind her ear, at the margin of her hair, he stroked her with his tongue. There was a boldness to his caresses and intention. Thou said, Maddie could hardly find her voice. Thou agreed, all of his movements stilled. His hand rested on her arm. He made a soft groan. He buried his face in the curve of her shoulder for an instant and then fell back against the bed. Maddie stared into the dark. She was relieved and disappointed at once, scared of things beyond ghosts. Suddenly he pulled her into his arms again and held her very hard, rubbing his cheek against her hair. All along her back he pressed into her. She realized with a shock that he had nothing on at all and was in a state of animal arousal. He relaxed his overpowering embrace. With a deep sigh he cradled her. His arm lay beneath her head, a solid heat against her cheek. For a long time they rested that way. Jervolks, she said into the dark. My name. His breath warmed her neck when he spoke. Christian. He leaned a little closer. Wife. She felt guilty and ashamed. It was not he who had demanded that the marriage be kept undone. It was not he who had got up in the night and come to her. He made no other move. Asked nothing of her. Only lay. Impassioned, clasping her in the bed. She knew what she had done. She had already yielded to the weakness of her earthly self. She had given the decision to him, and he, a man of honor, held to his promise better than she held to her truthfulness. If there were ever, Christian thought, a time for his peers to question his sanity, it must be if they could see him now, with his arms around the woman he'd taken for his wife, ready for. Her aching for her after days of teasing contact, and he did not do it. Chose not to do it. Smelled the smoky sweet scent of her hair felt the curve of her body, the trusting delicate girl softness under a slip of linen. All the blood in his body ran erotic, beat longing, beat mine, mine, mine. He wanted her, craving more than entry, craving full possession. And she wanted it, too. He could feel it in her, no stiff withdrawal, no animosity. He knew when a woman was hostile to him, and when she was playing at indignation, and this was either. This was just pure hell, that he could give her all the pleasure that he'd spent the past days leading her on toward, that she'd come this far, to seek him and let him lie down beside her, that he had every right. Every right. Hang her religion and her friends. Was it a different God they pledged themselves before? Had she married an infidel? A padishah with two hundred wives? He was just a man with a pretty good idea of what his sins were, and wanting to have a real union with his own bride was not one of them. She was his wife. She was his. He held her tighter and put his face against her. You tell when to stop, he said, his voice muffled. You say you don't want. The flame in her was slow and deep. He was going to incite it with the fire in himself. He was going to make a blaze to burn down cities, to lay waste cathedrals and castles and plain meeting houses, to make a world where it was only him, and only her, and this bed, and one flesh. Maddie felt the change in him before he spoke. She felt his body tighten and stir, the muscles in his arm move beneath her cheek. And then he bid her tell him, say, when to stop. He raised himself above her and bent his face to hers. Say, stop kissing me, stop the whisper of sensation, the touch of thy mouth along my throat. Say, stop thy weight, thy hands up and down, his palms that stroked her arms. 
She could not. She could not. Say stop, because I know thy face so well, even in the dark, thine eyes that turn to mine in bewilderment, in arrogance. They're blue, dark, like clouds that cross the stars. They laugh without words. No more. Stop now. No more, no more as he hung over her, tracing lines of hot delight on her chin, to her lips, to her temples and eyelashes. Teasing gentle, dangerous. Oh, stop my hands from. Holding thy face between them, from pulling thee closer to kiss me, thy mouth on mine, deep and passionate. Stop, it cannot be. We are impossible, an accident of time and place, worlds collided. Stop, thou art so heavy and yet so sweet. So wicked and so sure, kisses at her chin and throat and lower. Say stop. Now, before he drew her shift upward, bare skin to bare skin, his hand on her thigh sliding to her hip, her waist. And hard against her, his arousal, inference, and theory made real. She had seen babies born. She had nursed male patients. She'd listened, quiet and still as in meeting, when the married women talked immoderately. And that only made her wonder at what they had not said. But they would not have said it, not out loud. Not this, his tongue at the tip of her breast, a slow circle that drew her taut. Not this, his hand on her hip, pulling her up against him in the same rhythm that he tugged at her nipple. She spread her hands on his shoulders and whimpered, arching with him. He responded with a low growl, pressing his body hard to hers. Then he moved back, trailing his forefinger down the center of her torso, her belly, the most intimate curls. Stop, oh stop, don't follow with thy mouth and kiss me. And taste, oh, that thou shouldst know such ungodly pleasures. That I should turn and twist beneath thee, all flame. She panted with it, this indecent torture. She drove her fingers into his skin, kneading and pulling, asking him to stop, silently pleading, Stop thy kisses, stop now, while I want and want and want. He didn't stop, he answered her body, because all her body said yes. He slipped his fingers inside her, strange and lascivious, hot pressure. He bent his mouth again to her breast. Mindless sensation spread through her. A promiscuous sound came from her throat, a beast sound. The deep exploration was pain and lust in him, her husband, pushing to discover more of her, to wring soft cries of surrender from her throat. Stop, please, stop. He lifted himself above her. She was open to him, she must say now, say no more, say I do not want thee, I will not have thee, thou must go away and leave me. He came into her, delicious burn, more hurt, her husband, all heat and dark fire, her wicked husband, who knew corrupt worldly things, who held her tight and kissed her and kissed her again while it hurt, stretched his beautiful body over hers, pushing harder, creating pain and soothing it at once, more pain, until she cried out with anguish at the peak. Oh no, he was murmuring, kissing her mouth. Oh no, oh no, sweet Maddie, no. His voice ached as if it hurt him too. He was breathing soft and quick, butterflies of caresses at her lashes and cheeks. He held himself over her, wholly inside. Her, waiting, with a faint, faint tremor in his arms. She gulped for air, her tense muscles slowed to realize that the sharp piercing hurt had subsided. A long sigh escaped from her. As if that had been a signal, He bent his head and gave her a kiss as heavy and carnal as his body's ownership of hers. He began to move in her, renewing the pain. Maddie's fingers curled around his arms in alarm. He whispered to her, but she could not understand it. He had gone away into himself, touching her with his tongue, sucking at her skin, as if he could draw her into his mouth as he shoved inside her body. It hurt but the hurt was drowned in his sensual drive. The penetration burned so deep that it was pleasure to her. She raised her arms around him to take more of it. He moaned, shaking his head, lifting her with each stroke. He seemed to grow tormented, as if she were not close enough. He wanted her closer, 
He wanted every thrust to make them one. He arched into her with a sound that shuddered from deep in his chest, a long and throbbing stretch, a shiver in him and deep inside of her, and she felt him, as far in penetration as he could go, flooding her with his life. She held him tight to her, held him as he shuddered again and again. Her fingers almost could not touch around his shoulders, he was so much larger than she, and yet he dropped his head and rested on her, and nuzzled his face into the curve of her throat like a loving child. Matty, he said between hard breaths, make you glad. I swear. She smoothed her hand down his shoulder and his back. She could feel his heart beating. He shuddered again and pushed himself closer to her. I'll make you glad, he repeated. She bit her lip, resting her head against his. He turned his face deeper into her. Blackguard won't get you he said muffled. Stop. Oh, stop, say stop, but it's too late. Too late. Because God forgive me, I love thee more than my own life. She opened her eyes to morning and close warmth, enfolded in his arms, her hair still pinned up in double braids of the day before. She lay still, feeling the gentle rise and fall of his chest at her side. Her husband. There would be no undoing now. When she turned he was awake already, lying quiet on his side, looking somewhere beyond her. In the dim morning through the drapes, his hair fanned black over the pillow. His expression was austere, his jaw shadowed. His distant gaze came back to her. Either of them spoke. The change in things, the profound chasm between yesterday and today lay between them. He rolled away from her and sighed, locking his hands behind his head. Then he glanced toward her sideways. Regret? The one word held defiance. She looked in her heart for regret. For anger or repentance. None of that was there. Only dismay that she had given in to such weakness. Only a growing sense of the enormity of what she'd done. I broke, he said. I agreement. I did not ask thee to stop. It was the truth. He turned on his side. His blue eyes watched hers. Wife, he said. Such an emphatic presence, even to the impression of his body in the bed, that weighted it down and drew her toward. Him. His knee touched her calf, high up, where no one ever touched her but herself. Yes, she said, a bare whisper. I am thy wife in truth. He sat up flinging back the bedclothes, expelling the dogs from their places. Maddie watched him stalk across the rich room, as graceful and barbaric as the tapestries and paintings. Her own blood marked his skin. The drapes rattled as he pulled them wide. Intense sunlight flooded in, outlining him with the glare. Elevated as the room was, all she saw beyond him through the glass was light and sky. He leaned one arm on the casement. Then he looked back at her and grinned. My wife, he said. Good. He stood there, relaxed, a half-shadowed silhouette against the streamers of radiance. His wife. She blinked and glanced away, because it hurt her eyes to look at him. Chapter 25 Alone with him, uncommitted, she had not made any approaches to the staff. She had lived in his home like a guest but neither Lady de Marley nor Jervox would allow such a dereliction of duty any longer. He is the Duke, you are his Duchess, begin as you mean to go on, his aunt declared. At her direction Maddie had sent a request for the quarterly accounts, and sat down with Rhodes and Calvin Elder to review them. A full half-year of pages were laid before her, and Maddie learned for the first time that while the Duke's absence had been presented to the staff only as a lengthy illness— Rhodes and Calvin Elder were well aware of the nature of it. Although the word, asylum, was never breathed, she suspected that they had been quite uneasy about their future and who would control it. They were stiff with Maddie, but not uncooperative, and before they departed, Rhodes asked a guarded question about whether there was any idea of closing up the castle at all. I don't know, Maddie said honestly. 
I'll ask the Duke. But. He seems very much at home here. Pray don't ask your grace. Don't indeed. Twas a foolish question. Calvin Elder gave Rhodes a severe glance. Your talk will run on to absurdities, Mrs. Rhodes. Why should his grace close the castle? Rhodes accepted this rebuke in a stringent silence. Mattie thought it best to meet the matter head on. Ye have heard, perhaps, that the Duke's competence to conduct his business is in question? We haven't heard anything, your grace, but that his grace was ill, Calvin Elder said, a patent falsehood. It's true he has been ill. It's true that there is to be a hearing for his competency in several months. They both looked at her stoically. Dost thou believe him to seem incompetent? She asked the steward. Certainly not, your grace. He cannot speak well, she replied. Very true, I've remarked that. But he does not seem anything but able to me. Maddie thought this was something of a statement of policy rather than of sincerity but it showed at least where the steward's loyalty lay. Yes, she said. If you will be patient, and give him time, and listen well, then you will find that he's quite able. Very well, your grace. I'll keep these to overlook. She drew the books to her. And I ask each of thee to inform all of the servants beneath ye that I am not to be addressed as your grace, but simply as your mistress. I am... I was raised in the principles of the Society of Friends, and I cannot be easy with the other. Mistress, your grace? Mistress, she said firmly. Simply that. May I request the favor of using the address of, Madam? Calvin Elder asked. As more in keeping with the honor of the house? Maddie looked directly at him. I think the honor of the house will be better upheld by the conduct of those within it than by how I am addressed. She instantly heard how self-righteous she must sound, and bit her lip. She added, I don't pretend that I know anything of a household such as this. I'll need your help and guidance. But I will not be false with ye. I expect that you will not be false with me. The Duke is in real danger of being judged unfit. If that happens, I cannot vouch for what will come after. So perhaps no one will blame me if he choose not to obey me now. But as I, I am his wife, I must do what falls to me in that regard at present, and in the manner that seems best to me. Yes, mistress, Rhodes said. There's been things said, we've heard this and that and the other about his grace, and it's unsettling. I for one thank you for your frankness. Tis better to Know the worst than to be kept in the dark and wonder. Indeed. Thank you. Mistress. Calvin Elder gave the lesser address as if it were a strange foreign word, but he gave it. Maddie had conducted the session with the staff alone, in the Duchess boudoir, but afterward Lady de Marley sat with her in the drawing room to judge the accuracy and necessity of the expenditures. The last quarter to have undergone query had the Duke's scrawled notations tipped in mostly instructions to Calvin Elder about plumbing repairs. The entire expense of the place was staggering. There was a woodman and five. Gamekeepers, watermen, lamp and candle men, sixteen chambermaids, three carpenters, an upholsterer and someone called a gong man. The costs of candles alone left Maddie lightheaded. She felt guilty that Jervalks had lit so many to chase away ghosts in the hall. She and Lady de Marley were in ready agreement that the amount of ale consumed below stairs had been overmuch for a household with no visiting entourage, Maddie painstakingly reckoning up the daily demand against the vast number of staff, but when she objected to thirteen pounds for hair powder for the footmen and grooms of the chambers, she found herself immediately at odds with all moral rectitude and virtue. The honor of the house, Lady de Marley stated, as if that settled the matter. Still. Maddie said, I think that the custom may be discontinued except on special occasions, and when no guests are present. You know nothing of such things, ignorant girl. They would look ramshackle without powder. I shall note that hair is to be kept short and neat at all times. 
Maddie made a memorandum, the way the Duke had done, and placed it in the book. Humbug! They must be powdered! On special occasions, and when guests are present. Maddie said, adding it to her memo. Oh, you are one of those, are you? Maddie looked up at Lady de Marley in question. One of those soft-voiced, serene girls that just go on chewing their cud and walking straight ahead, say what you made to them. She smiled a little. No. I think by nature I'm shrewish and managing, as thou art. But I discovered from my father that a quiet obstinacy is the perfect counter to it. Shrewish. Do you dare? Of all the impertinent, you pride in it. Jervalk said, walking in from his bedchamber. Aunt, tell this silly chit that the men must be powdered. He paused. Men must, what? The men servants, Maddie said. Hair powder. Thou hast spent thirteen pounds upon it last quarter. A pittance, his aunt exclaimed. They must be powdered. Your consequence, Jervalks. They might wear powder on special occasions, Maddie said, and with guests. Guests can arrive at any time. Visitors come to Tur without notice. You don't understand an establishment of this stature. Jervalks, I suggest you set your wife in order straight away. He looked between the two of them, sober, as if it were a profound controversy. Solomon. He brought down his hand in a vertical cut. Half powder, half not. Maddie made a count. There are seven of them. They can't be divided evenly. Her husband did not blink. Powder half their heads. She hesitated, and then broke into a peal of laughter. Christian watched her with pleasure. She always laughed as if she hadn't ever had the enjoyment before, as if the very act surprised her. He would have her painted. Lawrence, he thought, regretting Rembrandt with an inner smile. She wasn't beautiful. She was like the small painting, a moment, a fleeting shade of expression. He would have liked to have it caught that instant when he coaxed her, when those sultry lashes lifted and the straight lace propriety changed to something else, when the promise gave way to reality. He'd learned that a matter-of-fact bearing relaxed her, and from there a gentle tease was most effective, a silly joke more likely to disarm her than gallantry or urgent wooing. Her sense of humor was unsophisticated. The more patently ludicrous a jest, the more likely she was to understand. He wondered if her Quakers ever laughed at all. He had another item to please her. He held out a note. Scribbled in Durham's hand. Father is now coming. Today, perhaps. Joy blossomed in her face, an instant trepidation. She took the paper from him, read it quickly, and pressed her lips together. Oh, she said helplessly, what must he think? He ought to think you've done prodigious well for yourself, and Vesta said ill-tempered. I should not have married without his permission. I should not have taken it into my own hands. A little tinge of panic crept into her voice. Christian watched the play of emotion in her face. He will, is, angry? Oh, no. He would never be angry. He will only be, he will be so quiet. He will make me cry, because I ought to have been better. Better? Lady de Marley demanded. You've made the best match in the country, my girl. I'll tell him so, if he don't know it for himself. Maddie only clenched her hands around the note. Christian walked back into his chamber, then stopped and turned at the door. Maddie girl, he said. I thee wed. Don't forget. He met her eyes. He wasn't going to beg for her allegiance. He made her his own, by law and by physical possession. She was his. He only hoped to God that Durham had done some bloody persuasive talking to Tim's. Maddie had wished for her father so violently before, and almost as violently wished now that she could have more time before she saw him. She should have written to him, made some manner of explanation. She dreaded his coming. And yet, 
when Calvin Elder brought the news that a chaise approached the castle, she rushed down to the gatehouse and was there to see the conveyance roll into the first court. Papa! She was at the window before the postilion had brought the team to a halt. Oh, Papa! Durham had come with him. The younger man rose and gave her father his support. Papa negotiated the steps and stood before her, all bundled in a furred greatcoat that diminished him to bird-like delicacy. Maddie girl, he said warmly, and she knew he was glad to be with her, at least. She went into his arms, hugging him close. Oh, I have missed thee. I have missed thee. He kissed her cheek, holding onto her hands. Maddie girl, he repeated, as if it were all that he could say. He stood back from her and reached up to touch her face, smiling a little. What hast thou done? She shook her head. Papa, I... She lost her voice. She squeezed his hands very hard. Nothing will change, she exclaimed. Thou art to live here with us, did Durham tell thee? It is, oh, Papa, if thou could see it. It's a castle, with great towers and a hall as big as a steeple house. I don't, I don't know what I've done. I only knew thou commanded me to. Stay with him, and I did, and this has come of it. He patted her. Verily, Maddie, I did not command thee. I wouldst not. I asked thee at Chalfont Giles, was it so difficult to stay, and thou answered me that thou couldst not desert him. Yes, but thy message, no need to dally, Durham said. It's bitter cold out here, don't you think, Duchess? Let us, saw. Ah. Here's Chev. Jervolks came across the graveled court. Durham grasped his arm at the elbow, held it for a moment. Grip between the two of them. How do, my man? An old married fellow, by God. Jervalks took her father's hand, enveloping it in both of his. Tim's. Welcome. Come in, the cold. Maddie found herself trailing behind as they guided him off between them. She hurried forward. There are stairs, Papa. Two long flights. Here, now they begin. Amid an echo of footsteps on stone, Jervalks and Durham escorted her father up. It's very formidable to see, Maddie said to him from alongside. There, oh, they must be three yards wide, and go up beneath arches, with columns at the landing. There is a huge ancient door at the top and a footman to hold it open for us. In powder, Jervalx added firmly. So far no trouble with Tim's, Durham said after dinner, as he and Christian lingered alone in the great chamber with their port. Told him it was a surprise love match. Swept away, and so forth. Do you think she'll say anything to contradict it? Christian considered. He thought of Maddie in his bed, of ghosts and a shy sudden laugh. He rested his fist on the table and turned his thumb up. Ah, uh, going well, is it? Durham asked. Well, I was vague about the details but I doubt he'll go comparing notes. All he cared for was that she was safe. Not angry, wed? Durham popped a slice of cheese into his mouth and wriggled his fingers. Bit puzzled by it all, I think. Doesn't say much or ask many questions. He's a fine old chap. No fool either, under that hat brim. Just demanded to know whether you meant honorable by his girl. Don't think he gives a candle for the rest. Didn't ask a thing about money nor endowments. Likes you, that's the sum of it. Thinks you're a bloody genius. Christian made an ironical grunt. Bloody, imbecile. Plain as a pike staff that you're better than when I saw you last. Nearly good as new. Durham lifted his port. This will pass. Got to. I only hope you won't look back and wish you'd done differently when the time comes. Good new, do you think? Well, listen to you. You'll be putting M to sleep in the Lord's in a trifle. Christian tried to imagine speaking again in the house. His pulse rose. The Lord the can't. 
It all locked, the very thought of a public address driving him to halting inarticulation. Damn. He flung himself away from the windows. At the bookcase wall he stopped. He took hold of a pair of pilasters, gazing at the leather and gilt and Latin titles lined between them. Then he dropped his forehead against the shelf edge, the ancient musty smell of books in his nostrils, the wood hard against his head. Can't. Durham was silent. Christian stood with his back to the room. He took a deep breath and pushed himself away, turning. Afraid. He shook his head and sank into a chair. Afraid never. Durham. I don't believe it. Damn it, Chev, I won't believe it. You've come this far. Far. Christian's lip curled in mockery. Listen, me. You've got to keep trying. Perhaps if you had a, a tutor of some sort. My head. Gone. Try, try, no. Try is, make worse. Understand? What, then? You go to ground in this place for the rest of your days? It won't do, Chev. They'll hearken, force you to break cover. There's too much at stake. Manning's been with your mother every day, did you know it? Christian's hands tightened on the chair arms. Manning, his sister Charlotte's husband, who'd stood with barristers and bagwigs in that room. Watching. Waiting to see him stripped and chained. A violent surge of anger spiked through him, shame and dread mingling, holding him mute. He worked his hand on the arm, pressing his fingers into the wood until they hurt. New. Hearing. He managed at last, as calm as he could make it. It's their chance. I called on him myself, just to get a notion how things stood, and I'll tell you, Chev, it chilled my blood. The man's got himself all talked into it, how you've always been erratic and promiscuous, that if you're left free to act, you'll ran the estate into rain, and there's the future of your nephews at stake. The worst of it is, He's made himself believe it. They're not going to give it up. And I've got to warn you, when they heard of this marriage, it was the devil to pay. It plays. Right into their hands. Don't think because you haven't had word from M yet that you won't. Christian closed his eyes. He could not have spoken if he'd wanted to. For Maddie to get a penny, it'll be like stripping the hide from M alive, Durham said. They'll do anything they can to stop it. Christian nodded. So don't say, never. You've got responsibilities. To your wife, if nothing else. He thought of that, beyond himself, to what would become of Maddie if he were to be declared incompetent. If they took him back. They'd set aside the marriage, certainly. His family would never tolerate it. Yesterday it would not have been such a disaster for her. But today, to lie in the cell, to lie in prison there not knowing where she was, what they'd done to her, not even knowing if she was alive. He imagined it, and the nightmare of that place descended to a depth he had not known it could fathom. Maddie had seen her father settled in and retired directly after dinner. She spent a good deal of time making certain that his chamber was not smoky and that the bed was warmed. Thou must not linger over long with me, Maddie he chided her softly. Thy husband will expect thee. Oh, no, I'm sure the duke won't mind. She found herself covered in self-conscious blushes. Lady de Marley and Durham are there. Still, perhaps it is thee that he would rather see. Thou hast only been married a week. But I thought we might talk. Go away now, Matty girl. He smiled. I'm tired and need to sleep. Papa, she protested faintly. He pulled the bedclothes up and closed his eyes. Maddie sat still. After a moment, he rustled the sheets and turned over away from her. By the time she rang for a footman to take her back through the dark passages and hall to the drawing room, Durham and the Duke had come in after their port. Durham didn't linger. When Lady de Marley announced that she would go, he politely rose and offered to escort her. 
Maddie was left alone with Jervalks. Instantly, a desperate modesty overcame her, an exquisite awareness of him and herself. She watched him snuff the candles, leaving only the sharp odor of extinguished wicks and the orange light from the hearth. He went into his bedchamber. The door was open, the room beyond well lit with oil, but Maddie felt bound to her chair. Papa had steadfastly refused to give any opinion on her marriage. She didn't think he condemned it entirely. At least he did not seem disappointed or cross with her, but he was troubled that she knew. She sat in the chair, her legs pressed together, her hands holding the silken ends of her shawl clasped in her lap. Jervox came back to the door in his shirt sleeves, a silhouette against the light from his bedchamber. The coals gave just enough illumination to pick out the shape of his face and the pale fall of the lace on his shirt front. He leaned against the doorframe. Maddie ducked her head and clasped her hands more tightly on the shawl. She heard nothing. Only his shadow falling across the light on the carpet told her that he came into the room. He walked behind her. He began to take down her hair, searching out the pins and letting them fall silently on the floor. Her plates came free. She kept her head lowered as they tumbled across her shoulders. As she sat there still, he began to unbraid them. He spread the ends between his fingers, fanning them open, holding them up to her cheeks to stroke her, feathery, tickling, down the line of her jaw, behind her ears. He traced her throat, pushing away the shawl that she held to her. It slipped from her fingers. Softly the fans of hair caressed her bared shoulders, in circles and arcs to the nape of her neck. She felt his fingers work at her buttons, perfectly capable of it, but slow, one by one downward, unhooking her stays, too. Maddie bent her head as her clothing loosened. She breathed deeply. He moved in front of her, offering his hand. Maddie stood, expecting him to lead her to the bedchamber, but instead he slid his fingers through her braids, releasing the woven strands, spreading them, combing through them. There was an intensity about him, a strange severity. He never looked into her face. Fireglow traced his cheekbones and his jaw and glinted on his lashes. He worked her hair, worked it all free, fanned it open, a cloak around her. He put his hands on her shoulders and pushed her dress and underclothes down her arms. Maddie made a faint sound of protest. Not here, in the open room. Christian heard her, but he did not pause. He couldn't remember when he had first begun to imagine this, her hair around her in fragrant waves, her pale skin a glimpse beneath. It had been somewhere in the nightmare, and while he had her now, had freedom and sense and beauty before him, while he could touch her he would do it in the light, to make it real. While she stood immobile, he drew her hair forward in a curtain over her breasts. He allowed her that defense, covered her in a sheen of dark gold, while beneath it he took down all her clothes to her waist, sliding the dress and the white plain shift past her elbows and her wrists. She made another small sound, as if she wished to remonstrate. But her hands were unresisting as he brought them free of the dress. This is not. She caught her breath as he rested his palms on her bare torso. Jervalx. Christian. He put his forehead down to her shoulder, breathing the liberated scent of her. With other. Jervalx. With alone, Christian. He was exploring beneath the rippled shower of her hair. His hand touched one straining hook. He released it between his thumb and forefinger. The clothes dropped in a bank of silk and linen at her feet. Oh, she said, a whimper of excited misery. Below the dramatic length of her hair, her stockings showed white down to the tops of her incongruous stout shoes. Christian smiled. Sturdy Maddie. Luscious Maddie. Layers and layers, prim provocative puritanical Maddie girl. He knelt before her and unfastened the shoes, powerfully aware of the whisper of her hair at his temple. Turning his head, he kissed her calf and the side of her knee through the thick cascade. 
He cupped both his palms around her leg, sliding them up and down the knitted wool, exerting pressure inside her knee to invite her to come to him. She caught his shoulders, unbalanced. Christian clasped her stocking foot, delicate and arched as she lifted it free of the rigid shoe. She drew quickly from his hold, setting her foot down amid the puffs and folds of silk, taking her hands from him. He coaxed the other leg, but this time she lifted free of her. On accord, a moment, the white tip of her toe in his view, and then she stepped back swiftly, her hair moving in a wave around her. He sat back on the carpet in front of the fire, gazing up at her. The temple of her hair made her virginal. Her shoulders glowed ivory where the shiny tumble parted over them, none like and seductive at once, a living image of bronze and gold. Don't look at me, she said in a strained small voice. Why? He didn't take his eyes away. It is creaturely. Christian leaned back, propping his elbows on his aunt's cushioned footstool. You're a beautiful creature. No, she whispered. Yes. Thou art so wicked. To say, beautiful? Not to say, is lying. Can't lie, Matty girl. You taught, no lies. She held her arms crossed over her breasts. Her eyes were shadowed in soft radiance. And then, unexpectedly, she dropped to her knees at his feet. She shook her hair back, half revealing herself. The rise and fall of her breathing brought a glimpse of the tips of her breasts. Sharp desire rose in him. The virginal image fell away like a mask. She was a nymph of fire and shade, offering herself. No, she said. I ought not to pretend. She lifted one hand a little toward him and let it fall helplessly. But I don't. I don't know what to do. He could have taken her down and had her, without. Ceremony, without regard for anything but the lust that coursed. Through him. He could have held her beneath him, pinned down on those waves of hair, thrust hard into her with the force of his own desire. But all the experience was his. She would not admire him for how he'd obtained it, but it was not lack of hunger that held him still. It was the strength of an exhaustive education in the finer points of love. Do what you like, he said. She hesitated. He held quiescent, relaxed, watching her. She bent her head a little, her hair falling forward around her cheeks. She touched his boot. Christian smiled, observing her. Suddenly the sensual nymph vanished, and she became plain practical Maddie again. She slipped the trouser strap off his heel, took hold of his foot with both hands and jerked the half-boot loose with a deft motion, out and up, then slid it free, as efficient as any seasoned valet. He wriggled his toes at her. Primly, she set the boot aside. In a moment, she had dispatched the second and positioned it neatly next to its mate. She scooted forward a few inches, arranged her hair modestly, sank back onto her heels, and drew his feet into her lap. Christian tilted his head back, gazing up at the ceiling in pleasure. But he didn't want to waste it, not while he had Maddie to look at, Maddie enrobed in her extraordinary hair, rubbing his feet as if it were a task of the most solemn gravity. She needed his arches and his heels, and stopped sometimes to turn one foot a little, looking down at it, bending slightly, inspecting, he presumed, to see that she had done a thorough job. In one of these pauses, he arched his foot and touched his toe to her body, pushing the sheet of her hair aside a fraction. Below her throat, a pale ribbon of light found her skin down the nave of an erotic cathedral. Last night had been all feeling. Tonight it was all the sight of her, in glimpses, in secret moments. He allowed her hair to fall back as she resumed her earnest massage. He wriggled his toes again to get her attention, which seemed to have fixed too intently on the business of kneading. She looked up. He drew his feet away and propped them flat on the floor, watching her between his knees. It was a dare. She had to come forward to him, or retreat entirely. This is not equitable, she said on a plaintive note. Why? Thou art dressed. 
he smiled complacently. Thou art wicked and creaturely, she accused. He tilted his head to the side and lifted his eyebrows. Thou art laughing at me. Not. He stretched his legs out on either side of her. Waiting. Am I to undress thee? She demanded. Is that what I'm supposed to do? He brought his feet together to her hips, caressing her. Want? Her eyes evaded his. She dropped her gaze to the carpet in front of her. He moved his toes slowly over her bare skin and hair. No false. Maddie girl, he said gently. Want? She took a deep breath, exhaled it, and leaned forward over him. It was all Christian could do to hold himself in check. Her. Position on her hands revealed her vividly, full breasts under a wash of gold that caught the firelight, that was too finely translucent to conceal shape behind it. Supporting herself on one hand, she loosened the buttons on his trousers. Her hair slid down, unveiling her back and the curve of her buttocks. She made a quick move to catch it back, rising, a sudden vision of everything, her smooth torso, her breasts, the line of her belly and dark crown of curls. Christian's restraint deserted him. He sat up, leaning on his hands. She seemed startled. She looked at him like a diffident forest creature, drawing back, but he caught her between his legs. He reached up and pulled her down on top of him. He lay back on the carpet, kissing her throat, her breasts, her hair falling all around. But he didn't want to hurry. He wanted a luxurious, slow bonfire. With an effort, he relaxed his hands, smoothed them. Down her body that was poised above him. She had not drawn. Away, not after that first moment, she seemed to wait, not quite meeting his eyes, her lips parted a little. Do you know? I like lazy. He locked his hands behind his head. Still, wait. I don't know what to do. She whispered again, woeful. Can't think? Firelight glistened where she wet her lips. No. I can't. Up, he said. Up on knees. When she made no move, he caught her wrists. He pushed her, his palms against hers, until she knelt upright. She tried to pull her hands away, but he knew what she would do if he allowed it. Don't hide. He kept them locked with his. I remember, first night I saw you, my table, all prim stiff proper, thee thou. Miss Timms? He smiled. Oh, Miss Timms. I saw you, like this. Her cheeks bloomed rosy. Because thou art wicked. You say, wicked. So bad, Maddy girl? She gazed down at him, apparently unaware of the picture she presented and what it did to him. At least, she did not look any lower than his face. You tell, first saw me, what you thought. She gave a faint breath of amusement. I thought thou wert a wicked man. Despise. He raised his knees beside her and closed them on her hips. Scorn. Go home, pray. I like thee a little better after thou offered the mathematical chair to Papa. Ambition, he said. Good wife. That got a real smile from her. He swayed her slightly with his legs. Shrewd. Ambition. He let go of one of her hands and swept her hair back over her shoulder. Beautiful. She began to breathe more quickly. He touched her, traced his fingers along her waist and up to her breast. He outlined the underswell of it with his forefinger. I like that she said in a soft, unexpected rush of words. So do I, he said solemnly. Her breast rose and fell beneath his caress. He went slowly, watching her, every stroke reflected in her face. When he touched her nipple, she drew in a sharp breath and caught her lower lip in her teeth. Christian made a low groan. He pulled upright, closing the space between them. With his tongue he traced the path of his fingers. He rested his hands at her waist and opened his mouth over her nipple, sucking. She whimpered, arching into him. His hands slipped downward, 
thumbs sliding over the provocative short curls. She still had the scent of the night before about her, dense with heat and his passion. Dimly he felt her fingers burrow into his hair, drawing him closer. He pushed his hand between her legs, coaxing them apart. Over his, straddling him wide open, prim Maddie, exquisite sensitive amorous Maddie girl, her hair cascading down over one shoulder, her head tilted back and her lips parted, panting. He made it last. He made it last oh so long, caressing her, teasing her, until her thighs trembled and she gasped each time he touched her. And when he moved beneath her she made a sharp whimper and her eyes sprang open, and she watched him as he did it, easing inside her, pulling her back down onto him. He lifted his head from the carpet to suckle her. She moved with awkward exquisite jerks, writhing, until he cupped his hands at her buttocks and taught her the rhythm, her hair sliding between his palms and her skin. With a lovely suddenness she came, with little female cries like an unquiet dreamer. He brought his arms up around her and held her close for an instant, then with one deep thrust, holding her hips down to take it, he let go of the lust he'd kept damned inside him. When it was finished he held her hard against his chest and never closed his eyes, to make it real, and banish nightmares in the firelight. Chapter 26 Maddie could barely look at Jervalks the next day, though he did nothing to indicate he remembered her abandon, or even that he'd taken notice of it. She thought he was even somewhat cooler toward her than usual, composed and collected, treating her in the presence of the others with nothing more intimate than common courtesy. His demeanor was all casual detachment, except for one private glance behind his aunt's back, that crooked pirate's smile, swift and secret, blue eyes beneath black lashes, while everyone stood round a roaring fire in the hall and discussed plans for the tenant's Christmas dinner. Maddie felt herself blush all over, unable even to break the glance. Jervox's smile turned into a grin, and then it was gone, and he looked away. Durham was suggesting a ball, with waltzing, while Lady de Marley asserted that a pair of oxen roasted, a good dinner of three courses, not less than two hundred dishes to each, mind. You, and an elevating concert of religious music after had always been quite sufficient, and would be in the future. Papa smiled at both ideas, and Calvin Elder wore an expression of attentive discernment, as if he had participated in such controversies times out of number, but owed it to his position to consider the arguments one more time. The Reverend Mr. Durham spent no time on rational propositions to counter Lady de Marley. He merely bowed before her, turning a graceful leg, and began to hum as he lifted her hand and drew her into a revolution. Her stick went. Clattering. She made an irritated exclamation, but her feet moved with a surprising freedom. Unhand me, you outrageous boy, she sputtered, pulling away. You'll break my bones. He held her by one hand, steadying her, still humming as he danced himself around her. A waltz, my lady. Dum dum ta dum dum ta dum, so slash dum ta dum dum. Maddie found herself swept away as unexpectedly as Lady de Marley, her husband's arm around her waist, his hum blending with Durham's, their voices gaining strength. Maddie had no idea how to dance. She scrambled to keep her balance stepping out by necessity as the duke spun her about the floor. The humming had become impromptu music, dum-dum-ta-dum-dum-ta-dum, in strong masculine notes that echoed from the walls while the room whirled about her. His hold on her was light and commanding, his coattails spun out and her skirts flared as they turned. Maddie had to keep her feet moving. Smartly or be flung off them, though each time that it seemed. She must be, he drew her into a spin that saved her. When her toe came down hard on his, his only reaction was an emphatic to instead of a dumb, a pointed smile and a tighter hold on her waist. He and Durham came to the end of their musical piece. Jervolks held her arm up, bowing to her with a flourish. Duchess! Thank you. As Maddie stood flushed, trying to catch her breath, he looked toward the others. Can't dance! he said. 
I don't know how, Maddie exclaimed. Friends aren't to dance. The three of them looked at her. She felt absurdly awkward in her everyday shoes, more clumsy even than Lady de Marley under the weight of years. It is an idle amusement, she said. Lady de Marley sighed. Hire her a master, Jervalx. Calvin Elder met a footman hovering at the screen's passage and returned to them carrying a silver tray with two letters on it. The post is beforehand today, Your Grace. Shall I have it sent to your study? He bowed briefly toward the Duke's aunt. There is an item for Lady de Marley. Leave it in my parlor, she said. Do you suppose that Italian who taught the girls is still in the country, Jervalx? The Duke had taken his letter. He broke it open without aid, a small achievement that no one seemed to note except Maddie, not even Jervalx himself. I should be glad to lend myself to the task, Durham offered, until you can find a master. But we'll need someone to play the instrument. I don't wish to learn to dance, Maddie said. I'll have no occasion for it. Best have a violoncello for music but no doubt we'll only find some widow woman who can play the pianoforte in the village, Lady de Marley said. I really don't wish. Humbug, Lady de Marley said. None of your dissenter faradiddle, girl. If you want to be excused from waltzing, you may do so on the grounds of propriety, but the respectable dances are a requirement. You're no invalid. You'll be expected to stand up with the duke or look no how. Maddie would have argued further, but as she started to speak, she glanced at Jervalx. Her words faded. He stood with the letter in his hand, unfocused, his face white and set. What's wrong? she blurted. As soon as she had spoken, she wished that she'd kept silent. The others looked toward him. A shade of wariness came into his expression. He said nothing. Let me see it. Lady de Marley said, holding out her hand for the letter. He looked toward her as if he'd forgotten she was standing there. He shook his head. Let me see it. No. Nothing. He frowned. Nothing. Don't be a fool, boy, his aunt insisted. What have you there? Let me see it. He crumpled the paper in his fingers. Without answering, he threw it into the fire as he strode across the hall and out. Young fool, Lady de Marley said. Maddie turned on her. Canst thou not speak to him as if he is a man, and not a wayward child? I speak to him as I always have, miss. Why should I change now? He is changed. But the world is the same. Don't discount it. She thumped her stick on the floor. The world is always with us, and don't you discount it, Duchess. Christian stood with his back to the parapet, leaning his shoulders on cold stone, the wind whipping up through an arrow slit and blowing his hair against the back of his head. A falcon coasted over Bellatoir, rising up above the tower in a hurling curve, and then tilting into a drift down and sideways. Beyond that, the sky was empty gray. Christian stared at nothing. It had been a stupid move, of course. Those moments two nights ago had seduced him, the fleeting instance when his speech had been intact. He thought, if he just concentrated, he'd gone alone to write, and known while he was doing it that it was not quite accurate. He saw his mistakes, but when he tried to locate them exactly, they seemed to disappear, only to reappear at the corner of his eye when he looked away. When? He'd seen the sheet upside down, folding it, he'd realized how. Odd it was, all shifted to one side. But he had given it to Calvin Elder to dispatch anyway. Stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. He heard footsteps from the open stairwell. It would be Maddie. Everyone else knew he was not to be followed here. He'd half expected that she would come, half hoped it, left the doors ajar so that she could guess the way. She stepped out onto the battlement. No cloak. The wind caught her skirt and blew it around her legs, showing the stalwart shoes and white stockings. Loyal simple can't dance Maddie, who would not ridicule him. 
Who would not think she had to tell him what he realized painfully well already? Who would know, if he said he was afraid, what he had to be afraid of? He held out his hand to her. She hesitated and then took it, warm bare skin against his. He enfolded her in his arms, sheltering them both against the castle wall. She was silent. He put his forehead down to her shoulder. For a long time, he rested there, hiding. Then he said, I was. I write. Bailey. At Monmouth. Send for here, write settlements. He shuddered, the cold seeping into his bones. He held her closer to him. Bailey, fifteen years, attorney, manage the manage my affairs. Agent farm, buying land. Election county, the county, all. Everything here. Christian gazed over her to the long ridge, the shoulder of Jervalk's castle and the distant rise of mountains behind it. He doesn't come. He writes. He will not act. Christian gave a short, anguished laugh. He will not act. He turned his head, his lips against her cold ear. He held her hard because he thought he was going to weep. She stood steadily. Her hand crept up and found his, locking fingers. My right, my letter, it was bad. I think it was bad. Mistakes. Stupid. Next time, she said, I will look at thy writing first if thou wish it. A comfortable, unremarkable, maddy girl answer. She looked forward instead of back. Next time. Next time we will do better. He was responsible for her. He had to do better. Far better. He had to be perfect, so no one could doubt him. So no one could steal his life, no one could take her, no one could lay hands on him and lock him back in that place. Maddie. Hearing God. I. He broke off in frustration. The way his speech disintegrated under attention and strenuous effort terrified him more than anything. He knew that when he was judged again, he would want it so fiercely he would drive it away. Fail. Too strain. Idiot. Sometimes, she paused and then said, Sometimes, thou art capable. He groaned and tilted his head back to the wall. Why not, now? Hearing, he groaned again. Never. She lifted her arms and crossed them over his. I wish thou couldst exercise and drill, to make the easier. He could attempt it. But there was nothing that would accustom him to the pressure of unexpected demands, the ordeal of critical eyes on him. Nothing. He looked out on the empty valley and the ridges, Jervalks, that he loved, that he had known all his life, a secure and precarious refuge. He was vulnerable here, but he didn't know what else to do where to go that would be safe. She touched his hand, folding it into her cold fingers. He turned his face to her throat, kissing her, warming her with himself, burning away fear with the flame that blazed instantly between them. Lady de Marley waited in the drawing room when they came down from the tower. She stood up, leaning on her stick. I've had this from your esteemed brother-in-law, she said, brandishing a paper. Stone him. It seems that one of them grows squeamish. She held up her lorgnette, eyeing the missive. He understands that the public nature of a jury hearing would be offensive to you, she read, and degrading to the family. Ha! Degrading! Late for him to think of that. He offers you a trust in lieu of a declaration of incompetence. You're to live on the Cumberland property, with income of four. Thousand the remainder of the estate to be put into the hands of trustees. You agree to borrow nothing against it. Jervalx made a sound. He took a stride and snatched the letter from his aunt. He tore it in two strips and flung them into the grate. You did not allow me to finish, Lady de Marley said coolly. Stoneham wishes us to know that Mr. Manning in particular isn't fully convinced of the wisdom of a private trust, and prefers the clean cut. 
He desires that you be declared incompetent and put away. However painful in the short term. As I believe it was described. But Stoneham. Believes that as long as you agree to renounce your marriage to the Quaker in the ecclesiastical courts, the others can be brought round in the matter. The Duke simply stared at her, a look of cold, killing fury in his face. His aunt did not flinch. Your pride will not serve you well in this, she snapped. Think of it, Jervalx. If you go before a jury and fail, you lose it all. This is an offer. An opening for negotiation. Offer, he shouted. Hang bloody rotting offer, damn bastards. No. Make a counter, Lady de Marley said. You live here. A trust, but you want thirty thousand a year. The marriage is valid, and you require a statement signed by all your relatives that male issue in your line hold the title without prejudice. He grabbed a poker from the hearth and sent it swinging across the surface of a marquetry chest, smashing candelabra and Chinese bowls to the floor. His aunt gazed at the shattered and bent remains. I believe you are mad, she said icily. Or worse, a fool. No, offer, he uttered. He swung at a needle-pointed pole screen by the fire, snapping the gilt stave, sending the two pieces toppling on the hearth. No, trust! I will not stand here while you bring the place down. Around our heads. Lady de Marley declared. She moved toward the door. We will speak again when you can control yourself. Jervalk seemed to have forgot Maddie was there. He muttered, No, no, no! In a ferocious undertone, yanking the bell rope as the door closed on his aunt. A footman appeared. Calvin! The duke snarled. Ledger, in the study! He turned his glare on Maddie. You come, me! Books loaded the shelves floor to ceiling on every wall except the one behind the desk where a mounted slate was covered with chalked equations. But what dominated the Duke's study, standing aimed at a small hinged shutter in the window like an elegant brass lance set at the stars, was a gleaming telescope, some seven feet long, with a horse bridle hung over the wheel that guided the tripod's hinge. Jervalks threw himself into the rolling desk chair as if he knew precisely how far it would travel before he turned it, rummaging among the clutter before him. With an impatient grunt, he shed papers, notebooks, a pair of well-worn boots, and three globes, two of earth and one of the light side of the moon, to create an open space on the desk. He glanced at Maddie. Sit. You, here. Maddie had to move a stack of journals, a piece of some sort of machinery and several models of cannon brightly painted in red and black to find a place. She pulled her shawl close in the chilly room. Calvin Elder entered, carrying a fat ledger and a leather packet tied in brown ribbon. A boy has just brought this from Monmouth, your grace. It was not trusted to the post. Bailey? Yes. From Mr. Bailey, your grace. Jervalks gave the packet a caustic look and waved toward the corner of his desk. Calvin Elder set the case atop a file box there. He laid the ledger in the open space the Duke had cleared. Thick, the corners worn down to paleness, the book bore a much more ponderous look of authority than the thin household notebooks Maddie had been given to examine. Jervalks opened it at the marker. Those four simple words, he will not act, had not seemed to Maddie such fearsome news. They touched the Duke's pride, brought him face on with harsh reality, but she'd not seen more in them than that. She watched Jervalk's gaze at the ledger page Calvin Elder had marked. The steward cleared his throat. I have been most pleased to see your grace return to Jervalk's, he said. The Duke made no answer. He just looked at the book, not turning backward or forward. Calvin Elder stood with his aged gnarled hands locked together, moving his thumb back and forth over his wrist. I have queried Mr. Bailey for more money, 
and Mr. Bailey has queried London, and we were informed only that the receiver general there could not act. Jervalks did not even appear to be reading the ledger. He just seemed mesmerized by that one page of it. For want of different instruction, I've kept the castle functioning in the usual state. Calvin Elder went on in a voice that began to exhibit an old man's quaver. With wages drawn from the household funds until they were exhausted. I took the liberty of delaying payment of my own salary last quarter, your grace, in order to meet the roll. The supplies I've obtained on account. He was not looking at the duke, but over his head at the slate behind. I would just like to add that I'm delighted your grace is pleased now to overlook the situation, as it has become increasingly difficult to. Ah, I'm sorry to say rumors seem to have circulated. He cleared his throat again. It's most vexing, it's monstrous, but a number of the tradespeople have become unduly concerned. Jervalk suddenly shoved the volume toward Maddie. She leaned forward to look. The master ledger held triple columns of entries. In the abstruse system of management that appeared to govern the Duke's affairs, all income from Jervalk's, farm rents, coal revenues, ground rents, interest on loans, all passed through Calvin Elder and the attorney in Monmouth and then went to a receiver-general in London. A receiver-general who was no longer dispersing payments in return. While the castle bled money on candles, liveries, servants and hair powder, nothing was compensating for it. The place mounted debt as sums beyond imagining flowed into abeyance somewhere in London. Maddie could not conceive of why Calvin Elder had waited, with the situation in such dire straits, for Jervalks to initiate an interest in financial matters. It was clear that the steward had gotten too old for his office. But his relief was so palpable, his deference so deep, and the duke's acceptance of it so automatic. And unaccusing that it was obvious that, in both their minds, the real accountability belonged to Jervalks. But the duke hardly seemed to care for the household expense. The sums that had dazzled Matty appeared merely to annoy him. He reviewed them briefly with Calvin Elder, nodding at the information that the steward added to fill out details. No, it was not the stunning total of three thousand pounds of debt on the account of Jervalk's castle that made the duke's mouth whiten at the corners. It was the packet from Bailey. While Matty held the master ledger and Calvin Elder pointed out the unpaid charges— Jervox kept staring at the packet as if it were a viper on his desk. In a pause, he merely said in Calvin Elder's direction, More? That's all that has come in your absence, your grace. Enough. The duke shook his head and sighed. You. Go now. Calvin Elder bowed and departed, with a look as dejected as devils when the dog was shut out of a room. Open. Jervalk said to Matty, nodding toward the leather packet. She untied the packet. A stack of letters slid out, bound up in a red ribbon. She pulled it free and set them before him. Jervalk's read one, slowly. He handed it to Matty. Hor's bank, in a memorandum dated months earlier, gently regretted that circumstances required some. Communication with regard to funds, and politely requested. Same. Maddie looked up from that. The Duke held a paper. Engraved with the colorful insignia of the Sun Fire Insurance Office. Without expression, he handed that one to her, too. It was dated much more recently. In an official hand, couched among numerous compliments, effusive apologies, and more oblique references to circumstances, the directors of Sun Fire were unhappy to communicate that they found themselves obliged to go much out of their usual course and demand immediate repayment of the entire sum of forty-five thousand pound lent to the Duke. Forty-five thousand! Matty gasped. Jervolk sat still, his forehead in his hand. He didn't even look up. Matty, he said. All right. You, see, are no mistakes. The letter to Hors. Christian had finally had to give up and let Maddie copy it out for his signature, had been a straightforward instruction to forward instantly five thousand pounds from money's place to his petty account. 
to Sun Insurance and his other creditors, it had been a brisk apology. An assurance that the matter was to be taken care of directly. To Bailey it was dismissal, Kurt. Too late. Christian sat in his study with the reply from Hors. Most awkward, the letter said, certain new rules and regulations, incidental complications, unavoidable delay in complying with your grace's recent instructions. Suspicious. Shades of his mother's work in a prayer for Christian's health and a blessing on his soul from the pious messer's whore. No money. Not one shilling from a bank where he knew perfectly well he had a running balance of four times his draft. He stared at the reply until the words seemed to slide together into strange hieroglyphic madness. Christian carried, routinely, an encumbrance of six hundred thousand, and would go as high as seven for short-term bridging. The delicate framework of his enterprise and income, debt and endeavor, improvements and speculation and capital in a complex interplay of his own making, it required intense application, and a rock-solid confidence in him by the men who advanced their money with his. Like interlocking arches, like a beautiful tiered aqueduct that could stand for centuries or fall with a stroke, it all rested on one vital point. The keystone was trust, and it was gone. He ought to have known. He ought to have predicted, but he'd been living in mist that cleared at its own inconstant whim. The structure could never have stood for long without Christian's attention, but the paralysis of his agents, the letter from Stoneham, Bailey's packet full of demands like the one from Sunfire, the hedging reply from Hors, the accelerating speed of destruction. He was going down. They weren't going to wait for a hearing. They were going to kill him while he sat here hiding at Jervalk's. Christian walked through the day in silent panic, carrying the letter from Hors, reading it again and again, dreamlike, as if it would be different the next time he looked at it. Illusion. Everything around him was an illusion of safety. This castle, that painting, the Aubusson carpets, his servants. He'd known it, but he did not know what to do to defend himself. They could still send him back. They could break him down and send him back. Maddie's protests would be swept away in a moment, his aunt's promises forgotten, all mist and paper. It would take a hearing to strip him of his legal existence, aye, but it needed no more than physical coercion to chain him in the nightmare again. What was to prevent them? Whatever stopped anyone from throwing bothersome relatives into some convenient dungeon? He looked around at the walls of his castle. He could lower the gates, seal himself in, man the parapets, arm for a siege. Arm for a siege. A suit of armor stared back at him in an empty corridor. He didn't even know where he was. His maze brain kept hanging on that vision. A siege. He had to defend himself. They would seize him. What was to stop them? Jervalk's castle had never been taken in siege or battle, not by Lancaster, not by Roundheads. In the civil wars, Parliament had not even attempted to attack a garrison known to be too strong to conquer. He gazed at the suit of armor. And the answer came. He had to be too strong. He had to be the Duke again, the real Duke. Not this muddled coward run hide not man. Power was his only true protection, the power to meet force with force, name, influence, fortune, control. He had lost it. No money, no authority, no command, they could come here and take him and send him back to that place. Mist. He'd been living in mist, with the mad place waiting for him. Durham exclaimed, Good God, listen to this. Fane claims there's a story in town that you ain't been sick a tall. You're just rusticating cause you're bankrupt. With roomy sorrow, Calvin Elder in tone. The wine cellar regrets that he cannot provide spirits for the tenants' dinner this year, your grace. Aunt Vesta stared at the London paper with horror. Merciful God in heaven. Ruined or mad, what's become of his grace? She fumbled for her salts and took a deep grim breath in the papers. God spare us, that I should have lived to see this day. Maddie simply sat in the study with him, and wrote his answers to the loan demands. 
She had quit blinking at each sum that crossed his desk, but she had a new stiffness about her, a chaste sternness that nettled him. I will not act, Bailey had written blatant insult. So I will, Christian thought. London. Ruin mad idiot, try to save yourself. Back home again tomorrow, Durham said cheerfully, over a dessert course of mince pies, plum pudding, jellies and cheesecakes. The road begins to look familiar. Will you enjoy one of these cakes with me, Duchess? Maddie shook her head. She found it hard to eat when she knew that everything on the board was an unpaid obligation, right down to the cook's salary. Ever since she had learned the immense extent of Jervox's debts, she had felt ill inside. His income was grand, but his loans were beyond ordinary imagination. The number at the foot of the totaled list was fearful. Tremendous. Fantastical. It made her, a Quaker bred to devout thrift and prudence, almost afraid of him, of the reckless arrogance that could accrue such a burden with no thought for the outcome. She loved him, lay down with him, bared herself to his carnal touch, and yet she found suddenly that she did not know him at all. She could not sup on such extravagance in the circumstances, not even for one meal. Instead of the cake, she took an apple that she knew had come direct from the home. Orchard, foregoing the cheese. The duke, far down the shining table, said, Tomorrow. Go I and Maddie. Belgrave Square. She paused in cutting her fruit. To London? Lady de Marley demanded. And what is the meaning of this mad start? The duke's wine glass sparkled as he turned it in his fingers. I please. His aunt took her fork to her mince pie, mashing it into tiny bits as if it were an enemy. I wash my hands of you, boy. Leave me. Put yourself in their clutches. You'd do better to take Stoneham's trust and be done with it. Jervalx did not answer her. He kept his eyes on Maddie. Tomorrow, he said. Prepare in, we depart morning. She put down her knife and fork. I don't think that will be possible for me. He lifted his eyebrows. I require it. The dinner table, Maddie felt, was not the place for discussion of the matter. She lifted slices of fruit onto her father's plate at her left hand. There, Papa, that is a perfect apple. Wouldst thou have cheese with it? In the Duke's bedchamber, Maddie discovered that someone had already been put to work packing. An open trunk in the dressing room held shirts and coats, and her gray silk, pressed and freshened as well as it could be. She took the dress out and returned it to the wardrobe. As she closed the wardrobe door, Jervox came into her. Maddie unbuttoned his waistcoat as she always did and stepped back. He looked down at her a moment from beneath his black lashes. Hungry? he asked, in a mocking tone. No, she said, not quite a lie yet. Bread. Water. Apple, he said it bitterly, as if it were an accusation. I eat what seems good and proper to me to eat, she answered, turning away. He appeared to have no idea of retrenchment and not the slightest desire to attempt it. She had ventured to mention a number of savings that might be made at the castle alone, suggestions that had been met with impatient dismissal. Certainly a reduction of staff, even a sale of the contents, would not make much impression on the colossal total of his obligations, but he did not even wish to make a start. It alarmed and offended her, this manner of going on in luxury and magnificence, when any right-minded person must know that every feeling and effort ought to be strained toward redeeming such an unconscionable folly. He shrugged out of his coat. He almost laid it over the open lid of the trunk, then stopped. He looked up at her. Dress? I shan't leave here tomorrow, she said. Papa will not be ready to travel again so soon. You come with me. Father later. Papa cannot damn Papa. He tossed the coat and stalked out into the bedchamber. You, me. Maddie closed her eyes. She searched for intercom. 
denying the hurt. When she had some command over her feelings, she followed him into the bedchamber. He sat at his desk, in shirt sleeves and stockings, gazing at the outside of a folded letter. The lamp lit his face in strong glare and shadow, made his hair and brows black as Satan's. We go. We are. Duke and Duchess of Jervalx. We attend. Theater. Dance. You have dresses, rich. Even. I think a ball, we hold, entertainment. Spend money. Nothing is wrong. Maddie listened to him with a sliding heart. No. Thou art not. Thou canst not. Must, he said. Go to London. Go and see that thy agent pays the arrears, that is right and proper, to pay, and redeem what can be redeemed, and then live circumspectly whilst thou strivest to repair thy fortune. He turned abruptly in the chair, confronting her. Not. Redeem. Repair, not fortune. Repair reputation, do you understand? Confidence. Live, vast. Show. Am confident. To what end? She exclaimed. When thy affairs are in this terrific state? A proper reduction of thy expense, a sincere effort to diminish thy debt, that is what will inspire their confidence, perhaps even win the real respect. No! He leaned his head back and groaned. No, no, no! Stupid, worst, to pay off, look like. Trouble, silly simple, they thou. You don't understand. She turned and marched back into the dressing room. I understand that thou art full of deceit, she exclaimed, unhooking her dress with an effort. I understand that thou wouldst bear false witness in appearances, that thou hast learned nothing from thy travail. And what wilt thou do with? This false confidence if thou canst secure it? Run thyself into more debt? Yes, he said. Maddie came to the door. She was so full of words that they tumbled together and none came out but the ones that would sting the most. Thou ought to do as Lady de Marley says, then, and sign a trust, and let better men try to mend thy folly. His eyes narrowed. With a menacing grace he rose from the chair and stood facing her. Not better man. I am. Jervalks. His gaze raked her, and she realized with horror that she had not even covered herself. She crossed her arms quickly. He made a sound at that, a harsh breath and a contemptuous smile. Sweeping up the satin dressing robe that lay waiting for him on the bed, he shrugged it on. He took up the decanter and glass. With a bow, lazy and cold, he departed. Chapter 27 I should not be here, Maddie said, fretting already when they had just arrived, wandering the blue salon in Belgrave Square as the faint pops and crackles of early Guy Fawkes celebrations sounded beyond the shrouding curtain. I shouldn't have left Papa again. Christian made no answer, continuing to sort painstakingly through the stack of unopened mail that had accumulated at his town house. At the top were demands most new, some duplicates of the ones he'd got at Jervalk's, then a series of solicitous inquiries after his health, sifting down to normal correspondence and invitations six months old. Perhaps thou dost not truly need me here? she asked. Perhaps, now that thou art settled, I could return? No, he said. Her talking to him made him lose his concentration. He had to pause and think to recall whose letter he held in his hand and in which pile he should place it on the sofa table. Durham can help thee in these matters, surely. Better than. I. Christian turned his head, scowling at the letter. Stafford. Stafford, yes, a decorous wish for Jervalk's speedy recovery, no hint of the fifteen thousand pound mortgage the Marquis held on the Gloucester property. A gentleman, but he went into the last pile, the ones who could be safely ignored. I really will be of no use to thee. I cannot dance, nor make idle conversation. Converse idle, now, Christian said without looking up. Durham could write for thee. 
He tossed down the letter he'd picked up. She made it harder, talking, wanting to go, when it was hard enough already. You stay. I ought not to have left my papa. He hit his hand against his chest. Husband! Thou art not reasonable. Not! She angered him. What was more reasonable than that he expected her support when he needed it? All these letters and words, all at once, it gave him a headache. She sat down in a chair across from him, her face shadowed beneath the sugar scoop bonnet she'd taken to wearing again. Thou ought to listen to me. He glared at the stacks of letters. He knew she was unhappy with him. He knew that he could have come to town with Durham and left her to follow with her father at a pace that the older man could tolerate. But Christian had insisted she accompany him. He'd had a foreboding that was becoming a full-fledged suspicion now, that somehow if he hadn't, her arrival would have been delayed, put off and impeded by nebulous complications that he could not even name. He had sensed her resistance from the moment he'd said London. It had increased with every mile closer to town. You, listen! Must be Duke. Show all, all well. Disaster, Maddie! This! He waved his hand over the letters. Edge, the edge of a cliff. Fall everything. I understand that, she said. I understand full well that thou hast borrowed beyond all sanity. She kept herself upright, with no emotion in her voice. He heard the disapproval in it, nevertheless, and it infuriated him. Understand, nothing. He though she would, she who'd been with him and knew what he faced if he lost, but all she did was preach of economy and dismiss footmen, until he saw that she did not comprehend at all. The rules of temporal power seemed impossible for her to grasp. He could not seem to explain it. He could not convey to her the enormity of what tottered, the number of men whose own fortune stood at risk with his, who would turn on him, if he was not the duke, if he let them see weakness, who would be upon him like wolves on a deer that had stumbled. They were on him already, these polite letters, the growing pressure of the demands. He should pay them, she said. With what? Sell these paintings, she said. Not enough. Sell this house. Not enough, she frustrated him in her obtuse morality. Even if he did sell up, wasn't it obvious that suddenly advertising to the world that everything he owned was on the market must create a crisis? That the value of his property would plummet? Sell Jervalk's castle, she said, and that was enough and more, but the idea was so alien it was meaningless to him. It was entailed. He'd informed her stiffly on his heir. And then she had called him a wicked selfish man who had run his own son into debt before any son was ever born. He could not put concepts such as equity and leverage, floating debt and frozen assets into words. Mostly he found that he could not tell her the truth she seemed mercifully blind to, that he would drag her down with him if he failed. She believed that she protected him. His wife, next of kin, Durham had put that notion in her head, and pure simple honest Maddie, she trusted to such flimsy things as law and order. Understand nothing. He took a deep controlling breath. Maddie, when I came of age, debt, my father, two hundred thousand estate, every shilling encumbered. He set his teeth together. Today. Value two million, income, a hundred thousand clear and a dead now that must make thy poor father turn in his grave. Loans, yes, he said furiously. Risk. I am Duke of Jervalks. They all know. Not a bloody widow woman. But he looked at the letters and despaired. He couldn't even read the claims on him at more than a snail's pace. He needed help and would have cut his throat before he asked her for it now. You, here, he insisted, reduced to that. Tim's. Come later. I should prefer at least to return so that I might. Accompany him. No. She would not come back if he let her go. 
he felt it in his bones. It is only for a very short while, until I can bring Papa with me. No. I'm sorry that thou wilt not approve, but I must. No. He took a step toward her. I will leave tomorrow. He stood across the room. I say, command. He stood over her. High color flamed in her cheeks. She did not look up at him but straight ahead, half hidden by the bonnet. I am not at thy command. Yes. Husband vow. You obey to me. I made no such vow. Her voice held dead calm defiance. I am not obliged to conform to thine every whim. Thou dost not remember what I said. Still she didn't look up into his face. I doubt thou even listened. Christian had a sudden sense of having tread into uneasy ground. I remember. He set his jaw. Charge. God, to love. Husband. Wife. Helps meet, she said, with no rule but love between us. Help me then, Maddie. I'm afraid. But he turned away from asking it. Having committed himself to a command, he wasn't going to change it to a plea. The stacks of letters waited, words and words, to vanish and flicker in his head. The vile belittling frustration of it, the slow agony of such an everyday art, with so much writing on it. I should never have said anything. She spoke again. I should never have stood before a false priest to wed thee at all. Her tone was remote and brittle. I cannot join in such misguided conduct. It is vain and profitless, this foolish profane course of thine. A sudden and consuming rage overwhelmed him. He would not bear it. He couldn't sit here while Miss Puritan looked down her nose at his bank balance. He hadn't touched her for a week, not since she'd got so thee thou self-righteous. He wanted to kiss her until she ached and panted and forgot her bloody spotless sanctimony and became what they both knew she was with him. But he looked at her, only looked at her, and she lifted her chin and stiffened herself. He swept all the mail from the table, tossing it back in the silver basket, heedless of his careful sorting. He left it and walked past his wife. Just beyond her he paused. He went back to her, yanked at her bonnet strings and stripped the thing from her head. Go then, he sneered. Go. So I will, she exclaimed, snatching at her headpiece. He cast the bonnet into the fire, walked out and slammed the door behind him. If there was anything in the world that he hated, it was pious women. Maddie jumped up from the chair, snatching the bonnet back from the flames, beating it against the marble hearth. Oh, thou! she cried between her teeth. He was profligate, arrogant, impossible. She didn't want to be here. She couldn't do what he demanded of her. Dances, theaters, he told her what he planned, and she could not do it, but he wouldn't listen. So much money, she did not know how he could have slept at night. She didn't know him. They were too incongruous. Why did he look at her in that way, promising and threatening at once? and then stay all night in a chair in the drawing room. Why was he not a sober, prudent, right-walking man who would be humble, who would accept what God had made of him? But no, he chose to reign in hell, like Satan in the poem, and told her she must stand beside him, wife and duchess, defying what his world might think. Part of her said that she ought to stay. She well knew that he needed someone by him. He could not fare long alone the concern laid upon by her opening seemed yet to hold. But she ought to go. She felt the mortal danger to herself, her love and her hunger for him that distorted truth, this ruinous attachment to a worldly and carnal man. She was all a tangle, torn between escaping and remaining, unable to perceive the light amid her willful, creaturely passions. If only she could find stillness, be composed in the calm silence of the soul, but she could not. The echo of stridency disordered her, the assertive rush of his presence, gone now, leaving the room emptier than even silence alone could make it. She wanted to go to meeting. 
she had not been for weeks. She wished to be still, to listen, but even in that thought was a new and terrible discovery. She was afraid to go now, Duchess, wife to a child of the world. She was ashamed to be looked upon by other friends, having strayed so far out of the light. The bonnet was beyond saving. She made a little sound of sorrow as she examined the scorched brim. Fiendish man. She would go back to Papa. Durham could come and stay with the Duke. A firework popped just outside, making her startle. With a hopeless moan, she tossed the bonnet back into the fire. The flames took it, surging up, swallowing the pristine white in a yellow and red and black conflagration. Vauxhall was cold and damp. Out of season, the minor walks of the pleasure garden were unlit. Only the main pavilion was specially opened, illuminated for a concert and pyrotechnics in honor of Guy Fawkes' night. Christian stood in shadow, not mingling with the crowd in the grand walk. He wasn't ready to be seen by anyone he knew, though on a wet autumn night such. As this, not many in society appeared to have spent their three. Shillings for admission to view two thousand lamps and patriotic colors, exhibition of fireworks, discharge of cannon and magnificent bonfire. Well enough. If he must make himself a fool, he preferred to do it before strangers. He let the flow of people carry him. Near a food pavilion he hung back in the dark, leaning on a tree and considering trying some gunpowder toffee. As he felt for coins, a flirtatious hand caught at the fold of his cloak. Per Chevalier, the lady said, veiled and almost invisible in black. Pray treat me to a hot cider, dear, and let's have a little cose. It was a cultured voice, low and husky, the familiarity of the approach unmistakably demimond. Christian looked down at her over his shoulder, not straightening from the tree. The white hand she removed from her sable muff still rested on his arm. She tilted her head, nothing but a pale chin beneath the fashionable hat and heavy veil. He had a notion she was smiling under there. He smiled back, ironically, and shook his head. Oh, you don't look for a lady? She suddenly contrived a rather transparent French accent. You, a gentleman do Myla rang? A duke, at least, and you cannot spare a poor girl a little glass of cider? Christian's muscles contracted with alarm. He looked at her more sharply. She took a step back, lifted her skirts, and did a slow twirl. As if inviting him to examine her, she faced him with a deep curtsy. Still you do not know, Christian? She asked, proffering a trim ankle. He turned and started to walk away. He didn't know who, and didn't care. He didn't know what else to do. She hurried alongside. Christian! She caught him, tossing back her veil. For goodness sake! It's me! He stopped. Eighty. Her name escaped him, one of those words that was there, with no effort, and he wished he had kept on walking. She put her arm through his and leaned on him. As he stood paralyzed, she rubbed her face on his sleeve. Oh, Christian, Christian! It's so good to see you! Her voice had a sudden break in it. She clung to him. What, you? He couldn't manage more. Don't scold, she said. I just had to come out. I couldn't bear it. I brought my Abigail. She's behind us, there, do you see? I know I oughtn't to be out, but another eight months of mourning, pity me, Christian. It's so wonderful to see your face. She turned and began to walk, holding his arm. You can't imagine what it's been like. Leslie exiled me. That very morning he discovered, I hadn't one instant to contact you. Oh, he was hateful. He frightened me. And Scotland. That horrid gloomy barn of his family's, all the summer and fall. I couldn't. Even right, I missed you so. They said I must have rest after. Such a shock. They thought it was Leslie dying of his stupid influenza. But it was you I wanted. 
It was you I wept for all those dreadful months. No one would say a thing about you, not at the funeral, not after, nothing, all the vicious old biddies, they wanted me to think you had forgotten me. I've just got into town, that's why you couldn't find me, I was locked up like a prisoner, until. She stopped abruptly, looking down at his arm, fingering the scarlet lining of his cloak. Christian, you have a little daughter. He stood still. I told them, she said defiantly. I had to tell them, or they would never have let me out of that place. I told them she wasn't Leslie's, and you should have marked their faces. They let me go then. Christian stared down at her. Fool! he exclaimed. You, she has your eyes, and hair black as coal. She looks nothing like Leslie. Or me, for that matter. Christian took her by both shoulders and gave her a shove. Self, selfish, bitch. Told? What of? Child? I brought her back with me. She cringed away. Christian, you hurt me. He let go, not without another push. Stupid. She, she's his, in the law, wedlock. He groaned, turning from her. Leslie Sutherland was dead? And Christian had a bastard daughter, labeled and doomed in another man's family. He felt dazed, unable to command his muscles, like moving in deep cold water. Please don't be so angry. She stroked his sleeve with small petting movements. Please. You, Christian, she is yours and mine. I thought. Her voice trailed off, and she kneaded and pinched at his coat wordlessly. It suddenly struck him what she'd thought. His heart began. To pound. God. Of course. Eighty, he said. Eighty, she leaned against him like a child, her cheek to his chest. Christian. I love you so. I'm. He had to make a great effort. Married. She looked up. Her face was rounder now with wide, half-wild eyes, a shocked question. He nodded in answer. She pushed back to arm's length, growing white. That's not true. Yes. Even that word was a battle. No. No. You're lying. I haven't seen the papers for months, but I would have heard. I would have heard that. He looked at her steadily. When? Tell me when. He didn't even try. Speech was beyond him. It is not true. She pushed him. You thought of this when Leslie died. You could have come then, but oh. You blaggard. This is a lie to put me off. He shook his head. It is. Look at you. Who is she? He breathed faster, trying to gather words. Look at you. You can't even think of a name. It is a lie. He shook his head again. She took hold of his cloak by both sides. Christian, you can't be so cruel. You love me. I love you. Married, he said. I gave you everything. I never denied you anything. Christian, they have put me out, me and the child. As well as put me out. My odious jointure. I'm living on a pittance. I love you, Christian. Think, he said, disengaging himself. Let think. Oh, yes. She seemed to hear the desperation in her own voice. She straightened, gazing at him. Yes, I, I'm sorry. I've, it's only that I've missed you so. And you know, she began to stroke his sleeve again. Your family was always in favor, your sister Clementia, even your terrible old aunt. She made a teary half-laugh and leaned against him. Oh, why did I ever marry Leslie? Christian knew exactly why. It was because he never offered for her himself and within the scope of polite conduct had made it abundantly clear that he wouldn't, even when they dangled and pushed her on him, as they'd always dangled and pushed the best bread raining bell on him every season. Go home. Christian took her by the elbow and faced her. 
back toward her maid. I'll think. She clung to him, then suddenly reached up on tiptoe and pressed a passionate kiss against his mouth. No, he said, setting her away, knowing where she wanted that to lead. He took her bodily to the servant, dropping a half-crown in the maid's hand. Home, now. Yes, sir. The Abigail took her mistress by the arm, familiar with Christian's generosity. When will you call? Adie demanded. He stood looking at her. Then he turned and walked away into the darkest part of the garden. Christian sat down on a bench well out of the light. A chilly drizzle weighed his cloak down on his shoulders. Think, he'd said, but the shock was still on him. A daughter. It seemed that his whole life was upside down and under threat. He had money, but he could not control it. He had a duchess who thought she shouldn't have married him and an ex-mistress who thought she should. He had a daughter, and she carried another man's name. He had no doubt the child was his. Sutherland had been out of the country. Christian had been amorous and careless, betting a willing woman at whim and convenience. God, had that man been himself? So reckless. Not unheeding of. Consequences, no, not quite that just cavalier certain that he could deal with any of them. Now here he was in the ugly midst of one, and he was helpless. If things had gone as he'd expected when he first realized Adie's condition, she would have slept with her husband and lied, Christian would have kept his distance, and the paternity of the child would have gone unquestioned. Even if Sutherland had suspected, it wasn't the most unusual of situations. People might guess, they might even be certain, but it would be tactless in the extreme to throw doubt publicly on the parentage of a child born to a legal union. Damn eighty. She shouldn't have declared it to Sutherland's family. If she'd just kept quiet, they'd have accepted the baby as. Her husband's probably treasured it under the circumstances. Now, it didn't bode well that they'd sent both mother and child away from the family seat. Eighty was no maternal angel. She already had two sons who never left Scotland. She hadn't even mentioned seeing them while she was there. Likely as not, as soon as she realized Christian wasn't going to marry her, the baby would be packed off to Scotland to be raised as a pariah. And there wasn't a damned thing Christian could do about it. He couldn't recognize the child as his. That would be criminal cruelty. She'd be a pariah in truth then, socially as well as privately. He couldn't even contribute secretly to her welfare, at least not now, when he couldn't even convince his bank to honor a draft. And if they got him, if they sent him back, powerless, the mad place. He rested his face down in his hands. The fireworks began, cracks and booms and cheers at a distance. A cold drop fell from his hat brim onto the back of his neck, but he sat without moving. He actually said a prayer. It was short and to the point. Help me. I can't do this alone anymore. Amen. Maddie sat in a chair in the marbled entry hall. She had intended to wait only until he returned and then go. But she was still dressed to travel, still squeezing her hands together, still listening to the mob and confusion that had reigned all night outside. It was after three in the morning. Please, she prayed. Please, Lord, let him be safe. Please, Lord, let him find his way. Please, Lord, if I dis thy will let him come home. Durham was gone out looking in the places he thought Jervalks might go. They had no servants but two footmen brought from Jervalks castle, and Maddie had sent them both out to look, too. She would have gone herself, but Durham had insisted that she stay off the streets, and she had no idea where to search anyway amid the crowds where squibs and bonfires and flaming Guy Fox effigies lit the night. The noise and fireworks slowly died down, the roar receding to distant pops and shouts. The streets emptied, and still he did not come. Maddie tensed at every sound of a carriage, but none stopped. She bent over her lap and kept praying. When the front lock fell with a loud click, her head snapped up. He came in softly. As he lifted his eyes, she saw that he had not expected anyone to be there. 
Thou art all right? She asked. Her voice came out wrong. A little squeaky. Maddie girl, he said. His cloak and hat glistened with mist. He was beautiful, tall and dark, his blue eyes with that faint perplexity as if he could not quite understand what she was doing there. She stood up. Thou wilt be hungry. I have a plate warm downstairs. I can bring it up to thee, or if thou dost not mind, thou couldst eat it in the kitchen. He hesitated, and then laid his hat on the hall table. He dropped his cloak there, too. It slid to the floor. Maddie went and picked it up, shaking out the damp folds. He touched her as she rose, his fingers closing on her arm. Maddie girl, he said quietly. She bit her lip. She had worried so long and hard that it was difficult to hold back tears, foolish as they were. A very small hiccuping sob escaped her. He took her in his arms and pressed her hard against him. I'm sorry, she mumbled. I could not leave thee. I could not. His arms tightened. I was so afraid, she said into the damp lapel of his coat. He enfolded her, his cheek against her hair. Don't. Deserve thee. Maddie. Ask God. Aye, but I don't deserve thee. Chapter 28 He let her go back for her father. He insisted. He did not tell her what it cost him, the dread that he had to conquer, left alone within easy reach of his enemies. He kissed her hard and then held on to her shoulders too long. She looked up at him with a fresh concern, and he found the measure of his courage in the effort it took to form a cocky smile so that she would not stay. He sent her with both footmen in the private carriage they brought from Jervalk's. It left Christian in Belgrave Square, in a closed house utterly empty except for himself. An odd sensation, not unpleasant in itself, with food in the kitchen that Maddie had seen to, cold meats and bread, and chocolate over a fire of his own making. Durham had offered to stay, bringing his valet, but Christian was determined to test his limits. If he could not manage a week of looking after himself, in his own familiar house, then he hadn't much hope of reassuming his greater affairs. After she left, he kept a coal fire going in the back parlor. Sipping chocolate and listening to early activity in the mews beyond the garden wall. No one came to his door. He not notified his family. Not yet, not until he had thought it through. And now there was eighty, another complication. Amazingly, she made no comment on his affliction. Except to accuse him of lying to her she hadn't even appeared to notice any peculiarity in his speech. Talk too much, he thought dryly. So she loved him, did she? He disliked it when women said that to him. Didn't believe it either, a lesson he'd learned at seventeen, the hard way. He remembered Maddie, sitting white-faced and sober in the cold marble hall, waiting for him in the hours before dawn. He would not let her down. He didn't want to make mistakes. He was slow and methodical on that account, but he had put together a plan. He dressed to go out, getting it all right but the neck cloth, making an impossible disarray trying to tie a cravat. He had to settle instead for a black stock that he could buckle by feel and slide around to the back. In the mirror, he looked almost whole. If he focused, he could find all of himself, not all at once, quite, but part by part, right hand, right arm, only a little peculiar not precisely the way he thought he ought to look. He opened and shut his palm in the white glove. The glove in the mirror opened and closed concurrently. Behind him in the mirror was his desk. Set to one side. Under a few papers was a neat closed wooden box, a writing machine that the engineer Mark Brunei had given him for making simultaneous copies while transcribing letters and drawings. Christian had not used it often. It was a clever feat of mechanics. He admired it for that, and kept it available. But his own handwriting was so illegible that there was little use in reproducing it when he had a secretary to copy out for him far more admirably. But he had no secretary now. And hideous as his writing had become, he had to attempt it. 
The machine would save him double the labor, at any rate. He sat down and opened the instrument. It required a little setting up. He remembered how to do that. Such a lovely small device, perfectly engineered. Brunei and his son were magnificent. Christian had used their floating docks and tunneling shield, and held a considerable interest in their Rutherhithe tunnel under the Thames, a hellborn high flyer of a scheme that looked to lose thousands for Christian before it began to turn around, if ever, the kind of project that he tried and failed to explain to Maddie, that his brothers-in-law hated, that drove his debt and income balance, that could not be allowed to collapse for lack of fresh capital, yes, borrowed, in all likelihood, nor just paid off by letting go a few footmen. With a renewed determination, he slid papers into place beneath the double pens. He made some circles and scribbles to test the instrument, then wrote God bless the king. He read it. God bless the king. All there and correct. He looked up at the second pen's copy. In letters pushed to one side of the full page, it said God bless O king. At first he thought it was a malfunction in the machine, but when he looked back down at what he had written, he swore softly to himself. His original was the same. If he looked with care he could see the identical shape and squeezed proportion to. The letters, even though it still seemed correct if he only glanced at it. He leaned over the instrument and wrote it again, this time. Keeping his eyes on the other pen instead of the one he held. Guy F. A., he caught himself beginning to write A U instead of A W, and drew the letter correctly. Cautiously, painfully, he went on, stopping himself in the midst of misspellings and even completely anomalous words Guy Fox time instead of night. It was rather terrifying, as if some phantom guided his hand, while he could only compare what it produced with his real intentions by watching what the copying pen wrote. But it seemed to work if he could trust what he read on the copy, correcting errors before they happened or at least able to recognize them when they did. He spent five hours at it. When he was done, he had two sheets, identical, both with margins centered evenly when he examined them upside down. Gentlemen, they read, this is to inform you that I have made a settlement upon my wife, Archimedia Tims Langland, Duchess of Jervalks, effective immediately, of the entire sum of Midisposable estate and possessions to be held by her and hers. Forever, with no sympathy or consent for any other claims by any other person upon it. This settlement shall go forward unless I should be shown satisfactory proof that no question, now or in the future, shall be made concerning my competence or ability to conduct my affairs according to my sole and unhampered judgment. Given proof of such, acceptable to me, I might possibly be disposed to revise the above arrangement. Christian, Duke of Jervalks, he thought that was what it said, anyway. He hoped it was good enough. It had to be. Make them worry, make them stop and think and wonder if he was quite so helpless as he seemed to be. The clerk in Torben's office had never seen Christian. While he wasn't especially lofty about going into the city, normally his business came to him, rather than the other way round and arrived with scrapings and hustlings of no minor order. This pup merely looked up at Christian from his copying and said, Good morning. Have you an appointment, sir? Christian took off his hat and cloak and tossed them on the desk, right across the poor devil's papers where condensed mist dripped off the capes onto the fresh copy. As the youngster sputtered, Christian flipped his card onto the pile and walked. Past. He went up the stairs. An instant later the clerk made a sharp exclamation and came pounding behind. He caught up with Christian at the landing, bowing and panting apologies. Then the youth went up the second flight half backwards, still trying to bow, missed the third step, sprawled and picked himself up and bowed again. Christian really felt rather sorry for him. He saved his true satisfaction for the look on Torben's face, and it was no disappointment. The Duke of Jervalks, the clerk announced, opening the door. His Grace, he added belatedly, bright red. Christian paused in the doorway, playing it to the hilt. 
The land agent who acted as his receiver general was caught in the midst of dictation, his chair slung back on two legs, his hands locked across his waistcoat, white-haired and pugnacious, a bulldog barking his directions to the manager of some far-off estate. He did not close his mouth. For a prolonged moment, Torben, Clerks and Christian held a motionless tableau. Christian moved first to keep his advantage. He'd been practicing a single three-word sentence, repeating it over and over all the way to Blackfriars. Make outlays, he commanded. He didn't succeed with all three words, but Torben's expression changed from shock to comprehension. He rose from his chair. Pray sit down, your grace. Christian didn't move. Now. The checks. Bring the duke's box. This is the number. Torben pulled a scrap of paper toward him and scribbled quickly. He handed it to one of the clerks. The boy slipped out behind Christian. You understand, your grace, that my hands have been tied without a power of attorney. Christian had never allowed payments to be made out of this office without his own signature, an old cautious habit learned from his father's mistakes. Legally, Torben had not had the power to disperse funds, though Christian didn't doubt that. The agent was an old bird wise enough to have reckoned a way to hold things together if he'd had the disposition to try. I'm delighted to see you recovered, Torben said, when Christian remained silent. Mr. Manning had given me cause to be greatly concerned. Outside, some porter whistled sharply. Christian walked to the window, looking down into the traffic. No concern, he said. From just below, the boy who must have answered the whistle took off running across the street, stuffing a message into his coat as he went. A moment after, the clerk's feet sounded on the stairs. The youth entered the office and set a large blue box on Torben's desk, a carton that usually came to Belgrave Square once a month for this little ritual of check signing. The agent opened it and began removing books. I'm afraid you've caught us flat. We'll have to write out the checks. It will take a little while. Would your grace care to step into the parlor with me? For a cup of coffee in the meantime? No. Christian didn't want to spend any longer in conversation than he had to do. Damn. He had not thought of this. The checks and counterfills had always been prepared before, ready for his signature. Very well. Torben set a chair. If you would be pleased to sit here. No, Christian said. I must go. He felt his command of his tongue slipping. I other business. If your grace will honor us with a few minutes of your time. Later. Christian began to move toward the door. Not long. Really, not long at all. I'll put both boys on it. Just a quarter hour. Something in Torben's anxiety penetrated Christian's awareness. He thought of the whistle and the messenger boy. He stopped. Damn you! He snarled. He swung back to Torben. Sent for them. Now, just a moment, your grace, indeed, I think you ought to consider— as Christian pitched books into the box, the agent tried to prevent him. Christian froze with Torben's hand on his wrist. He raised his eyes. Do you dare? He asked, deadly quiet. Torben let go. Christian cast the book in. He had not meant to move so soon, before he was ready, but he pulled the statement he'd written from his coat pocket and laid it on Torben's desk. Convey to Mr. Manning. He covered the blue box and picked it up, escaping, striding. Steadily, holding himself back from breaking into a run. He was committed now. He could not flinch. He walked into Jervalk's house without notice, gambling that Torben's messenger had gone to one of his brothers-in-law and not here. It was his mother's at-home day. Well enough, guests would keep her a little in hand. Her butler met him coming down the stairs. Calvin, Christian demanded. The man turned utterly white. Christian reached out and grabbed his arm before he could retreat. Tell where? 
with her grace, but Christian paid him no more attention, taking the steps two at a time. He rounded the upper banister and strode into the drawing room. Ladies sat in conversation, stiff as if they still had backboards strapped to them, their hats all feathered and flowered. He walked toward his mother. She was talking. It was the silence that he carried with him across the room that caught her notice. As her companion fell mute along with the others, she looked up at him and swooned. It was a real one, too. Ladies gave little shrieks. Christian caught her as she slumped forward in her chair. He held her back from falling out of it, looking over her at Calvin, who had been gathering cups on a tray at the back of the room. The faint lasted only an instant. As soon as she drooped, she began to move weakly. Between him and Calvin, they helped her upright. She clutched at Christian's arm, blinking up at him feebly. I'm Belgrave Square, he said. He pulled free, and while his mother made incoherent whispers of entreaty, gave Calvin a long look. Come? Certainly, your grace. He was still supporting the dowager duchess. I will be there directly. I need staff, Christian said. I'll see to it, your grace. Christian gave his mother a deep bow, nodded politely at the shocked circle of feminine faces, and got himself out of there. They arrived at Belgrave Square too soon, Manning. Stoneham, to Gate and Perceval, with an attorney and Torben along for good measure. Their force of six made Christian talk with alarm but he had a remedy for that, loaded and primed in his pocket, to even the odds. Calvin had not come yet. Christian saw them from the window of the blue salon. Alone, he waited there, listening to them pound on the door. His lips drew back in contempt as he heard them force it and start to search. Spurious hospitality was not within his ability, nor his mood. It was Manning who came to the salon, with Stoneham close behind. Christian merely stood watching them, lifting his eyebrows in a show of disinterested amusement at their expressions when they found him there. Stoneham went squealing for the rest. Christian did nothing as they came in and Manning closed the door. He left the first move to them. It was somewhat anticlimactic. Stoneham, foppish and nervous, kept fiddling at his excessive sideburns. You gave your poor mother a sad start. Christian leaned against the mantel. Poor mother, he said dryly. A silence fell. Are you alone here? Manning demanded. Where is the woman? Duchess, do you mean? Manning stalked to a chair, a large and florid man with a look of the squire and the hunt about him. You don't mind if we sit? Christian let his mouth curl a little. Can I stop? Manning waved the others down. The attorney, a mister. Bacon laid a rolled sheaf of papers on the sofa table. Mr. Torben says that you took the checks and estate books, Manning said. I don't think that was wise, Jervalx. Christian remained standing, his arms folded. We're asking you to return them. Christian allowed his bitter smile to grow. Bastard. Manning took a breath. He leaned forward in his chair. We're trying to do what's best for you. Christian let that hang in the air. Damn it, we're trying to save what can be saved. But you and your aunt make it bloody difficult. He sat back. This settlement you claim you've made, you don't really think a court in this country would uphold it? Christian inclined his head. You find out. You must face it, Jervalx. Everything you do now, everything since, since your wit failed, is in question. Including this mockery of a marriage. Do you understand that? I don't think you do. You seem, your aunt spoke of lucidity, but lucid intervals will not suffice to administer the estate in a proper manner. When the hearing goes forward as it ought to have done a month since, the testimony will cover the whole period. If... Christian smiled. If. Manning's voice rose. No if. The hearing goes forward. But Manning. Stoneham reached out a hand. 
Perhaps, if I might speak, the attorney said in a conciliatory tone, I've brought Mr. Percival's and Lord Stoneham's proposal for a private trust, Your Grace. I would be pleased to do myself the honor of reviewing it with you. Christian held out his hand. The attorney jumped up and untied the set of papers, giving them over to him. The first page is only preliminaries and courtesies, Mr. Bacon said. So if Christian pulled off the first page and dropped it into the fire. That is, the man looked nonplussed. If you will turn your attention to the second, you will. Christian fed the second page to the fire. He held up the third, smiling a question at the attorney. For God's sake, he's an imbecile. Manning stood up. You can't expect rational understanding. He moved as if to snatch the remaining papers away. Christian dropped the whole bundle into the grate. It curled and blackened, and with a puff exploded into yellow flame. No, trust, he said. This is futile, Manning snapped. He reached for Christian. Stone him. Hold him. It was what Christian feared, half expected, and yet when it came it seemed unreal. Manning made a wild grab. Christian jerked back and drew the pistol. Stoneham, who made no more than a timid advance, stopped in his tracks Torben had been more aggressive. He was frozen a close foot away, with the attorney sheltering behind him. Christian meant to order them out, but his blood was pounding in his ears. He could not command a word. They wanted him. They would take him if they could do it. He felt how close it was, how he would wake up in the jacket with the ape and the garrote and madness. Careful, Torben said. Careful, Mr. Manning. Manning slowly dropped his hand. He's gone mad, Stoneham whispered. Christian gave an enraged laugh. Bumble, amateurs. The ape would have had him, twice over. He felt sickness and fury in his throat. Lay it down, Manning said with a little move of his head. Lay it down on the mantle, Jervalx. It will only make things worse. Get out, Christian said. We're here to help, Manning answered, with a coaxing reason that put him in more mortal danger than he knew. Out, Christian growled. Put down the gun, Manning urged. Christian saw that his brother-in-law was going to force it. Manning either had no idea of what a real man-man could do or was counting on quite enough lucidity for Christian to see the obvious, that he couldn't commit murder in his own salon and get off as a reasonable man. Put it down, Manning said. You aren't going to shoot anyone. Christian knew he should have waited. He should have had Durham. He shouldn't have let them corner him alone. His brother-in-law had reason on his side of a bluff. Christian had the madhouse, had losing his money and Maddie and his mind in that place. He'd rather hang. He leveled the gun, an unrifled, short-barreled wickedness that didn't need much aim to take down the nearest man and more. As his lips drew back, Manning seemed to comprehend. He suddenly lost all his color. Don't. It wasn't Manning. It was Maddie's voice, clear and high, a shock like a reveille trumpet in the frozen silence. She stood in the doorway, stern plain propriety and sense in her gray gown, with Calvin and three footmen ranged behind her. Christian exhaled a long, soundless breath of deliverance. He smiled slowly at his brothers-in-law. Maddie stood back and lifted her hand. Ye men will leave. Now. The Duke wishes ye promptly gone from the premises. Chapter 29 he sat in a chair, unloading the pistol, working with slow care, his head turned to see it better, heedful of the percussion cap. When he had it safe, he laid them both aside and slanted a look at her. You should be at... Papa. The further away we got, the more I thought, thou needed me more. She lowered her lashes. I am thy protection. I ought not to have left thee. He allowed her to think it. He didn't say that he'd have chosen the pistol, 
Calvin and three sturdy footmen over her for protection any day. He wished that she had not even been there at such an unpredictable moment. It had come down to what he'd known it would, the balance of force against force. They wish to take thee? Manning jumps. Stoneham Perceval, not so sure. You. Calvin, change their minds. He smiled dryly and gave her that. Glad you came. Yes. I won't leave thee again. She looked shaky in the aftermath. They will remember it. It was not wisely done of. The Jervalks, the gun. He shrugged. Defense. Peaceful conduct is thy best defense. Her voice was audibly quavering in belated reaction now. Easy, say. He stood up and lifted her hands out to her. Sides. Great hulking brute, as you. Look. Scare, little children. Dog's tails down, you walk past. Ground shakes. Easy to be peaceful. You. She swallowed, compressing her lips, humor gaining ground against her nerves. Thou art buffle-headed. He was glad to see her. He was so glad to see her. I. My head is buffled. He brought her hands together and kissed the backs of her ringers. Rest, in working order. Her hands closed, but he held them. Her mouth was barely, shyly smiling. Her straight sweep of lashes made a veil of gold. Over green. He pulled her a little toward him, hungry with relief and the release of tension, with her unexpected presence. He was still free and alive, and he kissed her, sucked her lips as if he could have the breath from her, and held her heart against him. Without words he lifted her. Doors and hall, her mouth, her body in his arms, his bed. He spent no time on polite preliminaries. He took her with rough vigor, reclaiming what was his, while she twined her hands around him and pulled him down with an urgency that seemed the same. In the morning, Maddie was put to work over breakfast writing out a pointedly polite suggestion to a partner of Hoare's Bank that he present himself without delay in the Duke's drawing room an objective she was pleased to pursue, since in the meantime they were living off the 287 pounds left from Jervox's buckles, a sum which no longer seemed huge to her but appallingly inadequate to the Duke's expense. As soon as she completed that wording to Jervox's satisfaction, she had to write a notice to be inserted in the newspapers that the Duke of Jervox no longer chose to honor Mr. Torben land agent, with the exercise of his business affairs. All queries and interests should hitherto be directed to Belgrave Square, and no expense or commission undertaken save by the Duke's personal authority. She was then allowed a respite while the Duke went upstairs to be shaved and dressed. In the back parlor, a comfortable room fitted out in daisy yellow, overlooking a barren garden court and the wall of the mews, she indulged in a second cup of tea. She started a letter to her father, knowing that after Jervalk's return she would likely have little more time for it. She was in the midst of the second page when Calvin slipped into the parlor with a silver tray balanced on his hand, closing the door behind him. Maddie looked up reluctantly. The butler bowed. The Duke is not with you, your... Grace? She felt that neither she nor London Calvin quite knew what to do about one another as something of old antagonists who had found themselves standing firmly together last night, they seemed now in an odd suspension of hostilities that might turn into peace or war at a feather touch. Maddie sincerely preferred peace, so when he addressed her solemnly as, Your Grace, she almost didn't object. It was becoming a true cross. This worldly title, which was what made her certain that she ought to bear the consequences of denying it. I wish to be called Mistress Calvin, she said, in her most amiable manner. If thou wilt remember, I cannot give nor accept any such compliments as the other. She fully expected him to stiffen and look down his long nose, just like Calvin Elder's. It was provocation enough, she knew, 
to set them at odds for good and all. But instead the dignified set of his jaw seemed to temper a fraction. I remember, mistress, he said. He surprised her with this easy capitulation. Thou art not offended by it. It would be impertinent of me to be offended by anything you expect, mistress. Mattie lowered her chin, dubious. He made a bow. After begrudging a proper address to his grace, if you now set yourself up as worthier of it than he, in that case I should have been offended. However, since you are no more than consistent, I must instead appreciate the reliability of your conduct. She chewed the end of her quill. Dost thou like to wear hair powder? She startled him with that, she could see. He lowered the tray. I had not thought as to whether I liked it or not. I suppose it makes the hair unpleasantly stiff after the paste is applied, and it has to be washed out every evening, which must sometimes lead to colds. Well, if thou dost not like to wear it, thou needst not. Jervalx does not care, and I think it a silly waste of money. Calvin bowed. Mattie hid a smile. Thou art not to bow to me, either, she said. He half bowed, and caught himself. As you say, mistress. He straightened. The duke, I apprehend, has gone upstairs? Yes. Is there something I can do instead? You need not bestir yourself, mistress. Merely an early visitor for his grace. Oh, dear. Her heart dropped. The Dowager Duchess? Certainly not. I should never ask her to wait in the hall. He lifted the tray a little. I might mention, he added, in a confidential manner, that I've not known the Duke to encourage his mother to call in this house. He goes to her. I see. This lack of filial hospitality seemed undutiful, but perhaps not entirely unjustified. Mattie bit her lip. I... Suppose, I think perhaps, Jervalx wishes me to speak to these people. She stood up. Perhaps I ought to make his visitor welcome, if thou wouldst see him in here to me, until the duke comes down. Calvin cleared his throat. You would do well to ask his grace's desire in this instance, mistress. May I go and inquire for you? In this instance? In this instance, yes. He shut his mouth up tight with the look of a man who had spoken all that he was going to say. Oh, I hope thou dost not think it rude to keep the caller waiting. I will inform the duke, mistress. He made another bow, caught himself in the midst of it again, and closed the door. She was left perplexed, not knowing if Calvin had some objection to this particular visitor or if he feared that Mattie would disgrace herself and the house on her first trial. She wondered that Calvin had not put this person in the breakfast alcove where Mattie had always waited. It seemed a deliberate indignity to leave him standing in the hall. That, and Calvin's strange attitude, made Mattie tend toward the conclusion that it was the caller who was more questionable than herself. Just as she was tentatively settling on that, the door cracked. Christian, said a playful feminine voice. It's eighty. The door swung farther open. Come, I know you're here. The caller stopped on the threshold, dressed in elaborate. Morning black, her veil thrown back to reveal a delicate face. And striking yellow hair and ringlets down her cheeks. For an instant this eighty seemed startled, taking in Mattie from head to toe. Then disinterest came into her face. Ah, she said. I wish to see your master. The Duke is upstairs. Mattie kept her voice steady, determined not to make a complete botch of this first encounter with his society. I'm Archimedia Timms, that is. I am his wife. She extended her hand in greeting. The woman had been looking in her reticule. At the same time Mattie offered her hand, the caller lifted hers. You will. Take this. The lady looked up, arrested in the act of handing Mattie a note with a half-crown prominently displayed under her glove. What did you say? I am Archimedia. Mattie tried to make her lips form a smile, 
without much success. The Duke's wife. It is a surprising thing, I know. Aidy seemed to think it more than surprising. She seemed to think it hilarious. She turned back her head and burst into a high-pitched, nervous laugh. This is a joke, she said. No, Maddie said. The note and coin slid to the floor. He's paid you. He's paid you to sit here until I came and say that to me. It is a joke. No. I fear it isn't a joke. Aidy shook her head. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. It's a joke. Calvin appeared in the doorway. He was rigid as stone, utterly without expression. His grace is not at home, madam, he said to the visitor. Aidy gazed at him. He is not at home, Calvin repeated firmly. She began giggling in the most dreadful way, falling into a chair as if some skittish puppet master had dropped her. It is a joke. She lay back in the chair and kept giggling in that strange manner, growing more agitated. It is a cruel trick. Mrs. Sutherland, I must see you out directly, Calvin said. It is cruel, she screamed, throwing back her head. She flung herself from the chair and ran past him to the hall. Christian! Her voice and footsteps echoed in the marble stairwell. Christian, it is cruel! Do you hear me? It is cruel! Maddie hastened out after Calvin, in time to see Aidy rush halfway up the curving flight of stairs. Do you hear me? She shrieked, holding her skirts high as she ran upward. It is a lie! You are not married! Amid the reverberating shrillness of her voice, Jervalk strode out to the top of the stair. He was in boots and shirt sleeves. He caught the wrought iron and gilt balustrade and held there, his fingers white with the strength of his grip. Christian! She stopped below him. It is not true. Jervalk didn't move. He stood looking at her, with stillness setting into every line. She hung against the inclined rail, curling her hands around it leaning her head down on her outstretched arms and looking up at him like a puppy crawling forward to beg affection. Please don't tease me this way. Please tell me. True, he said in a low voice that filled the hall with. Hush sound. Aidy let herself collapse onto the steps, breaking into the same hysterical giggles. But I gave you everything. C.H. Christian. Her laughing sobs echoed against marble. Maddie realized that Jervox's valet was standing in the upper hall behind him. All three footmen were in the lower hall and the chambermaid and cook had come to the door of the back stairs, everyone paralyzed and staring. Maddie picked up her skirt and mounted the stairs. She heard Jervox make a wordless sound, but she went to the weeping lady and knelt on the stairs beside her. Come, she said. She took Aidy's black-loved hand and drew her up off the cold stone. Come, thou must not make thyself ill. Aidy was limp, breathing in gasps. Maddie sat on a step, slipping her arm behind the wretched lady, pulling Aidy against her shoulder, rocking her. I'm sorry. It shouldn't have happened this way. I'm sorry. The other woman was crying in earnest now, frenzied tears and great gulps of air, like a child in a tantrum. Maddie met Calvin's eye and moved her head, asking him to clear the hall. He looked as if he had just witnessed a terrible accident, moving in a stilted, shocked way to obey her. I hate him, Aidy mumbled. I hate him. I hate you. Maddie let her talk, holding her, staring at her own knees before her and the rich lace on Aidy's black gown. The other. Woman's hat brim pressed painfully into Maddie's neck. Aidy whimpered, a long, aching sound of grief. It should have been me. It should have been me. I know, Maddie said quietly. She looked at Aidy's bright yellow curls dangling down and remembered the lock in the watch case by Jervox's bed. I'm sure it should have been thee. What? Aidy's body convulsed with a scornful sob. Don't you want him? Now that you, now that you, she moaned again, 
pulling away and hunching over her lap, holding her arms tight around herself. Don't you want him now? She said between tears and a bitter laugh. I meant that we are not much like, Maddie said. Like? The lady's shoulders shook. She put her face down in her lap and cried. Maddie stroked her shoulder, feeling the deep huffing sobs under the exquisite satin. Aidy dug in her reticule for a handkerchief and held it to her mouth. You're one of those Quaker people, she said through the linen. Yes, I was brought up a friend. She rocked herself. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I hate you, Christian. She raised her voice to a scream. I hate you, do you hear me? No answer came. Maddie didn't look to see if he was still there. Aidy began to weep again, more quietly now, her handkerchief pressed to her face. She shrugged Maddie's hand off her shoulders. How did you manage it? She asked suddenly. Maddie sat on the stair, gripping her fingers together around. Her knees. Manage? How did you trap him into it? And don't tell me silly lies, Aidy cried. His sister is my friend. She will tell me everything true. She suddenly gathered up her skirt and started down the stairs, as if that thought had impelled her from grief into action. At the foot she stopped, then cast a quick glance backward. Above Maddie. An instant later she had pulled her veil over her face and vanished into the vestibule. The front door slammed, echoing around the hall. Maddie sat on the steps. She had to think of each breath, holding back the shudder that started in her stomach and tried to work its way outward to all her limbs. When she thought she had it under control, she rose. She turned, but she already knew that he was not there. She had seen it in Aidy's face. Calvin came quietly into the hall from the back stairs. It's my blame, mistress, he said. I ought not to have let her in the door. Calvin, she said in a treble voice that almost went out of her command. I need to have my cloak. Mistress, I must go outside. I have to go outside. The garden is, no. She started for the front door. Away from here. A moment, mistress. His grace will wish to know. She opened the door. Cold damp air poured in. It felt good on her hot cheeks. She did not wait for Calvin or her cloak, but quietly closed the door, went down the pristine white steps and began to walk toward home. Christian heard the front door slam beneath his dressing room. He didn't move, nor look down on the street to see Aidy leave. He stood alone in the center of the room, the sound of her shrieking voice still in his ears. He stood there for a long time. The bizarre unreality of it to stand watching while his wife went to comfort his weeping mistress. And vile piece of work that he was, he thought, she doesn't realize. If she did or if she didn't, her simple compassion cut him. Open, exposed him to himself for what he was, he'd been furious at Aidy's brass in coming here, and raged into frozen passion at the scene she made, ready to throw her into the street. And Maddie, oh, Maddie, she made him feel it, how he'd wounded. I didn't mean it to come to this, nauseating whine of every thoughtless devil after the fact. I didn't mean it. I wouldn't have done it if I'd known, if I could have foreseen, if I'd just considered if, if, if. Calvin's light scratch at the door made him turn. He flung it. Open. The butler looked like a man facing execution. Your Grace he began. Christian cut off the groveling before it could start. Too disgusting, to rake down a servant for what was at heart nothing but the devil's luck and the devil's own folly that had induced it. Where? he demanded. Mrs. Sutherland? the butler asked. Hang Sutherland! Duchess is, where? Your grace, she has gone out. A few minutes ago. As Christian made an exclamation and headed through the door, he added quickly, Your Grace, I thought it best, she seemed determined to proceed. I sent a man after her with a cloak and... 
orders to attend her at a distance, and send word if she doesn't return directly. Christian halted. Yes. All right. Let her calm herself. Give her time. Give her time and room. Yes. You did, well? The butler cleared his throat and said reluctantly, Mr. Hor has arrived to see you, your grace. I have put him in the library. Damn, so soon. Christian wasn't prepared. He'd intended to have Maddie with him, primed to help him if he needed it. Hor was the linchpin. If Christian failed here, he was dead. He pushed a breath through his teeth and picked up his coat. He had no choice. The wheel was turning. He'd set it to rolling and had to ride it now. Christian entered the double-storied library from its book gallery, where he could overlook the room below. Pausing amid the familiar smell of leather bindings, he swore silently as he looked down upon the men sitting like a pair of misplaced undertakers on a couch still slip-covered in red summer stripes. His summons had been answered by the one partner Christian had the least desire to deal with. Of these two promising scions of the Hoare family, the elder was agreeable enough, but his younger cousin was religious, not a trait which recommended him to Christian, nor the other way round. Hoares had been bankers to the Dukes of Gervaults for a century. Christian hadn't changed that, though he'd often thought of it when the partners had tilted at him with polite. Vigor over his schemes, reckless or visionary, depending on whose side held the floor. But Hors had stood with the family through his father's decades of real debt, so Christian had kept on with them, impatient though they made him. He wished now that he'd been a little less loyal. He thought of the letter they'd written in reply to his last draft. Pray for his health, would they? Self-righteous bastards. He'd give them something to pray about. With a loud, rude step, he went down the stairs and swung to face them from the foot. Gentlemen, he said without greeting. Explain. They both rose, with murmured good mornings. The religious Mr. Hoare walked forward as if to shake hands. Christian didn't move. The man stopped, losing momentum before he got three feet. I wait, Christian said. Explain. If you refer to the delay in, delay. Christian cut into the banker's dignified words. He did not dare allow a rational dialogue to develop. I am. My feelings so violent. He flung himself away from the staircase. Ken hardly. Speak, sir. He didn't want to play up inarticulate fury too far or he would encourage doubts about his sanity. So he stopped at his desk and sat down. This, at least, he'd had time to prepare. Another draft already written out and placed beneath a blank sheet, the whole concealed from their view by a convenient stack. Of books. He picked up a pen and wrote across the blank sheet. God knew how it turned out, but he didn't stop to check, and slipped the one Maddie had examined for errors from beneath. He stood up and held it out. Try again. The bankers had looked uncomfortable from the start. The elder of the whores stepped forward to accept the draft, but his partner said, I'm afraid there may still be a delay. Why? We have instituted certain new regulations. Christian leaned on his desk. My money, he said menacingly. You have lost it. Certainly not, the elder spoke up. To be perfectly candid, your grace, the younger mister, Hor said stiffly, your family has given us grounds for concern as to. He found himself swimming in deep water and spread his legs, taking a firmer stance. As to the propriety of allowing funds to be removed from your account at present. Ah, Christian smiled. No regulation. His lip curled. Just plain thief. Now see here. We are merely exercising due care, as anyone of sense would expect us to do in this uncertain situation. Christian sat back in his chair, picking up a copy of the Times. He held it up in one hand and looked at it consideringly. Bank robbery. 
Whore's steel, deposit. He tilted his head in approval. Clever headline. They stood like men facing an armed highwayman themselves. Christian lowered the paper and smiled apologetically. The elder Mr. Hoare folded the draft and put it into his pocket. Of course that won't be necessary, he said in a quieter tone than his cousin had yet used. We had understood that your grace was not well, and that communication alleged to be from yourself might not be perfectly legitimate. We wish to exercise due prudence. For myself, I hope it hasn't caused your grace offense. If so, we must apologize profoundly, must we not, Cousin Hoare? His younger relation begrudged it. His tone still held a grain of defiance. Of course, we'll be keeping strict account, should there be any inquiry from the Lord Chancellor's office. By all means, Christian said. The money, when? I'll have a courier here before noon, the elder said. Christian pulled the bell for Calvin. He let them stand there. Until the butler came, stewing in his unforgiving silence. They went out with stiff wishes for his continued health that he answered with no more than a curt nod. When they were gone, Christian collapsed heavily into his chair. His hands were not quite steady. Victory. All on his own, victory. He wanted to grin and weep at once. He wanted to share it, this charge of elation. He wanted Maddie beside him. The waterman's calls were all that was tangible about the river, the calls, and the slow current at the bank that fanned. The water weeds, a silver surface that vanished into mist a few yards out. The fog had clung to Chelsea all day, swallowing the row of houses behind her and muffling the sound of traffic. Maddie leaned on a rail by the river, huddled in her cloak. The footman from Belgrave Square was still with her, a patient silhouette standing under an awning across the street, just at the edge of the mist. The light had begun to fail. She knew she would have to do something soon. She could not stay here forever. A waterman ran his punt up onto the bank, secured it, and dragged out a basket. She watched him hike his pants and make a nimble leap to a set of wooden steps. He climbed up. Live eels, ma'am? he asked cheerfully. Maddie shook her head. He walked past, holding his burden up for the view of a carriage that Maddie heard coming along the street behind her. Live eels, then, he called. Livo! The steady beat of the horse's hooves advanced slowly. Maddie turned to look as the coachman curbed his team in a jingle of harness. The waterman raised his eels hopefully toward the shining black chariot. It had a bright, familiar crest on the door. She saw her shadowy footman come forward to it from the mist. The door opened. Jervalk stepped down, his cape spreading to show a flash of scarlet. He stood looking toward Maddie. Five and a half, your lordship, the waterman said, asking an outrageous price. alive -o, look here. He started to open his basket. Jervalk glanced at him then toward the footman with brief nod. The servant forestalled the ecstatic waterman from displaying his wares to the duke, drawing the eel catcher away toward the rear of the carriage. Jervox walked toward Maddie. He stood in front of her. Enough, he said quietly. Come home. Home, she thought. But this was home, this village and river, these trees, these boats. She knew them all, could have found them in the mist with her eyes closed. She had lived here all her life. He looked away from her, toward the river. Then he made a sweep of his hand, dismissing the carriage. Walk? He offered her his arm. In silence, she turned, resting her fingers lightly on his sleeve. He was warm beneath her cold hands. He put his glove over her fingers, covering them against the misty air. He always made so it easy to walk with him. Without. Awkwardness, with a feeling of fitting naturally to her step. They walked until Maddie could no longer hear the soft snorts and intermittent hoof thumps of the waiting horses. Wast thou engaged to marry her? She asked. 
The muscle in his arm tightened a little beneath her hands, the only sign of change in him. No. She said that it ought to have been her. He didn't answer. Beside thy bed, thou hadst a lock of her hair. He was gazing at the pavement ahead, a hard, silent set to his mouth. He didn't deny it, nor repent it. And dost thou love her then? She asked at last. He stopped, taking both her hands in his. No, Maddie. No. She drew away, hugging herself, facing the river. If that is true, and thou received her token, verily, thou art a wicked man. Yes, he said on the harsh note of some emotion she couldn't identify. She watched a white cat, a pale indistinct shape that prowled among the beach punts. The water lapped softly below, blurring into the dusk. Come, he said. Dark. She didn't move. The cat placed a paw upon the prow of a boat, then made a quick silent leap inside and vanished under the seat. Thou art a stranger to me, she said painfully. I do not truly know thee or what thou art. Jervalk spoke in the hush. I am ashamed, Maddie. To the deepest pit of my soul. All I can. Say. Can't go back. Can't change it. The white cat emerged in the stern of the punt. It mounted a coil of rope, lay down and curled up there. She felt Jervox, unmoving, behind her. Come home, he said. Maddie. Wretched eighty, to have given a lock of her hair to a rake. To fall in love with him, and end in hopeless weeping on his staircase. It was like a cautionary tale in a sermon book. Maddie could draw the proper moral from it. I'm afraid, she whispered. I'm afraid of what thou wilt do to my soul and my heart. Your heart is precious to me, he said quietly. She bent her head. She turned around without looking at him and took his arm. Chapter 30 Like the opera? he asked, holding her hand as she came down from the carriage in Belgrave Square. I've never seen it. Tonight, he said. You wear blue. Calvin met them at the door. He took Maddie's cloak, started to bow and stopped himself. I've seen to it that there's a good fire for you, mistress. I'll have a tray of tea sent up. Do you like strawberry jam and clotted cream? I've just brought up marmalade from the pantry, too, if you're partial or I can see about. He cut himself off suddenly as if realizing how anxious he sounded, and gave Maddie a stiff nod. I wish to apologize again, mistress, for my negligence. There is no blame to thee, Maddie said. The butler looked as if that were little comfort to him, but he said no more. As she went upstairs, all the servants were quick to jump to their tasks, and the chambermaid, whom Maddie had barely seen, shyly said that she had put a hot brick in the bed, in case mistress wanted to rest a while before supper. Maddie lay down gratefully, still chilled through by the mist. It was the duke's chamber, but he had stayed below. She had the sinful luxury of it alone, except for the faint scent of him all around her. When she opened her eyes, it was after dark. In the light of a shielded candle Jervalk sat by the bed, watching her. He was elegantly dressed, turned out in midnight blue and white by his valet in a way Maddie had never been able to manage. The opera. She pushed up with a little spurt of apprehension. The theater and dances and fine clothing, all the things of his world, the time had come to face them. Supper. He nodded toward a large tray, already set with a table and chair by the fire. Then dress. He laid a box on the counterpane beside her. He stood up and walked to the door, paused with his hand on the knob, and nodded toward the box. For your hair, he said and left her. Maddie sat up and opened the box. It was a string of pearls, like her mother's, only larger and more luminous in the candlelight, with a diamond strung between each pearl. She pressed her lips together. A vain, frivolous, expensive thing, sparkling, pretty. 
She tried to be on guard, to barricade herself against him, but he sought out her weakness unerringly. Not the gift, no. Not the lavishness of it, not even the unexpected beauty of the jewels. For her hair, he said. He remembered that, and stole through her defenses simply. They arrived late. Christian had calculated it. The haymarket was brilliant but lonely for the space of the performance, gaslight gleaming on the rows of waiting carriages, on harness and coach lamps. After the money from Hors had arrived, it had taken less than half an hour to have a job team and livery put to his town carriage. The world was open to him again. He'd begun spreading coin around like a wealthy CID, a hard cash liberality. Calculated to impress the most dubious creditor. Not paying off too many of his existing tickets, just making new purchases with Sterling, to give them something to think about. He'd sent Calvin to Rundell and Bridge for the pearls, dispatched a footman to spend two hundred pounds at the silversmiths, had the cook make lavish purchases from Harrods and the wine cellar, and through Calvin, made some special arrangements with the nurserymen, all paid in advance. Maddie had worn the pearls. He hadn't been at all sure that she would do it. He didn't know how to treat her, how to penetrate the mist of reserve that still cloaked her. Sweet words and expensive presents, they were all he could think of, and he knew what she'd likely label them, falsehood and immorality. More time would have been better, but he had no time. He needed Maddie, tonight, beside him. The light from the theater's Corinthian portico flooded down on her as she descended to the walk, making her simple toilette rich with color, the blue dress and her ale-gold hair, the subtle luster of pearl against the sparkle of diamond. She was arresting, he thought, though no one could describe her as conventionally beautiful. She had a chaste and spartan aspect rather than pink blowsy charm. Not Aphrodite, but prudent Athena, of the sage owl, and the golden bridle that tamed Pegasus. The nearly empty vestibule, the dim corridors, even the growing sound of music did not prepare Mattie for the burst of light and color that struck the eye as she entered the duke's box. With her ears full of song, she could only gaze at the sweeping tiers of boxes in red and gold, rising up to the roof, full of people leaning aside to their companions or forward over the rail, looking down on the stage and the massed audience on the floor of the theater. And the stage, Maddie took one look and quickly averted her eyes. The people dancing across the boards were not dressed. She heard a rumble growing from the spectators, a new note of disturbance amid the music and the audience hum. The people on the floor two tiers below were turning, looking up. The occupants of the opposite boxes were staring and directing spyglasses, all at the place where she and Jervalks sat alone. She dropped her eyes to her lap, unable to look anywhere, not at the indecency on stage, not at the audience. Chin up, Jervalks said without turning to her. She raised her chin. Thank you, he said. Watch the perform. The stage. Ah, they are, oh dear, she said, obeying him in that too. Appalled by the girls in pink tights, their ankles and calves in full view, their legs showing clearly through diaphanous skirts. This is dreadful. Watch, he said. It was not without a certain lurid fascination. The unclad figures alternately leapt and cavorted about the stage, and stopped, poised, to sing at the top of their lungs. Maddie knew little more of music than a few Christmas carols and street songs she'd heard, but she understood from reading the papers that the opera was an elevated branch of art. Certainly it was. Loud, and not many of the spectators seemed concerned about talking over it. Indeed, she heard voices through the curtain enclosing the back of their box, where Jervalks had left a footman who held his line firmly in a not very discreet controversy over whether he ought to allow the petitioners outside to enter. Jervalks never moved a muscle, though he must have heard it clearly, too. Maddie could not help herself. She could not watch the deportment on stage and began to look at the audience below. There she had another shock, 
coming to the slow realization that unaccompanied men were strolling and sitting down with women they didn't appear to know, holding their hands, even putting their arms around them. One scarlet officer's coat caught her eye as he stood up. There is Colonel Fane, she said. As she spoke, the colonel turned and looked directly at their box. He smiled and bowed, drawing the attention of everyone on the benches around him. Jervalks gave a nod back, the only sign of recognition he'd made to anyone. The officer left his seat and began to make his way up the aisle. A few moments later, the duke rose and held back the curtain himself. Colonel Fane walked into their box. Ma'am! He grinned and bowed to Maddie, lifting her hand. It's a pleasure to see you again, in such looks, too. And Chev, deuce take you, why didn't you tell me you was back in town? Haven't, long, Jervalk said. May I call on you, ma'am? Fane asked, sitting down beside Maddie and leaning toward her. Thou wouldst be welcome to call. He shook his head, smiling. I vow I dote on that way you talk. He looked over her head at Jervalks. I'm going to become her chichis bail, I warn you. The duke lifted his brows. My siso? What is it? She asked. Colonel Fane stood up, lifting her hand for a kiss. Why, your lover, ma'am. And now I must go, before my poor heart is in shreds, or your husband calls me out. Farewell, my stern Helen. I die for you. Before Maddie could quite digest this extraordinary speech, he was gone. She lowered her face, aware of people all over the theater staring at them. She stole a look from the corner of her eye at Jervalks. He gazed at her somberly. Then he smiled, an intimate look that cut down her heart without mercy. I must shoot him. She took a deep breath and lifted her head. Thou needst not be concerned, she said quietly. I do not trifle with love. Jervalks. His face went still. Maddie looked away from him, watching the cavorting actresses as they rushed here and there about the stage, warbling like delirious larks. Holding out his hand, he stood. Long enough. Let us go. As a bachelor, Christian had not been much troubled with formal calls on himself. More usually, he paid them, doing the civil in return for dinners and parties, nursing his interests, business or otherwise, flirting or paying his respects as required. But this morning the cards piled up on the silver tray in the hall. A stream of carriages stopped, one after another, for a few moments outside the house in Belgrave Square, and then continued on, their occupants turned away from the door. Every hour, Calvin delivered a new batch of cards to the library. Maddie, sitting across from Christian at his desk, read the name on each card aloud. Then, according to his nod, she dropped it into one of two matching jade bowls appropriated from the ornamental console tables for the purpose. Between influxes of cards, she took dictation of checks and letters while he worked over the ledgers. And every half hour, Calvin came again with a new bouquet of flowers for her. It had begun before breakfast, this steady delivery of Christian's tulips, daffodils, sweet-smelling hyacinths, carnations and picotees, auriculas, some cut, some in Dutch pots, some in baskets, each one a little larger than the last, until the library was a garden and the flowers overflowed into the salon next door. To his consternation, Maddie appeared utterly unimpressed. She had accepted the floral presentations without a word all day, quietly directing Calvin to set them aside. But when two footmen and the nursery boys, heralded by the exquisite scent of southern climes, dallied in a pair of huge tubs planted with orange trees in full bloom, she finally put her hands over her mouth and closed her eyes. What art thou about? she cried through her fingers. There is a message, mistress. Calvin produced a note. The nurserymen will call at your convenience, and inquire as to what plants you will wish to have set in the back garden, and in the orangery to be built for you there. She made a little moan behind her hands and rolled her eyes toward Christian. He wasn't quite certain if this were success or disaster. 
As the servants quit the room, he went to one of the trees and plucked a blossom. She was watching him over her hands, impossible to fathom. He took a deep, sensual breath of the flower, rotated it in his fingers, and strolled to her. He paused, as if considering what to do with it, and then stuck it behind his own ear. Pretty? He put his hand to his head, turning it to show his ear better. She giggled, a woeful sound, as if it were choked out of her, and she could not help it. Per simple-hearted Maddie girl, too. Laugh at that. Poor buffle-headed Christian, to be reduced to it. His experience was broad, but he found it wasn't deep enough to make him adept at soothing the aggravated sensibilities of a Puritan lady. I know what thou art doing, she said. Primp myself pretty. Thou art pouring the butter boat over me, giving me jewels and flowers. He shook the blossom from his ear and let it drop into his hand. Is it working? Her cheeks pinkened. She dropped her eyes. Working to do what? Turn up, sweet. To what end? He shrugged. So don't have to sleep in the dressing room. She looked around at the flowers that covered every table and cabinet. This expense, only for that? With the blossom caught between his middle fingers, he caressed it lightly over the back of her hand. Only? She blushed vividly. It is thy house. I never said thou shouldst sleep here or there or anywhere. It isn't my place to say. Your place to say. You want me there. He slowly circled the petals over her skin. With you. Oh. Her breathing had become agitated. Is it? You say. You tell me. You want me. She watched the flower. I don't know. She said miserably. Don't know, Matty girl? He asked softly. Oh, why art thou so, so carnal? She snatched her hand away. I ought not. Christian felt an immediate rise of his spirits. Here was something perfectly familiar, a lady who ought not but very likely would. On that note, he made a strategic withdrawal. He could be patient. Very well, he said with dignity, and left her. Walking round his desk to sit down before the ledgers again. He bent over the books. After a few moments of silence, he looked up. One other. Another thing. Two. In a month, we will have a ball for five hundred. He pushed the jade bowl with the largest number of cards in it toward her. Invitations to these. He didn't come that night, as he had not the night before. Maddie was left alone in his bedchamber to contemplate a ball for five hundred people and what he said it was her place to tell him. She wanted to be angry at him for these outrageous new extravagances. The flowers, the jewels, they were sly worldly tricks. He had admitted it outright, guileless, with an orange blossom behind his ear. Is this working, stealing from her the immunity of virtuous indignation? She felt herself slipping, sliding into his net. In the morning... They worked together again in the flower-filled library to unravel his affairs. He labored with a concentration that clearly wearied him. By noon his speech had deteriorated, and he slammed the books closed impatiently. Perhaps thou ought to rest, she said, when he had been trying to give her the amount of a payment and had to recalculate it three times. It is difficult for thee. Not difficult. He threw himself back in his chair. Simple. But it, it is, slips, it goes away. As if, try to work and listen to, talk. Can't both. He leaned his head back and put his hands over his eyes. I'm not stupid. I didn't say thou art stupid, Maddie murmured. He sighed heavily, dropping his hands still staring at the ceiling. I feel stupid, he groaned. Bloody damned idiot. She sat looking down at her lap desk. She fiddled with the corner of the paper, rolling it up, and then unrolling it. Christian, she said, watching her fingers. 
Wouldst thou please come tonight? For a moment he didn't do anything. Then he steepled his hands and lifted his head from the back of the chair, resting his chin on the tips of his fingers, gazing at her. Why wait? He smiled. I'm here, now. Maddie's eyes widened. She looked at the paper, and back up at him uncertainly. Thou art giddy. He laughed, low and soft. Maddie thought it prudent to set the lap desk aside. She stood up, tucking papers into knee piles. When he rose, she almost dropped an inkpot, fumbling. He caught it from her fingers and set it safely down. Giddy? he asked with amusement. I believe Calvin has a luncheon prepared, later. It is time for eating, Jervalks. It is daylight. I did not say to. The, she lost the tail of her sentence as he came behind her and brushed his lips across the nape of her neck. Want me, Maddie girl? He murmured. She shuddered with the exquisite hot tickle. It is daylight. She exclaimed, her voice high and faint. He gave that rich, soft laugh again, his breath warm against her skin. Didn't ask time of day. He traced his finger down. The line of her throat to the buttons at the back of her neck. Maddie felt the first one pop open. Calvin! She said desperately. He'll be coming in. He unbuttoned another button, placing a kiss on her exposed nape. Thou art weary. She seemed rooted to the spot, feeling the electric caress flow down her body to melt in heat and carnal places, the tips of her breasts, and lower, lower. Thou shouldst, thou ought to. Rest. No answer yet, he said, loosening all the buttons and the ribbons of her corset, finding the opening in her camisole. Want me, Maddie? Thou art. A scratch on the door made her give a small helpless whimper of panic. Yes? Jervalk said toward the door. He held her still with his hands on both shoulders, pressing her dress together with his thumbs. Calvin stood in the entry. Luncheon, your grace. Serve here, Jervalk said expressionless. He dropped one of his hands, running his finger up and down the open slit in her dress, bright erotic sensation against her spine. Maddie flushed, staring at Calvin, unable to move or speak. The butler merely bowed. Directly, your grace, he said and withdrew. There, she said, trying to shrug her dress up from where Jervalks was drawing it down off her shoulders. Now showest. Sense. He will be back, in a few moments. No. No, thou must not, not here. Her bodice fell loose. He held her against him, kissing the curve of her shoulder through her thin cotton camisole. His hand explored upward beneath her open corset, skimming over the cotton. His palm grazed her nipple through the fabric, a sweet shot of delight. She sucked in her breath. Want? He murmured close to her ear. They'll come, she moaned. They'll come, they'll come. His arms tightened. Want me? Noise at the closed door brought her to panic. She began to push at him, but he held her harder. He drew her back into the deep, narrow space between a bookcase and a cabinet, half hidden. Then he let her go, leaving her standing in brazen undress. As the door opened, he moved in front of her and pulled a book down from the shelf. He stood bruising it, his back to the room, obscuring the servants from her view. She heard the rattle of trays and dishes saw around him the flash of white stockings as a footman. Past the place where she hid in broad daylight. She feared that she must certainly be visible, though she herself could see nothing past Jervox's broad shoulders. He turned a page. Here, he said, as if he'd just discovered some passage he'd been searching for. He looked up at her with laughter brimming in his eyes. Hamlet. Lady, shall I lie in your lap? Maddie squeezed back against the wall, pressing her lips together, frowning at him with frantic severity. His look changed to exaggerated innocence. I mean, my head upon your lap? Don't, 
she whispered furiously. He grinned at her. Right here, in the play. I only read it. She heard the door open and close. For a long moment Jervalk stood watching her, holding her trapped by modesty and by himself, solid barrier to escape. Maddie listened for any sound, and then mouthed are they gone? He turned his head, looking over his shoulder, first one way, and then the other, theatrically. He looked back at her. Don't know. Better stay, here. She gave him a push. The book slid down. He held it out behind him and let it fall with a flutter and thump as he leaned forward to kiss her mouth. He caught her body in his hands, his thumbs passing provocatively over her breasts, caressing the tips, back and forth. The feel of it drew a liquid arching, a breath and a pressing flex of all her muscles toward him. Want me? He whispered, licentious, the devil at her ear in. Full daylight, a man's firm elegant hands on her body, blue eyes. And long dusky beautiful eyelashes. She whirled, her back to him, pressing her fiery cheek to the smooth cool leather of the library wall. He stroked the naked skin of her back, pushing her undergarments aside. He ran his hands over her torso, up beneath her arms creating delight and embarrassed agony as she could not stop the shivering of pleasure. It is day, she moaned, hiding her face, pressing it to the leather-covered wall. Thou shouldst not. He ceased his touch on her bared torso. But he didn't move back. He moved closer, holding her against the wall. She could feel the crushed lace of his shirt against her skin. His scent mingled with the smell of leather. He began to draw her skirt up in his hands. Oh, no, she cried, muffled. No, no, it is indecent. Christian. He closed his teeth on her shoulder, his pressure against her more urgent, his body pinning hers to the wall. She tried to thrust back from it, and only brought herself closer to him. He kissed her all along the curve of her throat and shoulder, kissed and nipped and sucked at her skin pulling her hands down and back away from the wall until they fluttered helplessly without purchase. Her skirt was caught up between them. She felt shamelessly exposed, her legs and stockings uncovered to her garters. But he didn't stop there. He pulled her petticoat and dress higher, cupping her hips and her buttocks with his bare hands. He made a rough, ardent sound near her ear. He bit her, hurt. Her kneading her body in his palms, but it was sweet pain and sinful ecstasy. She felt him release his own buttons, his hard male part pushed and pressed, and she began to pant in desperate guilty excitement. Like stone melting, her body slackened, her legs allowed him between. The sound of his breath was caustic, an animal engine, brushing heat across her nakedness. He pressed her hips, a rash hard grip of his fingers making her close her legs on his shaft. He forced his hands between her body and the wall, dragging her skirt up in front. He caught her wrists. Touch me. He brought her fingers to the place between her legs, to hot moistness and his smooth head. Yes, he groaned, moving suddenly, demandingly against her. Yes, yes, Maddie. With their hands entwined, jammed to the wall, he slid his fingers against her private place, massaged and teased and pressed deep in rhythm with the thrust of his body against her. His man's part moved between her legs, an unimaginable pleasure, a sensation that flowed to her breasts, made the nipples full and tender, like flame pushed against the cool leather. Wet hot dew spread over her fingers and his, she molded her hand to the head of his arousal, taking deep and lurid satisfaction in the sound she drew from him. Want me? His voice was grinding, insistent, taut with extremity. Maddie, inside you. She bit her lip, her face turned aside to the wall. I want. Thee. She said on a sob. I want thee. And he showed her how then. How to bend and submit for him, in bondage to him, in daylight, sinking together on their knees to the floor, with him deep inside her over her and around her, his hands holding her breasts, his mouth against the nape of her neck, lost in him and in his coupling with her. 
She cried out with violent joy at the height, her voice mingling with his masculine groan, the two of them no more, and no less, than every wild creature that God had made of clay to walk the earth. He bought her a carriage. Two carriages, one with a team of four white stocking chestnuts and one with a pair of cream-colored ponies, for the park, he said, as if she were ever going to go driving there in it. Maddie told him that she did not want such things. She insisted that he put a stop to his ill-advised purchases and gifts. He bought her an antique marquetry cabinet from a selection that the dealer fetched to Belgrave Square and began to redecorate the back parlor, a perfectly smart and comfortable room that had hardly seen a year's use, transforming it into an outlandishly expensive boudoir full of gilt and red satin. Maddie berated him for wastefulness. He purchased her a small magnificent Rembrandt by private treaty, the complement of the one in his bedroom at Jervolk's castle, a study of a serious youth who looked as if he might be the brother of that mischievous girl. Maddie read afterward in the newspaper that the Duke's offer had been so generous it had forestalled the paintings scheduled auction at Christie's, sending the Conoscenti into paroxysms of jealousy. She lived in misery and delight in the small world of the Duke's house. They were never at home to callers, nor went out except at dusk, conveyed by a carriage to some secluded country lane beyond the city, where Jervalk stretched his long legs into a walk that had her striding to keep up. Around a corner, or beside a shaggy hedge, with the dim autumn sunset casting shadows across mats of fallen, frosty leaves, he would stop and kiss her, and sometimes more than that. He touched her often. He looked up across the library desk with a smile that knew too. Much of her. She felt utterly owned by him. The gifts were nothing. It was her own hunger that enslaved her. She wanted to be touched. She wanted him to take her, in any way, any place and time, with no care for modesty or decent conduct. She wanted simply to look at him. Every dispute over his spending was doubly painful, because he wouldn't even quarrel now. He either went away, driving out alone, leaving her bereft amid the splendor or he seduced her. Like eighty, she was lost to him, only worse, worse in her need, in how deeply she had surrendered herself. She would do anything he guided her to do and take pleasure in it. She was terrified of him, this power that he held, and still she gave it to him, heart-glad and wretched. She was defenseless. She thought of eighty on the stairs. His coaxing skillful caresses, his worldly sophistication— she thought that there must have been others and would be others again. Locks of hair and painted miniatures and pain. She ought to go. Leave this place. Anyone could do such work as she performed for him, a clerk, a secretary. She ought to get away, go to her father and save herself while she had yet enough shame left to understand what was becoming of her. But she was responsible still. Just this morning she'd had a letter from Lady de Marley. Maddie had read it, and then burned it, to hide it from Jervox, so that he would not see what his aunt had written. His mother wanted him confined again immediately. The power of this iniquitous jade who claimed to be his wife must be broken. So far, Lady de Marley's barrister had persuaded the Dowager Duchess to delay an unwilling detention, avoiding a fuss that was likely to become mortifyingly public, perhaps even scandalous attempting to confine a man not yet certainly judged incompetent. But as a result, pressure for a hearing had grown to intense proportions. The attorney was having serious difficulty preventing a date being set. The family were beside themselves at the Duke's rate of expenditure and his dismissal of the land agent who'd handled his affairs for years. Maddie, Lady de Marley made no bones to tell her, was considered the sole source and spring of this bleeding discharge of money, painted in the halls and offices of chancery in the lurid shades of an avaricious, opportunistic harpy who had complete control of the mindless wreckage of the Duke of Jervalx. This picture was such a reverse from the real truth that it had choked an awful laugh from her. But it came as no surprise. She wasn't at all sure herself that Jervalx had competent control of his affairs, 
there was no saying what his situation must appear to an outside party. Certainly she might reasonably be supposed the guilty party. She thought it one more cause to leave him, but Lady de Marley ordered, begged, actually begged, Maddie to do all in her power to make him reduce his expenses to a reasonable level, specifying a figure that would have seemed to Maddie monstrous a month ago, but appeared quite modest now. She despaired of being able to do it. Jervalks was not even paying the arrears of his loans. Though he dictated polite letters in response to all, he'd settled only the most desperately threatening claims. With all of his labor over the figures, Maddie did not see where he was making any progress. She'd begun lately to suspect that he was instead hoarding money, neglecting payments so that he had an even greater income than before. They had argued about it again just this morning. Or at least Maddie had argued. Jervalx had merely scowled at her until he lost his patience and came around the desk and began to kiss her. Fortunately, Durham arrived, putting a stop to that more effectively than Maddie ever could herself. She was not asked to accompany Jervalx and his friend on this first round of selected calls they planned to make, a society custom which intimidated her extremely. Durham, who didn't seem to have a glimmer of her feelings, apologized to her for being left home. You'll be out and about at such stuff before you know it, he predicted optimistically. As soon as this ball gets you popped off official. Oh, Maddie said. She glanced at Jervalx. It is for that? He swept a bow. Introduce my duchess. Bowl them over, Durham said. Only way to do it. Take your fences head on. Nerve and pluck will carry it. Not the height of the season, but with nothing else going forward, you'll have them here bag and baggage. Hunting's been so slack, even your Melton men may forego the chase a day or two for this. Sacrifice. Jervalk said dryly. Chev don't like to fox hunt. Durham confided to Maddie. Not modern enough. He prefers shooting, as more scientific. The Duke seemed to find that a sour thought. No more he said. Couldn't hit, broad barn now. It'll pass, Durham said insistently. See how you're improving. Jervalx didn't answer that, but stood at the door, a grim statue, waiting for his friend to shake hands with Maddie. As they went out, he was saying, We don't stay, only five minutes. Damned short, Durham. Understand? So I don't. Talk. Calvin appeared a few moments after they had departed. I'm to help you with the invitations, mistress, so as to get them out by tomorrow. The stationer has sent materials. He laid a packet on the desk and produced a small pair of scissors to clip the string. Maddie sighed. Clearly, whatever his creaturely talents, patience was not one of the duke's virtues. It seemed hours later and her hand and back were aching from transcribing the letters of the morning and the invitations of the afternoon when a footman scratched on the door. The nurseryman, Mr. Butterfield, and his gardener, Mr. Hill, he announced. In spite of the flowers that still filled the library, delivered. Fresh every day, Maddie had completely forgot the appointment Jervalx had made for her with the nurseryman. But Calvin had risen and the footman was already showing the two men into the room. The second wore a Quaker's hat and plain coat. Thou misspoke my name, he said, turning from the footman to Maddie. It is Richard Gill. Chapter 31 Maddie felt felt a great wave of humiliation. She sat rooted to her chair, covered with it, breathless as if she stood upon a platform and heard her offenses cried in the public streets. Mr. Butterfield bowed low and gave a cheerful smile as he bounced his portly figure upright. It is an honor to serve you, Your Grace. I hope the flowers and plants have been satisfactory? She nodded. Like a creaky pull toy, she stood up and held out her hand to Richard. Friend, she said. Archimedia, he answered just touching her hand and dropping his away, while the nurseryman looked on in surprise. We're already acquainted, Maddie said to him. 
I... She did not say that she was a friend. She couldn't, not now. She had no right. I have met Richard Gill before. Mr. Butterfield was all smiles again. How fortuitous. Gill has been with me just a short while, but perhaps you know he has come directly from Mr. Loudon, your grace? No, Maddie said mechanically. I didn't know that. Ah, but you're familiar with Mr. Loudon's work? Mr. Loudon, she found a kernel of intelligence to cling to. The suburban gardener? Indeed, your grace. The premier horticulturist of our day, the suburban gardener and villa companion, an encyclopedia of gardening, the gardener's magazine, a fit successor to Brown and Repton, I assure you. And Gil here comes with Mr. Loudon's highest recommendation as designer. And florist. He is an expert in botanical science, and can aid us in planning an arboretum and garden in the most forward style. Beautiful to the eye, educational to the mind, and most importantly, uplifting to the spirit. I hope he will be acceptable to you. Richard merely looked at her, his clear-eyed gaze steady, killing in its lack of accusation. Maddie could barely meet it for an instant. Yes. Acceptable. I'm sure Richard is acceptable. As soon as she said it, she thought of Jervalx, who would likely not think it acceptable at all. But she could not say that, nor find the words to turn off smiling Butterfield and the whole opulent project. The nurseryman was clearly elated over his commission. Well then, Butterfield turned to Richard and took a notebook and sketch pad from him. Shall we take a look at what we have? The space between the house and stables was no larger than her garden in Chelsea had been, paved and bleak and new. Between walls that had no softening cover of trailers or trees, nothing provided ornament but a single wrought iron bench. Butterfield made a judicious moo of his lips. There's a service basement beneath the pavement? Yes. Maddie was familiar with the kitchen and cellars from her first day alone with Jervalx and cravenly glad to have something impersonal to talk about. It goes through to the muse. I'll have to have a look at the foundations before we begin. It won't take a moment. Gil, you'll attend the Duchess. If your grace will please to let him know any particular plants you may have a fondness for. No, no, no need to stir. I'll find someone to show me down. He was darting back into the house before Maddie could realize that he meant to leave them alone. She lifted her hand, but he was gone. She stood looking at the handsome French door where he disappeared into the house. In the alley behind the stables, someone was whistling. She hung immobile in the powerful silence that prevailed inside the barren court. Why? Richard asked. Maddie had to turn to him. She kept her eyes down staring at the raw pavement. Did he force thee? Archimedia. His quiet voice had a terrible undertone of emotion in it. Thou could have come to me. Surely thou knew it. She shook her head quickly, helpless to explain. He walked away to the wall. The Lord required of me to watch over thee, and to the grief of my soul, I failed in it. No, Richard, it was not thy failing. The white stone outlined him, square-shouldered, face to the wall, dark severity against the stark light. When he turned, Mattie averted her eyes again, unable to meet his. He came closer to her. No matter that he took his way with thee, he said low, his tone burning with intensity. I would have asked consent of meeting to make thee my wife. Wife? She looked up at him, staring. I still will do it, Archimedia, if thou will repudiate this fearful error. Beneath the shadow of his hat, his face held a steadfast purity of purpose, almost innocence, it seemed, compared to the muddied turmoil of her own spirit. It is my blame. Thou art too good, she said wretchedly. Come back with me. Leave here, leave this corrupt place and come back now. Maddie stepped away from him, feeling her heartbeat quicken. She'd known she was sinking in this slew of worldliness and carnal love, how far, 
she had not realized until he offered his hand to pull her free. I've married him, she said uncertainly. An unbeliever. An ungodly man. Duchess. They called thee. Your grace. He made a grimace of disgust. Married. Oh, Archimedia, can thou name it that? How married? Not in the truth, in the light, with thy meeting's consent and thy father's. It is no marriage. Thou art no more than whore to him. A small sound escaped her as she pulled her shawl tight. Around herself and turned her face away. No, that was not justly said. He laid his hand on her arm. The shame is not thine. It belongs to me. I came back, and they had taken thee away. And every day and night, he said. Fiercely, I've scourged myself for leaving thee one hour, for one minute. I knew it unsafe. But my father wished it. Thy father. God forgive him if he wished such a thing. She half turned. Thou wrote it. That papa wished me to go with Jervox. I never wrote to thee any such nonsense, he said vehemently. Nor would have, even if I could have seen thy father, and he commanded me to do it. Even if, Maddie had the ends of her shawl gripped in her hands. But thou saw him. No. He was not there when I went, not at the hotel. I ought to have come back to thee instantly, but I waited late for him to, Richard. She brought the shawl up to her cheeks and pressed it there. She broke away suddenly, walking three paces from him. Tell me, she spoke, facing away, with desperate deliberation. Thou went to my father that day, and sent back a note, in the depth of the night, with instructions to me, to go. Wherever the duke's friends sent us to hide him. Richard's silence seemed to grow and grow, becoming a thundering in her ears. Maddie turned back to him. Tell me, didst thou write it? Slowly, he shook his head. She felt a weakness come over her. Her mind could not seem to get round the knowledge, but her body had already begun to tremble. Richard caught her hands. He's the devil! He exclaimed. Thou must come. Voices sounded from within the house, the nurserymen's and Durham's. The glass door opened and Jervalk stepped out, turning from the others behind him. The brief echo of cordial voices went silent except for Butterfield's blithe monologue. Adequate support for beds, and I have an idea of bringing up pipes and using steam from a boiler to heat the greenhouse. If your grace... His voice faded away as he seemed to realize no one was looking at him. Richard did not release her hands. He held them harder. Come with me now, Archimedia, he said, calm and steady. Come away. Jervalk strode toward them. Maddie had a sensation of terror. She tried frantically to speak, to disengage her hands, but she was too late. Jervalk's grabbed Richard, a grip that pushed him. In the opening space the duke's leather-gloved fist came up fast. Maddie flung herself forward to prevent it. In the power of his onslaught, Jervox's shoulder impacted her with a brutal jolt. It propelled her off her feet, Richard's hands jerked from hers. She heard his agonized cough and hit hard stone, a flash of hot black sensation in her head and arm. Her vision wavered. She lay stunned, curling up against the shock of pain. Jervox dropped on his knees beside her. Maddie! Maddie! He was muttering, leaning over her with such a look in his face that she managed to find her breath to speak. Don't. I'm all right. She tried to sit up. Calvin, he shouted, sliding his hand beneath her head. He bent down close to her. Still, still. Maddie hurt. Durham was there, and the nurseryman. Past Jervox's shoulder she saw Richard climb to his feet and stagger a lit eye. Durham steadied him and let go, leaning over Maddie. Damn it to hell, is she badly injured? No. Maddie tried again to push herself up, but her arm kept collapsing under her. No. 
Only, the wind knocked out of me. Calvin came running up. Doctor, Jervalk snapped. He put his arm around her shoulder, holding her against him. I don't need a doctor. She tried to pull away, but all her strength had left her. She could not seem to get her breath back. When she moved her arm, an excruciating spasm went from her wrist to her shoulder. A wave of nausea washed over her. In spite of herself, she had to rest back against Jervox's support. He stroked her forehead and put his face down next to hers. He didn't say anything, but in each breath there seemed to be. The half shape of a word, her name, and sorry, sorry, sorry. Richard? She tried to sit up a little more, with her weight on her other hand. Her voice came out all trembly. Art thou hurt? He came within her view. I'm well enough, he said tightly, but his face was white, and he held one arm across his midriff. Jervalks looked up at him. Gone, he said. See you again, horsewhip. Richard stood unmoving. I will not leave her alone with thee. Maddie felt the tightening in Jervalks's body. Your grace, Butterfield said, thrusting forward. My most profound apology for the unspeakable insolence of this man. I had no clue as to the revolting nature of his character, none whatsoever. From this moment, Richard Gill is no employee of mine, nor will he have a letter, from me or anyone else if I can help it. No, Maddie moaned. Please. She struggled, pulling free of Jervalks, holding her arm against herself. Her hip ached. She held out her uninjured hand to Durham, who bent instantly to help her. Sit down here, ma'am, he said. As Maddie hobbled to the garden bench between him and Jervalks, the chambermaid brought forward a vial of hartshorn. Thank thee, Maddie said gratefully. The pungent scent seemed to clear her head a little. She sat cradling her injured arm. Butterfield, she said, lifting her chin with what firmness? She could muster. I wish to have a greenhouse, the Duke has. Promised it to me, and I won't have it designed or supplied by anyone but Richard Gill. Richard said, I will not enter this house while thou remain here, Archimedia. She looked up at him, biting her lip against its quivering. Come with me, he said. No, Jervalk said. Richard ignored him. If thou can walk to the bench, thou can walk out of here. No. Jervalx took a step forward. The Quaker turned. And what wilt thou do to prevent her? Use a horsewhip? He spoke in his quiet voice, with nothing of malice in it, and yet the effect upon Jervalx was like a whiplash itself. He stood stock still. Then he set one shoulder to the wall. For an instant he was a casual picture a careless aristocrat, until he turned his face to it, leaning his forehead into the stone. Maddie closed her eyes. She would not cry. No, no, she would not. Come along, Gil. Butterfield's voice made a sharp little echo in the court, but she didn't open her eyes. Nothing moved. She kept her eyes squeezed shut. Gil! Butterfield snapped. Richard spoke her name firm and quiet. She knew it was the last time he would say it. A liar, a villain, a haughty, violent, reckless man of the world. He was growing worse instead of better. Richard was asking her to leave him, supplying a steadfast will to take the place of her own. But she couldn't move. Not the tiniest, least certain of moves could escape from her frozen frame. And she heard the sound of Richard's footsteps turning and walking away. Until the closing door went to silence, she did not open her eyes. When she looked up, the court was empty but for Jervalx, and Durham standing with his hand on the door. I think you ought to come inside, ma'am, and lie down. You tricked me, Maddie said. There was no message from Richard. My father never told me to stay with thee. Jervalx pushed away from the wall, with a bitter half-laugh. Bastard. Gil. It was my idea. 
Durham said quickly. I must take full blame, and beg your pardon, ma'am, from the bottom of my heart. It was bad, very bad. But, he was crimson to his hair. Do let us help you inside, where you may be comfortable. Maddie stood up. Her stomach still felt strange and weak. Her arms seemed made of India rubber. When she moved it past a certain angle, she sucked in her breath as agony shot through her. Maddie, Jervolk said, his voice harsh, as if he was angry with her. He put his arm around her waist with a gentleness that belied it, careful not to touch her injured limb. With the black dizziness threatening, she took the necessary steps quickly, passing through the door into the back parlor, where Durham hurried to throw a pillow on the sofa. A footman and a maid hovered inside, and Calvin came from the hall. I've sent for a physician. He had a lap robe and another pillow. Maddie, grimacing, let him adjust them around her. There, mistress, no need to sit up. Keep the arm quite still. Go away, Maddie said feebly. I'm all right. Calvin didn't take offense. Here are the salts, next to your hand. Go away, she said again. Everyone. Yes, mistress. Just call out when you want us. The butler withdrew with the other servants. Durham, bowing, followed them out with alacrity. Go away, Maddie said. Jervalks didn't move from his place. He stood with his hands locked behind his back, staring out at the barren garden court. Please, she said. He turned his head, as if he heard her. But he did not go. It was only a very bad sprain, the doctor said, and immobilized it in a sling. He had her moved into bed and put her to sleep with laudanum. During the examination on the couch in the back parlor, she had made no sound in spite of his manipulations until he'd asked her how it had happened. A fall on the stairs? He inquired cheerfully. Outside, she said in a dull voice. A stumble then? What was the cause? Maddie was silent. I did it, Christian thought and felt himself crumbling inside. A little spell of lightheadedness, perhaps? The physician was one Christian had never seen before, a benign, schoolmasterly sort. He seemed inclined to prod. Have you been feeling any faintness lately? I just fell, she said. You must try to be more careful of yourself, he said. I expect you haven't been married long? This kind of seemingly minor accident can sometimes have more serious consequences. I must appear to be a little indelicate, now, and ask if there is any chance that you may be with child? Oh God. Christian closed his eyes. Maddie didn't answer. The doctor peered over his glasses at Christian, brows lifted in a silent masculine inquiry. Christian gave a terse nod. The doctor patted her uninjured hand. I think we will move you into bed, young woman, and just keep a close eye on matters, in that case. He smiled. Here, here, don't start to weep now, my dear, after you got through all my poking and prodding so brave. I've seen nothing so far to cause us any. Concern. Nothing at all. Poor thing, you've been a Trojan, haven't you? Let's have you upstairs where you can go to sleep snugly. He marshaled Calvin and a footman to take her up. By the time the doctor came back down, Christian was pouring his third brandy. He turned around as the door opened. The physician came in and sat down unceremoniously with his bag, pulling out a notebook. The arm has suffered an uncomplicated wrench of the ligament. The bone doesn't appear to have been injured. It'll be mightily painful, but time and stability are the answers to that. He made a calculation and frowned over it. Then he looked up at Christian. Sit down, sir. Sit down. I want to talk to you. Would you describe your wife as of a nervous disposition? Christian sat down. He thought of Maddie, staunch Maddie girl. Not nervous. No. He shook his head. The present state of her emotions is not steady. 
Quite possibly it's the distress of the injury, although she bore the examination with the greatest fortitude. You'll forgive my directness. Lability of the emotions might also be an early sign of pregnancy, which concerns me with this fall. She was not forthcoming about either the fall or her menses. Were you present when she had the accident? Christian looked at the oriental carpet between his feet and nodded. Did she appear pale or in any way faint? He stood up, walking. Going nowhere, just walking the room. Sir, I'm a physician, the man said evenly. I realize these matters seem I did it. Christian stopped at the window, staring out. There was a short silence. You caused her to fall? He turned to the doctor. Yes. The man nodded slowly, without taking his eyes from Christian. I see. His face had grown more grim. You don't feel that any disequilibrium of hers contributed then? No, he said. She told me that you have only been married for a few weeks. Month. With what little information I could coax from her, I calculate that she's just barely late. I could wish this fall had not occurred at such a time. If she begins to bleed, we'll hardly know if we've lost something, or if she was barren, but I don't scruple to say, sir, my instinct as a physician tells me that you're a father. Christian took a deep drink of brandy. The doctor stood up. I'll look in this evening. I'm Beckett, by the way. Only just moved into the neighborhood last week. I'm afraid your man brought me along so quick that I didn't properly learn your name. Jervalx. He offered his hand. Well, Mr. Chervo. He gave Christian one merciless shake. I'm not going to mince words. I advise you to practice a more careful tenderness with your wife, and not cause her any more falls, sir. Maddie had never been an invalid in her life. She was angry at this doctor, who must make such a matter of it. He was even worse when he'd come back in the evening. He'd begun calling her, your grace, by then, clucking over her like a hen with one chick, chiding her for not taking the laudanum he'd left, for getting out of bed to sit up for any movement whatsoever, not to protect her arm, but to prevent this imminent tragedy he seemed convinced must occur. And to her great exasperation, she did begin to bleed in the night. She slept little, propped up against pillows to support her arm. Her unfortunate timing could not be hidden from the doctor when he arrived in the morning. He shook his head with a mournful regret, prescribing complete bed rest for three weeks. He didn't even inquire about her arm before he went out. Maddie pushed her feet from beneath the bedclothes. She held her aching arm against her in the sling, sitting up on the edge of the bed, her feet resting on the bed steps. Ignorant man! trying to make a tremendous fuss, so that he might up his fee over nothing more than a wrenched muscle. The bedchamber door opened. She saw Jervox's white ravaged face. It isn't true, she exclaimed. She gripped her injured arm to her. It's only what happens every month. Thou didst not cause it, dost thou hear me? Her voice had risen. For no reason at all, she began to weep watching his taut face blur until she couldn't see it. She shook her head fiercely and reached out her free hand. Christian, thou didst not cause it. He came. He took her hand and held it in both of his, staring down at it. She pulled away. Dost thou hear me? She swallowed tears and shook her head, over and over. It's too soon for him to know. I would feel differently. Thou didst not make it happen. He didn't look up at her. He stood by the bed, unmoving. She took an indignant breath. It is all stuff and nonsense. Thou ought not to pay him for anything more than putting me. Up in the sling. His lashes lifted. For a long moment he scanned her face and then he turned away and leaned against one of the white pillars near the foot of the bed, staring out the far window. I, 
The muscles in his jaw clenched. He tilted his face up to the ceiling, pushing air harshly through his teeth. He shook his head. She couldn't look at him. She sniffed and wiped hard at her eyes, unable to stop the absurd tears. Leave, he said suddenly. What? He was watching her with intense question. I can't leave, she said dully. We're married. Thou canst not be alone. I have to stay with thee. Want to leave? My arm hurts. I wish to sleep. Gil? He said through his teeth. Gil? The tears just kept coming. She gave a resentful sob. At least he is a decent man. Not a liar or a spendthrift or a savage. Jervalx put his arm around the column, holding onto it. He gave a short, ugly laugh. Savage idiot. She was glad that her arm hurt so badly that she could not. Reach out to him in response to the bitter penitence in his face. She was horrified at herself. She should have left with Richard, but she had just sat there, frozen, as if someone else were going to make the decision for her. He doesn't go about hitting people anyway, she snapped. He doesn't give preposterous balls for five hundred guests. He's a pious mule. You would never go with him. I wish thou wouldst leave me alone. You would never go with him, he said more strongly. Go away, Quaker, tiresome, holy mule. What dost thou know of it? she cried. He is a better man than thee. What dost thou know of good and right? I know you, he said. She fell back on the pillow and curled up around her aching arm, hiding her face from him. Leave me alone, she sobbed. Go away and leave me alone. Chapter 32 Without making an issue of it by stealing off and locking doors, Christian moved Brunei's writing machine into the game room and began to take occasion to polish his play. After a week Maddie was already up and about the house, against the doctor's orders, but even females inclined to deprecate the vice of idleness, Christian suspected, would not find much to interest them in a game of billiards. The first time, he'd actually played a ball or two, attempting a few strokes before he gave it up, depressed. Another pleasure forfeit to his mazy brain, his fine true table and favorite ivory-handled cue were no remedy for losing the pocket when he focused on the ball. That sensation of something there and not there, odd and scary, and not overly beneficial to one's aim. He sighed and scattered balls, laying the cue across the cloth. Pushing back the spirit decanters on the buffet, he'd set up his writing machine out of sight of the door if it should open. Aby, it appeared, was determined to create the maximum. Amount of difficulty without inconveniencing herself. No, she would not accept any sort of trust for the child. She knew all about that sort of thing, and detested having Friday-faced solicitors always in her house picking at her private concerns. Yes, she certainly would send the babe right back to Scotland if it pleased her. No, she did not like the idea of a discreet arrangement with the Sutherlands to safeguard the child's welfare. Why, she wrote plaintively, could he not just send the money directly to her? She was like to think he did not trust her. He didn't. His sympathy for her had vanished in this donkey's performance. Wounded her he might have done, but she'd known the rules of the game as well as he. No one had forced her to play. He didn't pursue this unpleasantness for her sake. Something strange and painful had happened to him. You're a father, the doctor had said, and Maddie had reached out her hand and wept and by no logical sequence of thought that he could identify, Christian had come to a grim determination to do right by this unseen and unwanted daughter of his own. It was a delicate matter. He had nothing really to offer but financial support, and at the moment not even that in any significant amount. His income was strained to the limit against far more immediate problems, and he was already forwarding a sum weekly out of cash household expenses and wages for a wet nurse that Aidy had complained she couldn't afford. 
One presumed that ladies of her station couldn't be expected to take the economical way out of that, he thought cynically. But it wasn't an infant's nominal keep that occupied him. The sort of long-term commitment that he envisioned, nurse, governess, schooling, a season and a substantial dowry, required. Arrangements outside of all previous settlements that encumbered his estate, a secure and concealed source of income that couldn't be rooted out by his family should he chance to hop the perch untimely. There was the rub. Nothing he had now would answer the purpose, and he had yet to be able to finance fresh undertakings, not with whispers of the competency hearing spreading around him like ripples round a pond. And if he dared to wait until after, if he lost, there would be an end of it, if he lost. He stared at the writing machine. He was safe, for as long as he could command his bank account. He'd heard the growing panic under the censure in Maddie's voice and understood better than she that he gambled with gunpowder. Every penny he spent now told against him in chancery if it came to that, and told against her too. He tried to live in the moment, to keep feeling what it felt to be here and now, at liberty, alive. He was not what he'd been. Sometimes the losses caught him like an unexpected slap across the face, small things stinging as hard as the bigger ones. The defiance of his bankers made him angry, the confused wobble of. A billiards ball made him want to weep. Durham said he was getting better. Christian held on to that like a lifeline, and at the same time didn't trust it. Better, yes. Good enough, he did not know. The standing up, the test, knowing that everything, everything, counted on his erratic wit, God. At any odds, the price of failure was too high. He didn't intend to wager on his own flawed mind. He didn't intend to submit to any hearing. Everything he did, his calls, the opera, his purchases, the heady amount of cash he'd managed to gather by a calculated. Rearrangement of his loan payments, it all culminated in the ball. The ball that was to introduce his duchess to society. And what was more, make him safe from the mad place for good. But preparing for it was almost more than he could manage alone. Writing and reading, tickets for wallpaper, caterers' bills, cases of champagne and his account balance in daily fluctuation, available cash pushed to the limit, trying to keep it all in his head because he couldn't trust it to notes, his wretched woolly head that went clear and then foggy, chasing after words and intentions that slipped away and left him lost. Claiming stubborn ignorance of such worldly depravities as balls, Maddie had refused to help with any of it but the loan payments, and Christian had paid all of those that he intended to pay. He could not spare more, another point of discord between them. Her injury had forced him to postpone the event a fortnight. Beyond his intended date, there was no objective disadvantage. To that as far as he could reckon, it merely made the theme something more of Christmas than before, and the strain of anticipation two weeks more tense. He used Durham to spread. Word of Maddie's accident to excuse Christian's minimal appearances in public. He went back to the opera twice, once alone, once with Durham and Fane, and made a few more calls with them in circumstances that he knew would not require much conversation. He carefully controlled his exposure and so far it had seemed a success. Durham was confounded by it. He came to sit down at breakfast with Christian and Maddie while he regaled them with the latest. It's extraordinary, he said, bringing Maddie more tea from the urn on the sideboard. I mean to say, you'd think the man was Lord Byron warmed over, only for standing there looking intense and keeping his mouth shut. He arranged her cup for her. Milk, my darling? Yes, thank thee. Thou ought not to call me that. Durham and Fane had begun a battle of endearments over Maddie, having survived her gentle censure for the incident of the fake letter. Christian bore the brunt of her reproach, an injustice, he thought sullenly, if she knew how little he remembered of the ruse. That night of their escape was an incoherent jumble to him. Durham had masterminded all the details— but it was only Christian that she called a liar to his face. But then, everything seemed to be his fault these days. 
according to Miss the Thou Pinch Penny Archimedia Timms. You'll have to keep a sharp watch on the ladies with this fellow, Durham advised her, disposing himself at his ease in a chair. Will I? she asked, looking down at her tea. Her fingers moved restlessly, smoothing over and over the porcelain handle. Christian watched them, tried to memorize them. If he lost, if they sent him back, she wouldn't be there. The females seemed to love it. Durham shook his head. A look of torrid mystery, rumors of a dangerous tendency to become wild under a full moon, a simple yes or no in answer. To everything, Lord, I intend to give it a try myself. They'll be swooning at my feet. God knows they're swooning at his. What do you think? Fane came in and stopped dead. What's wrong with him? Durham abandoned his sultry pose. I'm practicing pent-up passion. Well, don't. The colonel bent over Maddie and lifted her hand. How do you do this morning, angel? Thou shouldst not call me so, she said, which was what she always said. I am much better. I can move my fingers with no hurt at all, and I slept last night without the sling. Fane listened to this report gravely. In high gig then. Will you come driving with me in the park? After the ball, Christian said. Spoiler, Fane grumbled. A veritable curmudgeon, Durham said. Rot me, there's nothing worse than a jealous husband. Christian made the appropriate dry smile, but he was jealous, though he'd have choked on it before he'd admit it to. His friends. He was jealous of their ease with her, jealous of the simple way they could kiss her fingers, touch her, something he had not done since that moment when she'd sat on the edge of his bed, bound up and hurting by his own hand. And he was madly jealous of Richard Gill, a phantom presence between them. Christian had swallowed all his rage and pride and summoned the nurseryman Butterfield to make certain he didn't dismiss his pious mule of an employee blaming the incident on that universal and transparent case, the unfortunate misunderstanding. Christian had done that for Maddie, and made certain that she knew about it, expecting the reward he surely thought he deserved for the bitter pill it was, to leave the mule unpunished for openly trying to seduce Christian's wife into leaving him in his own back garden. It had been his first conscious foray into being a better man, and all it had garnered him was a modest, Thou didst right then. Christian set his teeth together. He didn't think he liked being a better man. He thought that if he couldn't banish the hallowed specter of Richard Gill soon, he was going to take a rapid turn for the worse. Jervalks had selected the fabric and design for her ball gown. Maddie had known perfectly well that she must have one, but in a perverse reaction to the curl of inward pleasure she experienced at the idea of a special gown and in full accord with the trepidation she felt about the ball itself, she had met. With the couturier only with the greatest reluctance, and had. Refused to give any opinion at all as to what she liked of material or pattern. That hadn't appeared to concern Jervalks. He attended the session in the back parlor, examining fashion plates and dolls as if he were a master of it. Maddie secretly inclined toward the vivid, Peacocky colors of a green silk trimmed in purple, as pretty as an exotic flower and just as opulent, shone in the picture with three rows of flounces at the hem, puffed sleeves and a trailing boa in transparent purple, but of course she would never have said so. She couldn't imagine herself wearing it in any case, but she thought it very taking. The modiste was clever enough to push that particular plate back into view several times offering samples of possible fabrics, but Jervalks didn't even glance at them. He'd held a scrap of colorless material in his hand, sifting through the plates impatiently until he got to the bottom of the stack and sat back. The French madam returned to the purple and green combination, holding it up to Maddie's face, making a small frown and shaking her head. No, she'd said. It will not do. It will swallow her up whole. Maddie held herself aloof. She was not disappointed. Her days alone in bed, protected by her injury from his lures and temptations, had given her time to meditate on her weakness. 
She had erased all that part of herself, the part that turned to color and idle mirth into him. Jervox picked up one of the fashion dolls, turning it over in his hand. Suddenly he reached for a pair of scissors and began. Snipping at the trim, ignoring the modiste's feint. Oh. The. Ruffles fell away until the gown that was left seemed as simple as plain dress, except for the wide, low scoop of neckline. The original design had had a broad trim of lace to border it. Jervox cut that away in the center, leaving only a sort of lace shawl over the full sleeves. He laid the drab scrap of cloth on the doll and handed it to the couturier. She examined it for a moment, looking up at Mattie with narrowed eyes. Then she pursed her lips and lifted her brows. If it is what you wish, she said. Jervox only nodded and left Mattie to be measured. That had been when her arm was still completely immobile, and an awkward, painful process it was. Now that her injury allowed more freedom of motion, Jervox had informed her at breakfast. The modiste required another fitting. Maddie reluctantly presented herself at the appointed time. The bland fabric that he'd chosen had extinguished her one pleasure in the gown. All it was now was a concrete reminder of his uncontrollable intemperance and the approaching trial of the ball. The assistant helped her out of her day dress, as her arm was still far too sore to be very useful. With a mutter of disapproval, the modiste unbuttoned Maddie's corset and chemise. It is too high to the neck, it will show. Before Maddie realized what the woman was about, she had stripped the undergarments down to Maddie's waist. Maddie sucked in her breath and crossed her arms over her. Breasts, and of all moments, Jervox chose that one to walk. Into the room. He glanced at her, meeting Maddie's horrified gaze without a flicker of reaction. While they tied the bustle, he sat down in a chair, relaxed, like a detached connoisseur in watching women dress. The gown came down over her head. She hadn't expected it. She'd been caught up in her mortification at his entry and the pain the quick movement to cover herself had caused. Maddie made a little whimper as the assistant caught her hand, trying to bring up the sleeves. Careful, Jervalk said sharply, and the modiste and assistant murmured profuse apologies. They began to work with more gentleness, allowing Maddie to adjust her arm in stages to get it through the sleeve. This required that she stand quite exposed before Jervalk's and he didn't have the decency to avert his eyes for an instant. By the time the gown was adjusted, she felt hot all over with embarrassment. The assistant held the gown together in the back, pinning it very tight, since she had no corset. Your arm down, madam, if you please to try it, the modiste requested. Maddie opened her elbow in increments, biting her lower lip. Jervalk bent his head a little, resting his mouth on the back of his hand looking down for the first time. Ah. The modiste stood back. She had a slight, acerbic curl to her mouth. I see what you are about, your grace. Jervalks lifted his eyes. He looked at Maddie from hem to. Head, a slow appraisal that brought blood brimming to her cheeks. He nodded. The assistant hustled to carry the cheval glass around in front of Maddie and she saw herself for the first time. She was shocked. The drab scrap of fabric, the fine, stiff, scratchy material that poked and abraded her bare skin, in the glass it shimmered with color like a faint prism, metallic threads. Interwoven with silk to make a silver tissue that caught the light and held it, transparent flame. The plain cut of the dress, with no frills, only the half-shawl of Venetian lace, drew the eye instantly to the neckline that dropped off her shoulders and swept low across her breasts, voluptuous and yet stark. The sleeves echoed her simple dresses, stopping just above her elbows, but full and glittering, radiating light. It was blasphemous, a deliberate transformation of plain dress into sparkling provocative luxury. I cannot wear this! she exclaimed. Madam, the modiste said quietly. It is magnificent. Maddie looked at Jervalks. I cannot. Thou must know. 
He smiled, saying nothing, that maddening perceptive smile, as if he knew her better than she knew herself. I cannot. The modiste bent to shake out a fold of the skirt. If it does not please madame, then I will take it back. I think of a half dozen clients now who will, not back, Jervalk said. She wears it. He reached beneath his coat and brought out a box of a sort that was becoming all too familiar to Maddie. Oh, no, she said, eyeing the jeweler's case. I don't want it. I don't want these ornaments. Canst thou not understand that? Jervalk stood. He opened the case, and Maddie gave a moan of dismay. The modiste and her assistant were not so ungenerous. They inhaled an unfeigned wonder at the sight of the flashing tiara with three stones the size of wren's eggs, holding all the color Maddie had secretly wished for, a green blaze of emeralds framed by curling vines of amethysts, pearls and diamonds. Maddie had begun to learn something about money and what it might buy, and this, she knew instantly, was no casual gift of a pearl chain, or even an orangery. This was something that would ransom princes and adorn queens, the size of the stones alone a declaration of sovereignty. She stepped back as he lifted it to place it in her hair. Where didst thou come by this? She had a hope that it was a family piece, some ducal heirloom that he meant his duchess to wear on her debut, but he only said, Bought. Think I stole it? Jervox, she cried. More? When thou art. A warning in his sideways glance stopped her. She gave another whimper as he slid the silver comb beneath her coiled braids. Why, why, why? She moaned. Thou must know I. Despise such things. Where is thy sense? A small purchase, he said. Small. Oh, thou art infamous. When thou ought to be paying. He put his forefinger against her lips, smoothing them in a sensual touch. She jerked her face away. She couldn't let him touch her, couldn't give in to the rush of love and yearning, the sensation he aroused so instantly. He lowered his lashes, withdrawing. Perhaps you don't like. His voice had taken on an undertone of cold mocking command. But you will show grace to his majesty. She stood motionless. To whom? He moved back and sat down in the chair stretching out his legs. He observed her with a critical eye, then turned to the modiste. Your opinion? The woman surveyed Maddie with professional acumen. Unusual, your grace. She nodded slowly. Memorable. The king? Maddie asked in a small voice. Dost thou speak of the king? He held out his hand and the modiste hurried forward to take the tiara from Maddie's hair and convey it to him reverently. The jewels disappeared again into the box. The duke went to the chamber door. Jervox, Maddie said tremulously. Dost thou mean to? Say, the king is coming to thy ball? He looked back at her and shrugged. Perhaps, he said. The door closed behind him. Curl chance. The modiste clapped her hands together. Oh, madam, she breathed. It is the coup de main. His majesty comes to your debut. From Christian's single planted hint the talk spread. He did not risk any further appearances in public. He let Durham and Fane act his point guard, bringing back reports of what was said by whom. God only knew if he'd cut his own throat by making this final stake. It had taken all the cash he could lay hands on. Exhausted his liquid income, drained dry his account at whores, provoked another visit from Mr. Manning and friends that had been barred at the door by Calvin and a set of footmen carefully selected for their formidable size and robust constitutions. Per old King George had been discreetly peddling the tiara, a bauble once given by Bonaparte to the Empress Marie-Louise, at the outrageous price of fifty thousand pounds for years. There's been no takers. His Majesty's royal one wasn't trustworthy enough in political matters to make it worth the cost, but Christian had paid it, 
reckoning that with the completion of the Brighton Pavilion giving way to a princely passion for creating gothic glories at Windsor, an infusion of hard cash, instead of another tiresome creditor, would be powerfully welcome to the king. Acceptances for the ball had already been copious enough, but the prospect, the great question, of his majesty's appearance had the effect of stirring a hornet's nest. Ridiculous. The king might be, fat and gouty, ever more secluded, a target of easy scorn, but let it chance that the monarch might condescend to attend a social gathering, Christian thought dryly, and the old beguiling perfume of royalty turned out to be more than a fading whiff. It was power. If he managed to anoint himself with that influential cachet, then his brothers-in-law would find themselves members of the wrong club entirely. To publicly insist in the courts that his majesty chose to honor idiots, and madmen with his friendship was to go beyond the pale. Against The king's indulgence, pushing forward a hearing into Christian's reason became a gaff of grandiose proportions. George could stop them with a word, if he cared to utter it. The betting book was open at White's, and Durham claimed that he'd witnessed a debate at Brooks's of three hours' duration. Jervalk's stubbornly progressive politics, anathema to the king, versus the still amazing fact that back in 20, Christian had gone dead against his party and public opinion, supporting George's attempt to rid himself of his sordid queen when even the Tory peers had slunk away. As it happened, Christian had taken that particular position on a bet that he could do it and still walk into Whitehall without being pelted with rotten eggs, which he'd lost but nobody beyond he and Fane and Durham were privy to that. And half in spite of himself, Christian had always liked George. It required a private acquaintance to see the sincerity, the good heart and clever humor beneath the self-indulgence. The man inside the sad shell he'd become. He'd a child's temper and a talent for extravagance, no restraint and no judgment but he transformed the face of London with his elegant taste, and dispensed old-age pensions to such diverse personages as Coleridge the poet and Phoebe Hessel the woman soldier. He kept his ministers pouring through the criminal lists to find condemned prisoners who had no other advocate in order to consider their cases for mercy himself. He donated his library, after the Emperor of Russia had offered him a hundred thousand pounds for it, to the nation. George had his moments. Christian just hoped to the devil he was going to be one of them. Even with Calvin and the new secretary to do the footwork, he was nearly spent by the end of each day with the effort of the preparations, tired and angry and lonely when he faced the dressing room and single bed. He and Maddie didn't speak at all now. He couldn't put a moment to when it had happened. A slow barrier of silence had just seemed to grow between them as her arm healed and the ball drew closer. Durham and Fane made breakfast conversation, and at midday Christian took a tray in the library with his work. Dinner was agony, alone at the table with her. He fell to solving mathematical equations in his head, to give him something to do besides watch her pick at her food like a caged and unhappy bird. He was losing her. She was deliberately going away. Her body was here, but his maddy girl, who laughed at foolish jokes who looked up at him beneath sultry lashes, she was disappearing before his eyes, transforming into this ghastly severe gray ghost creature. He never touched her. He never tried. At first it had been because he'd not wanted to hurt her again, but as she'd healed the stiffness had grown in her. She moved away when he came. Near. She paralyzed him into a frozen courtesy. He would not be a savage. Instead he worked, and tried to savor the transitory moments of autonomy, and longed for just an hour of no. Words, no future, nothing but her body and his own in raw and primitive communion. By the morning of the ball, Durham reported that word the king was dropsical had sent the odds at Brooks's to seventy to one. Christian tried not to think about it. He wasn't certain Maddie was going to hold up on him. She looked almost ill at breakfast, picking at her food while Christian and the secretary went over details. Gown? He asked her. 
Here in fits? Yes, she said, staring at her buttered eggs as if they spelled out D-O-M in large letters. Gloves? Yes, I have the gloves. He tilted his head. Your arm hurts? She stirred the eggs with a broad knife. No. It's all right. Maddie, he wanted to plead, don't do this to me. I need you. Now. But it was impossible. The constraint between them had. Reached incurable proportions. She left him at an utter loss. He could not touch her. He could not depend on her. He had himself only to get through it. She lifted her head suddenly. Jervox, she said, with the air of having taken an irrevocable decision. He closed his hands hard and looked up at her. Thou ought to understand that I cannot curtsy nor give vain flattering titles to the king, she declared. She flung a look toward him, as if she expected a battle, and then, shying from it, pushed her chair back and bolted from the room. Oh, excellent, Christian thought, dropping his head back on the chair. I'm looking forward to it. Supper would be served at midnight in the dining room. Christian intended to place a quartet of musicians on the library gallery for the card players. He'd had the blue salon cleared for dancing and the real orchestra. Some of the best furniture from the salon had been moved to the back parlor on the ground floor. That room was unrecognizable now, after the refitting, transformed from the most casual to the most magnificent chamber in the house in a scheme of pure white and gold, expanded with mirrors, accented with a vivid red and blue rug, and porcelain dragons writhing up the tall pair of candelabra standing to either side of the new crimson sofa. That sofa appeared ominously empty when Christian made his inspection. The whole room looked precisely what it was, a shameless grovel to a king who couldn't climb the stairs. Therefore bring the ball to him. There was a chair for his. Mistress Lady Coningham and accommodation for the favored doctor. Night and space enough for anyone his majesty wished to. Honor by calling them down from upstairs, and another set of musicians who would wait in the adjacent breakfast alcove until, if, his majesty appeared, at which time they would play Italian airs. Christian leaned on the doorpost. Behind him, a footman made a polite cough. Christian turned. He accepted the note offered, hiding the further sinking of his mood as he recognized the telltale wafer. With a sigh, he walked across the hall to the billiards room, poured himself an early cognac, and broke the seal. Your Grace, A.D. wrote, intending a pointed sarcasm, he supposed, I have received in the post an honorable offer of matrimony from Mr. Nidigate of Bombay. In view of his steady devotion tomes since before my marriage, his substantial prosperity and the generosity of his proposals, and me understanding that I can no longer expect worthy treatment from those of whom I deserve better, better, being underlined three times, I am inclined to accept him. Therefore I will be parting for Calais directly. Mr. Nuttigate kindly forwards sufficient funds for my own travel, however he is not aware of a package which I must perforce leave behind me as I am, completely without means to convey it to Scotland, as you have, indicated your keen interest in this parcel, I leave to you how it may best be disposed. I do hope your little Quaker nurse does not prove a horrid embarrassment to you at your party, my dear. Your sister tells me that you are not well, I wonder that you have undertaken to entertain at all. Do you think it quite wise? The pert tone of this missive made him set his teeth. Well enough if Aidy had dug up a nabob for herself, but he had no time for it now. He'd have to make the arrangements to return the babe to Scotland himself, as it was obvious Aidy would not lift her finger. At least she didn't seem inclined to drag the child. Off to India, clearly the nabob wasn't to be imposed upon by any such tedious details as deep mourning or infants. He set up the writing machine, but scrawled only a brief reply, watching the copying pen for mistakes. It was so short he could hardly botch it even the first time. He pulled the sheet free and dispatched it. Chapter 33 Maddie was standing in a robe, 
staring listlessly out the window of the spare bedroom where she was to dress when she saw the hackney draw up before the front steps. As the cab's door opened, she sucked in a horrified breath at the sight of a friend's hat and dark coat. The maid was already laying out the silver gown. Maddie hastened back from the window, slamming the shutters. Quick, something. Her day dress had been left downstairs. Help me put it on. She snatched up the ball gown and thrust it at the startled maid. A minute later, barely buttoned and hooked, Maddie was rushing down the stairs. She reached the hall just as a harried footman laid aside a tray of glasses to answer the bell. It will be for me, she said, desperate to think of somewhere to hide him. Why, oh, why had Richard come now of all times? The back parlor was impossible, the breakfast room full of Italian musicians, Calvin's. Buttery stalked to the ceiling with crates of champagne. She thrust open the door of the billiards room. Show him in here. She stepped through and closed herself in. There was a murmur in the vestibule, and then the footman held open the door. Mr. and Mrs. Little, Mr. Bond, Mr. Osborne. Maddie had a moment of strange suspension. It was not Richard. She stood facing the elders of her own meeting, with her heart withering in her breast. The footman closed the door. Maddie's lips parted, but no sound came out. Our comedia, Tims, said Elias Little. We are come in concern to see thee here in the house of an unbeliever. The other three stood somber, looking at her in the silver ball gown that mocked plain dress. Elias spoke quietly. We ask thee, hast thou wedded this man? She had known this would happen, that they would come to tell her, but she had not known how it would feel. She had not known what it would be to face them, these people she had loved, who had been as good as family to her. Constance Little was already weeping, silently, her hands twisting in her apron. Maddie blinked. She turned her face away. Wordlessly, she nodded. Oh, Maddie, Constance said in a whisper. It was as if they had not quite been able to believe it before. Elias glanced around the rich leather and gilt appointments of the room. He gazed at the billiards table, his kind face furrowed. With distress. It is a real sorrow to friends he said, in his great soft voice that she had heard roll out so often on first day. The meeting has directed us to visit thee, and bring thee to a sense of thy wrong. According to the good order of truth, a friend ought not to be unequally yoked to one of the world, nor make a motion toward marriage without the consent and approval of meeting. Elias held out his hand, touching her wrist, speaking more gently. Our comedia, these are not aimless regulations, but— Protection for thee, that thou dost not run into the enemy's snare. A young person may be hasty, and mistaken in the way, and therefore the matter is brought before meeting and declared unto friends, who are able in the wisdom and power of God to see into it, whether it is in the light. Dost thou understand this as the truth? She swallowed. Yes. Oh, yes. She understood. And yet thou wast not governed by it. Thou took not counsel of the Lord, nor of friends, but only thy own willful way. She half opened her mouth, and then pressed her lips closed. She did not speak. Understanding this, thou wilt know why we are come. Maddie made a small sound of misery. She turned her back on them. There was a faint rustle of paper. Elias cleared his throat. Archimedia Tims, because thou hast from a child been used to go with thy father to meetings, and taken the outward character of our profession, bearing the name of Quaker, and because thou hast run out from the truth and married a man of the world, a necessity lies upon us to give forth this testimony against thee, that thou art not at all. There his deep, soft voice faltered, not at all owned as one in fellowship with us. The tears began to fall, dripping down in hot salty grief to Maddie's chin. Elias took a deep breath. Furthermore, because it be well known to many that thou hast had the name and appearance of. A friend, 
an art reputed by the world's people a Quaker, for the safety and honor of the society, we direct thee to publicly clear truth by drawing up a paper making it known that thy unequal marriage was not taught nor countenanced by friends, and to copy it three times, and deliver said copies one to meeting, to be read out, one to him called the minister who performed the marriage, and one to the newspapers, in order that thou may not under the name of Quaker deceive the world. Maddie closed her eyes. The newspapers. It was because of Jervolks, because he was a duke and so everyone must know. She put her fingers up and wiped her eyes, turning quickly. Let me do it now, then. If she waited, if she stopped and thought, she was afraid she would not have the courage. She cast a wild look around the room, turning from Constance's tears. There, the duke's writing machine. She pulled open the little drawer on the closed box and found pen and ink. There was no paper. She opened out the box and caught the pieces that fluttered free. The topmost was already used, scrawled send the parcel to me in Jervox's imperfect handwriting. Maddie scratched through that so hard that the tip of the pen broke. Archimedia, said Elias. Thou ought not to write in an immoderate spirit. Thy words must be acceptable to meeting. Maddie dropped the pen. She sat down on a bench. I should not have done it. Her face wrinkled up. She could not keep control of tears, or the low morning note in her throat. I want to go back. She rocked, weeping, and looked up. Oh, Constance, I want to go home. Can I go home any more? Constance rushed to her, taking her hands, kneeling. Maddie, dost thou wish to come back? Thou canst come to me. Clear truth, and come and live in the light. Maddie looked up past her toward Elias in a wild and sudden hope. Thou knowest that we bar no one from meeting, Archimedia, he said. But thou canst not manifest the appearance of a friend and be wed to this man of the world. We could not be easy in such a thing. But I could come back. I cannot speak for meeting, Elias said. We're only given to say that the paper must be written. She bowed her head. Yes. Yes, I'll. The door to the billiards room opened suddenly. Maddie jerked upright, clutching Constance's hands. Jervalk stopped, with a look of blank startlement. He seemed slow to retrieve his focus. For a long moment he just gazed at Elias Little. Then he found Maddie. He looked at her hands locked with Constance's and the scatter of paper on the sideboard. A wariness came into his face. Maddie slowly let go of a breath as she realized he was not going to explode. She disengaged her hands from Constance's. Jervalks, she said lifting her chin. These are friends who have come to speak to me. He said nothing, only stood there with that guarded look. This is my husband, Maddie said quietly. He was dressed in formal coat and black breeches, his shirt front all lace with an emerald pin glittering in the folds, tall and still, not a little satanic in his looks, the model of a carnal pleasure-seeking man. Speak what? he asked, with a hint of challenge. We come to testify that our comedia is no longer in our fellowship, Elias said somberly, because she has gone out of the truth and wed herself to thee. Jervox looked to Maddie's tear-stained face and back at Elias. You cause to cry. It is a heavy thing that we do. The duke surprised Maddie. Instead of erupting into a temper he only said, Finish? The elder nodded. We have said what we were directed to say. Jervalk stood back and held open the door. Constance turned. She gave Maddie a quick hug. Come to us, she murmured before she hurried past the duke out of the room. The others followed more slowly. None of them looked back or said anything. Maddie was left in place, facing him. He walked to the sideboard, gathering up the broken pen and papers. He collected it all and put it away, closing the box. Crushing the sheet that she'd scratched over, he looked up at her sideways. 
Not sorry. Matty, he said with cool defiance. You weep, but I am not sorry. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk at dusk, he looked down from the library window and saw her in the empty court, kneeling near the wall, her head bowed, as if she were praying. He made a wordless mutter toward his secretary and left the room. In the garden court, he found her on her knees in the biting cold, dressed in her old drab Quaker clothes, pulling at tiny weeds along the base of the wall with her fingernails. Maddie, he said, brought up short in his irritation, confounded by this strange task. What are you doing? She sat back on her heels and looked up at him briefly, then went back to her meticulous weeding. I wish to make myself useful in some way. He stood watching her. Not now. You dress. Don't have to, useful. She bent closer to the ground, digging at mortar with her bare fingers. Don't, he said sharply, disliking to see her at such work. Thou dost not permit it? No. Maddie, she rose, and sat down on the iron bench, looking at her lap. What's wrong? What's wrong? But he was loath to know. I would like something to do, she said, her breath frosting as she spoke. I'm not accustomed to idleness. The ball. Oh, yes, she said lightly. Hast thou made a note in thy accounts? One duchess, in ball gown, to be stood at the top of the stairs to receive. She shook her head. I am no duchess. I won't belong there. Maddie. He reached out to touch her, but she suddenly stood up and walked away. I don't belong here, she said, facing away from him. Need you. Maddie. If you want something, task the ball. I know nothing of that. Her voice was resentful but subdued, half lost as she continued to look down. Thou hast thy secretary. Thou dost not need me. She picked at the edge of her sling. Her voice broke upward. Thou dost not need me. He gazed at her, holding himself in check. What do you want, instead? She bent her head a little, not answering. Quaker? He asked softly. Gil? I don't want to forget what I am, she said with a strange intensity. I don't want to. His body tautened. He opened and closed his fist. My. Wife. I need now, tonight, stand with me. Tonight, she said in scorn. There are other things in the world besides thy frivolous ball. There are other things besides making thyself the great duke again. His control was cracking. He breathed softly through his teeth. Where's your dress? I'm not going to attend, she said. She lifted a finger in dismissal. It's a creaturely amusement. Amusement? He uttered viciously. Think I do it, for amusement? He caught her arm, thrust her back to face him. What happens when I'm not the duke? He gripped her hard. What happens to you? I'm there again? Shaking her, he shouted. Lunadic! Lunadic, Maddie! Suppose you can stop. You can't. I can't. King! The king can stop, if he will. With a low violent sound, he let her go. Never go back. I will not lose you. Lose all. I will be the duke. He pushed away, turned and left her in the vacant court. At the door, he stopped and looked back. Save us. That's what I do, Tiara, King, frivolous ball. Save us. He jerked his head toward the house. You want. Useful. All right. Useful. One duchess. Receive. Silver dress. Understand? She was gazing at him, unmoving as if he were someone. She'd never seen before. He glared back at her. She moistened her lips. It is to save thee? She repeated. Both. You and me. Go dress. He snapped 
and slammed the door. At the top of the staircase, in a hall that smelled of evergreen and ladies' perfume, so full of noise that the wall of sound seemed tangible, Christian shook hands. There was no need to speak, no one could possibly hear what he said. A. Eh? Footmen at the base of the stairs bowled the names of the guests as they mounted the step, but no one could hear him, either. Maddie stood beside him, the tiara flashing green fire every time she moved her head. She had come back to life, his Maddie girl, serious still, but sometimes she gave him a look beneath her lashes, an anxious question, as if to ask if they were succeeding at what they did. He could tell that her injured arm hurt her. She held it against herself trying surreptitiously to support it, no doubt as aware as he that every moment she was under the scrutiny of endless eyes. Christian waited until a brief pause, a distraction produced by a lady catching her hem on the stairs below. He took Maddie's elbow and steered her away from the hall where they'd been posted for an hour, and into the blue salon. The press of guests cleared magically at their passage, moving back from the center of the room where the rugs had been taken up obviously expecting him and Maddie to open the ball. But he could not, not until the king arrived. Christian passed right by the waiting orchestra and began a circuit of the rooms. He'd found that the social commonplaces were easy, so ingrained in him that he could speak them without hesitation, like the words to an old song too familiar to have meaning anymore. The noise helped. In the library the quartet was barely audible above the talk. He didn't stop anywhere longer than it took to pause and accept mechanical congratulations, enduring. The curiosity and exchanges of looks that he knew trailed behind them. It was just one more gamble, waiting to begin the dancing. Every minute beyond midnight made it more obvious. Till half past, he reckoned, he could wait that long. If his majesty hadn't arrived by then, he'd put all his blunt on a losing card. At least his brothers-in-law weren't here to see it in person. He'd invited his family, but of course they had not come, nor acknowledged it. Not with Maddie in his house, not with their attorneys trying to have him stripped to nothing. She walked beside him, a silver galatea, life turned to sculpture instead of the other way round. She did a strange thing with her grave reserve, she embarrassed them. Christian could see it. They had come to sneer at her, that one night at the opera and the rumor mill had done its work fortune hunter, Quakeress, elevated demi-mundane. One could only guess, and she didn't give them a clue. He came across Fane near the end of the circuit, and caught. Him away from the army coterie, drawing him into the open dressing room where flowers and a few chairs made a quiet but public nook amid the slow current of guests. Rest. He handed Maddie into an armchair. She clung to him a moment, her only sign of dismay, but he bowed. A glass, he promised. Fane will stay. Honored to do so, Fane said instantly. Christian went to dispatch a footman to them, and check for any word of the king. Your monstrous comely tonight, my love, Colonel Fane said, bowing to Maddie. A couple stopped beside them. Indeed. A rara avis, the man agreed, sweeping a bow. Your gown is so unusual, Duchess, his partner said, in a tone that might be a compliment or an insult. Is it Devi? Devi? Maddie repeated. The woman gave her a patronizing smile. Madame Devi. In Grosvenor Square. She fanned herself with a spread of feathers. This is such an interesting new idea, to put back the dancing. How late it seems. Is it after midnight yet? The colonel dug in a pocket beneath his brilliant scarlet coat. He dug deeper, frowning a little. Twenty-five past, the other man said, consulting his own watch. Will we begin soon, Duchess? The woman asked sweetly. I don't know, Maddie said. Ah, uh, well, we must not monopolize you, ma'am. With a light laugh, the woman bowed and drew back. Magnificent decorations. As the couple drifted away, 
Colonel Fane grinned. Regular. Cat party. He was holding his watch, still digging deep in the pocket of his coat. Confound it, look here what I found. There. He pulled his hand free and held it out. Caught in the lining by George. Maddie looked down into his open palm at an opal and pearl filigree ring of distinctive design. Your wedding ring, ma'am, he announced proudly. She frowned at it. Hang me for a half-wit. No wonder I didn't have it at the ceremony. This coat never left London. He lifted her hand and closed her fingers over the ring. There now. Better put it on, so you don't lose it. Maddie had long since given up trying to keep Jervalk's signet on her hand. She bit her lip and then slid the opal onto her finger, where it fit with chance perfection. The tiara had given her a tremendous headache. What anyone saw in this unpleasant form of entertainment, Maddie could not fathom. A huge, hot press of overdressed people with nothing to do but talk to one another at the top of their lungs and drink. The laughter had grown giddy, and people were complaining. She'd been asked five times if His Majesty was expected, and had answered honestly that she didn't know. She suspected that the guests wished to ask much more than that. But either Colonel Fane or Durham, sometimes both, was always at her elbow, fending off the most pointed inquiries with their singular blend of nonsense and wit. She'd learned from Durham's observations, and dedicated herself to brevity in conversation. It didn't seem to work quite as well for her as he'd claimed it did for Jervalks. People looked at her in very peculiar ways, but she told herself that she did not care. She did not wish them to like her, nor befriend her, which was well, because they did not. A tipsy woman in a purple dress pressed up to Mattie from behind, stumbling against her. The lady's gloved hands clung painfully to Mattie's sore arm, while a painted mouth opened and smiled, too close. Pardon me, the lady cried. I am so clumsy. She took Mattie's hand. It is a lovely ball, dear. When is the dancing to begin? I don't know, Mattie said, but her questioner was already gone, leaving a folded note pressed into her hand. She opened it. Upstairs was all it said scribbled unevenly. Maddie didn't know why Jervox could not come for her himself, instead of sending a drunken lady as a messenger, but she told Colonel Fane that she was wanted. He nodded affably, a little worse for all the champagne himself, and escorted her through the crowd to the back stairs. At quarter before one, the vultures arrived. Calvin brought word to Christian that Mr. Manning and Lord Stoneham had entered without announcement. Come to gloat, Christian. Thought. He'd been aware of a subtle outflow of people in the past few minutes. He could hardly blame them. They'd got what they'd come for, a view of him and Maddie, and still the dancing had not begun. The midnight supper was waiting, and people were beginning to look at him and speak in lowered voices. Durham drifted past in the crowd. He smiled holding a glass of champagne above the feathered headdress of a countess who was prattling to Christian about some daughter of hers that. He didn't remember. Durham didn't say anything. With the subtlest of moves he simply shook his head. Christian gave it up. He bowed to the countess and went to look for his wife. Mattie climbed the back stairs alone. On the upper floor, the music from the gallery was much more audible while the sound of the guests faded to a dull roar. She paused in the hall, and then went to the open door of the spare room where she dressed. Jervox? She peeked around the door. At the sight of two of the duke's brothers-in-law, Maddie looked quickly for the duke and did not find him. Ma'am, do come in. We'd like to talk to you. She pushed the door wide. Where is he? The ruddy-faced one leaned over and caught her wrist, drawing her inside. Jervox? Why, downstairs with his guests, I suppose. I don't believe we've ever been properly introduced. He closed the door. I'm Manning. This is Lord Stoneham. Maddie glanced at the other man, who was smoothing over. 
and over at his ample sideburns. He bowed quickly. Let me speak directly to the point, Manning said. We're here to make terms with you. Maddie stood silent. Come, Miss Timms. He put a sarcastic emphasis on her name. You must know by now that this wild grasp at the king isn't going to answer. Still she said nothing. He isn't going to come, ma'am. You've brought that vulgar trinket on your head for nothing, if you thought you purchased his majesty's protection along with it. He is notoriously erratic, my dear. A shrewd cast, and one that might have saved you, but I'm afraid it appears as if it won't. She sank down slowly in a chair, watching him in fascination. Save me? If you thought yourself made safe by quashing all hope of a hearing, then indeed, had the king cared to bestir himself this evening, you were saved, weren't you? But he has not. She clasped her hands in her lap, staring at them, feeling the weight of the tiara on her head. Perhaps, he might come yet. Unlikely. You hold your orchestra silent for nothing. But there's no need to dwell on that. Let us talk business. You wear the tiara, you know what it's worth. You may have it. She kept her head lowered. I don't understand. Miss Timms, I shall lay the facts before you. We have investigated this so-called wedding and discovered your ploy. Farce, I might better call it, since only a man who'd gone simple in the head could possibly have tumbled for a pack of country yokels hired to pound at the door. Maddie's chin came up abruptly. Manning smiled. Ah, yes. We found you out, you see. Hired, to pound at the door? She said in wonder. Spare us your histrionic talents, Miss Timms. We can produce the fellows in court. I take it this damned kid Durham. Is in it with you hand and glove, but what you must realize, ma'am, is that there is no marriage. The law requires the approved Church of England ceremony and no duress. Quite aside from Jervox's incompetence and the sham pursuit, we have a witness who can testify to the irregularity of the ceremony itself. It has a very ugly smell, Miss Timms. Very ugly. There are heavy penalties for the sort of trick you've tried to pull. I hired no one, Maddie said. I don't think to succeed at making Mr. Durham your scapegoat. Your dirty work he may have done, but I'll see to it. I'll see to it personally, Miss Timms, that you suffer all the penalty you deserve, should you push me. Manning, the other one said, with a plaintive note. Let me talk to her. Try to understand, Miss, ah, ma'am. We're awfully upset. We hate dragging this through the mud, but you really ought to think a moment. That's why we're here, you. See. We don't want to carry it all the way, but you're forcing us into such an unpleasant position, with all this spending and these balls and things. Please think about it. What do you want me to think about? Cutting your losses, ma'am, Manning said harshly. And ours? Stoneham added. Don't make us go so far as a public hearing. The family name, ma'am. Have a little pity. Just give him back to us so that we don't have to take it to the courts. Where you will lose everything, Miss Timms. Everything, once he's declared incompetent. And I don't scruple to say that. It is you who tell against his wit the heaviest, his marriage to such as you, and the deranged actions he's taken under your. Power, dismissing Torben, that gun, the tiara, this bungle of debts, this very ball, madam, at such a time. I'll admit that he might fool the casual eye, but all this will come out in court, and then you're gone, with nothing. Except perhaps a place on a convict transport. But we don't want to take it that far. Stoneham pleaded. We're prepared to be generous. Very generous. We'll do anything to avoid a hearing. She shook her head, trying to comprehend. But do ye? Say, you don't want a hearing? Of course we don't want a hearing. And we'll pay you. The tiara, as Manning says. Take that. Why? She was bewildered. 
Miss Timms, I beg you not to waste our time by playing the dunce, Manning said. If you agree not to contest the nullification of the marriage, then we are prepared to let you keep the tiara. Maddie sat still, gazing at him. It can be nullified? Indeed it can. And will be, whether you like it or no. Your only decision is whether or not you wish to be sensible and take what you're offered, or make us wrest it from you by force. I had not thought. She stared into space. Her voice dropped. But can it be nullified? She moistened her lips. After. Ah. The lady blushes. Manning said unpleasantly. The more fool you, then. Did you think a consummation would? Protect you? The marriage was illegally conducted. It was induced by fraud. The duke was not in his right mind. It can be nullified. But you see, you save us going into all that, if you will cooperate. Stoneham said. If you will agree to an annulment, say, on the grounds of non-consummation, it's all much simpler. None of this hearing business. And if you're breeding, which I may sincerely hope for your sake that you're not. Manning added, a stipend can be privately arranged for the child. It's better than you will get in the other circumstance. She stood up suddenly, walking away from them, from their falsehoods and terms and manipulations. She saw herself in the cheval mirror and stood looking at the silver, unfamiliar figure there. You would not have a hearing then, she said, and the stranger in the mirror seemed much more confident and sophisticated than naive Maddie Timms. Are you looking for certain safety from the law, madam? She stared at the silver figure and turned. If I am to agree to a nullification, I must know that there is to be no hearing. Ever. You have our word on it, Stoneham said eagerly. Maddie looked at him and at Manning's sturdy belligerence. They were not friends. She could not trust them. I'm not decided. I will consider it she said. The bald gown swished around her as she turned to leave. Manning caught her arm. You haven't long, madam, he said. My patience with this situation is worn quite thin. She pulled herself free of him, moving toward the door. And don't think to try to spirit him away again, Manning said behind her. I warn you, you'll catch cold at it this time. Asterisk, 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 Christian couldn't find Maddie. As he worked around a chattering couple by slipping into the recess of the bay window, he paused. He looked down at a man standing below in the light of a street lamp. Christian's hand closed convulsively on the drapes. He flung himself back, ramming into a guest behind him. The man began to apologize, but Christian muttered, pushing away, walking into the crowd. It was the ape down there. Christian was having trouble breathing. He plunged through the guests, ignoring the commotion. At the top of the stairs, he grabbed a footman. Outside. The man shaved. The servant blinked at him in confusion. Your grace? Rid of him. He gave the man a shove toward the stairs. With a look of uncertainty, the footman bowed. He turned and descended. Christian watched him go out then pushed back to the window. He looked down. The liveried servant stood talking to one of the guests. Coachman. The man shrugged. No one else stood on the walk. A hand descended on Christian's shoulder. He jerked and swung around on his assailant in berserk reflex, saw it was a whip MP and barely controlled his reaction in time. The man. Smiled and waved his glass of champagne, launching into a voluble discourse on Catholic emancipation. Christian stared at him, unable to master a word. He glanced past the politician and saw the bloodman's back, familiar Quaker coat, terrible, pausing for an instant by the far door, and then passing on through, lost in the crowd. The politician hesitated, squinting at Christian. I say, you look jolly queer, my man. Do you think we had better open this window? Chapter 34 In the cold dimness of the Duke's stable, a row of eight perfectly matched shapes marked the hind stockings of the new team. 
the horses shifted, with alert chinks and deep drafts of air, scenting the intruder as Matty paused, adjusting from the ball noise and the shadows of the garden court to this deeper darkness. The material of her dress caught what small light there was, shimmering. She took her skirt up in her hands and walked to the coach at the end of the aisle, then turned and walked back again, trying to be sure, to find the light and certain answers. It was only another sign of how far she had strayed, that it was so hard to reach a state of inner calm, to listen for the still, small voice. She had lost the way of it. For a long time, she hadn't been to meeting, she hadn't prayed, she knew she had not even really tried. All those nights of worry had been only that, worry and misery, and wishing that things were not what they were. All willful stubborn resistance to the truth. She did not belong here. She had stayed, why? Richard had begged her to leave, her own elders had hinted that she might return, and still she was here. Because Jervox needed her. Because they had made the marriage irrevocable. But he did not need her, and the marriage was not irrevocable. Gradually the arched windows looking out on the alley took shape. The rumps of the cream ponies made dim pale shapes. Beyond them in the row two stalls stood black and empty. As her vision grew sharper, she could see the faint gleam of the town carriage, and the other vehicle beyond that. Something brushed up against her skirt and made her jump, but it was only a cat, purring loudly. Marriage that was no marriage, a wedding that had been a farce, a trick. Quick anger rose in her, and she pulled the opal ring from her finger. It had never left London, Fane had admitted and Maddie remembered, vividly, Jervalk saying that he'd just given it to the colonel before the ceremony. Lies and falsehoods. Hired yokels, to pound at the door. To make her think he was in danger, to use her, to ruin her life because he thought of no one and nothing but himself. He had needed her then, that badly. She stopped at a window and stared out into the mews. The other stables were dark at her level the only light falling down. Onto the cobbles and misty squares from the groom's quarters on the floors above. The marriage could be nullified. She might go home. She might even do him a service by it, removing the terrible stain on his sanity of marriage to a Quaker. They promised no hearing, ever, if she left him. She had felt the hate in Manny. Perhaps she would draw it away with her, the way a fox drew the hunters from her. Young. She paced the aisle again, past the stolid rumps of the horses. She could not trust those men. She could not take their word. That much Jervox's world, Jervox himself, had taught her well. She remembered the night she had left him here, and grown more uneasy every mile until she had turned her back on her father and returned here to find Jervox cornered by them. Surely that disquietude had been the clear voice of God in her heart, telling her what she must do. If she were not here, his legal wife, what was to stop them from trying that again? But if she was not his legal wife, then what was to stop them anyway? How could she ever leave him, knowing what they could do, by force or by law or by guile? How could she stay? She pressed the ring between her cold hands and lifted them to her mouth. How had she come to this, that she loved him outside of all reason and right? Elias Little could tell her. It was because she had run out of the truth into self-will and carnal temptation. She had not turned to friends, she had not listened to Richard's counsel at the coaching inn, she had always and ever taken the part of a wicked and worldly man. But he needed her. But he didn't. Outside, a new lamp flared and the rumbling scrape of a door brought the stable across the way to life. Voices spilled into the alley, and the wide door stood open to a vacant carriage house. A figure that had been invisible sprang into view at the edge of the light and moved into the shadows again, the hooded and shawled outline of a woman. Maddie watched through the window for a moment. What you want? One of the grooms called toward the shadow, and got only a muffled negative in reply. Move along then, he said. Our rig's back. There were always ragged people and beggars in the square. It was one of the painful ironies of this place, 
something that Maddie had not directly confronted. She felt her failure sharply now, a convenient blindness thrown in high relief against the background of the ball, the laden supper table and the drunken laughter. Iron hooves echoed in the alley. The returning carriage clattered down the cobblestone, activating a quiet bustle. Coach lamps reflected against the upstairs window panes. While the driver backed and cornered his pair with a seasoned deafness. When the vehicle was angled halfway toward the door, the footman swung down from behind. He took a lamp from its bracket, carrying extra illumination to the grooms who efficiently unharnessed the team. The frosty puffs of their breath mingled with the horse's steam. One by one, the greys were let off. The grooms came back to grab the shaft, and with a low call and a running heave, pushed together to roll the carriage in. The footman made a quick check around the cobblestones with the lamp, throwing brief light on the beggar woman's silent figure. He didn't seem to notice her. His breath shone bright for an instant as he turned inside and gripped the door handle. The big barrier rumbled closed. The alley lay dark and silent, with only the murmur of the party drifting out over the barren cobbles. Maddie stood at the window. All the heated blood of her pacing had cooled. She shivered even in the shelter of the stable. Though she could not see the beggar, she was powerfully aware of the woman standing invisible in the shadows. Taking a deep breath, Maddie rubbed her cold arms. She unlatched the stable door and let herself out into the alley. The woman rose, coming toward her instantly, as if she had been waiting. What am I to do? she asked. Maddie halted, startled at being addressed so boldly. Art thou hungry? she asked, standing a few feet away. The hooded figure came forward. She too stopped with an equally shocked expression, a girl much younger than Maddie had expected, with fresh plump cheeks and red-rimmed eyes. Oh, she said, dropping a quick curtsy. Forgive me, mum. I didn't mean I thought you. I was told to wait here. Excuse me. She shrank back toward the dark, clutching her bundle close to herself. Art thou hungry? Maddie asked again. Wilt thou come into the kitchen? Oh, no, mum. I was told not to come in. Maddie moved forward, puzzled. Thou needn't fear me. I'm, I am the mistress here. If I say it is all right for thee to come, then it is. The girl suddenly stopped her retreat. Oh, mum, you're the housekeeper? She exclaimed in vast relief. She dropped a curtsy again and came close, holding out a note, still clasping the bundle tight against her. If you please, mum, I was told to go here and say to his grace that the parcel from Mrs. Sutherland is come. Maddie took the note. It was not sealed. The girl held the paper out open to show her the writing. Send the parcel to me, it said, in his conspicuous hand. Oh, Maddie said. Well then, thou must bring it in. There is no need to wait out. A low wail issued from the bundle in the girl's arms. She hiked it up onto her shoulder, crooning softly, and glanced up at Maddie with an apologetic smile. For one moment, Maddie stood motionless. She felt as if she were hung at the top of a great fall, not thinking, not breathing. Then she whispered, From Mrs. Sutherland? The girl curtsied. Yes, Mum. Maddie began to shiver. The cold suddenly took hold of her. She clutched her arms around herself. A parcel? Is that the parcel? Her voice was shaking hard. Is that the parcel? Yes, mum. She smiled again, with a tinge of sadness. Aren't they awful, the knobs, to call it so? It's a sweet little girl. I'm wet nurse. I lost me own boy two months back. This simple confession broke the dreamlike suspension that held Maddie. The fall began, the real fall, a plummeting, nauseating descent into comprehension. 80. Mrs. Sutherland. They had been lovers. They had a child. Are you all right, Mom? The girl asked. 
Maddie blinked. She could not stop the shivers that racked her. Water had come to her eyes. She saw the girl through a slur of light and dark. I'm all right, she said in a ghastly voice. She cleared her throat. I'm all right. They had a baby. He had done with her, with eighty. All his kisses. He knew so much. He knew everything. And Maddie, besotted, bewitched, she had thought it wicked to keep a lock of hair and a miniature. She'd been blind. She was blind and dazzled and utterly lost. She heard the fragile whimper of the child and instead of righteous repugnance felt only a surge of love and pain and misery that drowned her, because it was his, because it belonged to him, and she loved even dishonor and iniquity if it was his. You're colder than us, mum, shaken. So, should we go in then? With a clash like a fire alarm, the stable bell began to ring. Madly, Maddie and the girl both leaped back as lanterns flashed. And grooms seemed to come running from everywhere. The baby began to wail. Behind the girl, a sharp blaze of light appeared at the end of the alley. A pair of horses came trotting under the arch, their riders emblazoned in scarlet and gold, carrying torches, posting ahead of a coach that wheeled smartly around the corner. The coachman was seated on a sumptuous blue and purple hammer cloth, bewigged and epaulette, royally turned out. The king had come. On the front walk, Christian was in a silent tumult, elated and distracted, supporting his majesty's painful progress from the curb to the stairs. Christian was on one side, and Wellington on the other. Wellington, for the love of God. Christian found himself in the middle of politics. He might use the king so the king might use him. Christian hadn't spent much of his concentration on the newspapers, but he'd followed enough to know that strong currents were running and likely to sweep the present ministry away. And there was no other interpretation for a public healing of the breach between George and the Iron Duke than to pave the way for Wellington to assume the premiership. They chose Christian's ball to advertise it, a stroke of brilliant luck, but he had no time for contemplation. He no idea where Maddie had gone. She ought to have been at his side to greet the king at his carriage. She ought to be here now at the door. She ought to be here. God damn her. Where was she? George got one swollen leg up onto the second step, gripping hard on Christian's left arm. Wellington on the king's other side took his turn, bracing his majesty's all-too-majestic bulk. The strong scent of hair oil rose from the shiny curls of George's nutbrown wig, mingling with the heavy perfume of his pocket handkerchief. Christian turned his face away for a covert breath of cold fresh air, and then glanced up. Heady relief flooded him. She was there, standing in the open doorway, with Calvin and a pair of tall footmen behind her. The tiara flashed. Her cheeks were red spots and white, her lips absolutely bloodless. He hoped to God she wasn't going to faint. He grinned at her, to give her courage, and looked down to his work without waiting for a reaction. The royal attendants swarmed forward, and he lost her as they reached the door and George stepped through. The king patted Christian's arm. Thank you, thank you, dear boy. I can make a go of it from. Here, eh? Where's my stick? The king leaned on his cane. There were guests in the hall. Those who knew they had the entree had taken initiative to come downstairs. George shook hands all around, with every sign of pleasure, while Calvin and the footmen kept him discreetly steered toward the room prepared for him. Christian could hear the reaction to Wellington. It rose up the stairs like a breaking wave, turning a dull rumble to a roar. Hang em. Hang em all, the ape and the blood man and Manning and his family. Wellington stood back from the king while his majesty was occupied. Christian, no favorite of this high Tory warhorse hero, felt himself raked by those famous bright blue eyes that had assessed whole battlefields at a glance. The Iron Duke bowed. His majesty commanded me to attend him tonight. I hope it's not an imposition. Christian offered his hand. It is an honor, he said and meant it. 
he saw the other man's quick perception of his speech. I'm different, he added bluntly, judging that Wellington, with his ear in the upper reaches of government, would be no stranger to Christian's debacle in the Lord Chancellor's office. He gave a slight dry smile. You of all. No trial by fire changes. Wellington gave him a hard, quizzical look as they shook hands. Christian endured it. He'd won through his own particular inferno. He didn't reckon he had to look away on account of his politics. Wellington lifted his brows. Any hope of a change in your liberal opinions? Christian shrugged. Wrong fire. The commander snorted. You're your own man, at least. I give you that. He smiled grimly. A visage of fur. It's the only choice in life, eh? Christian opened his hands, indicating the ball around him, his own face of iron. Wellington, no fool, inclined his head with a look of acknowledgement. He put his hand on Christian's shoulder and gripped hard before turning back to the king. George had made the parlor and sofa at last, sinking down with a creak of corset stays. He called to Christian, smiling like a rosy-cheeked obese cherub. Won't you bring your duchess to us? Christian turned. Maddie had been hanging back near the door, half hidden among the guests and court attendants while Lady Coningham and Knighton were seated. He held out his hand. Maddie did not look up at him, but came forward and stood before the king. The hum of conversation in the room grew quiet. Archimedia, Christian said. Duchess of Jervalks. She offered her hand, without nodding or curtsying. I welcome thee here, she said gravely. George gave a burst of a laugh. My dear! A Quaker indeed! They had told me so, but I could scarce believe it. He took her hand, kissed, and then held it. I've a great fondness for your people, a very great fondness. Good, kind, honest people. Schools. Bibles. Banks. You are a credit to them. In a small, steady voice, she said, I must tell thee that I am not esteemed a friend any longer. He patted her hand. Your marriage, is it? Ah, me, the principles of religion are sometimes a weight upon us, are they not? But you have a consolation in this fine husband of yours. He looked past her at Christian. You must remember my friendship, dear boy. I am at your service whenever you choose to call upon me. Christian bowed. It was only with an effort that he kept himself from laughing out loud in elation. The king and Wellington. Damn their eyes, let them try to touch him now. He opened the ball merely by taking Maddie to the head of the room, bowing to the guests and to her, and signaling the maestro to begin. The deuce for excuses and explanations. The whole world could think what they pleased of a duchess who did not dance. There was a moment as they walked off the ballroom floor, while the sets were forming and everyone turned toward the dancing, that Christian found himself and his wife unobserved in the stairway hall. He was so full of success that he gripped her ice-cold hand in his, drew her to him and kissed her amid the sweep of music. He inhaled night air, an island of crisp cleanliness in the heavy, perfumed atmosphere. She had not once looked directly at him, but he didn't care. He felt crazily invulnerable now. He felt that nothing could go wrong. For a grim moment it seemed he'd been mistaken. She was stiff, repulsing him with a sharp withdrawal. He let go of her. She stepped away and looked back at him, his maddy girl, his sparkling wise Athena, silver and beautiful to him even in her astringency. She stared at him through the lashes that turned her green eyes to gold, chaste and sensual at once, setting the current moving fast and hard in his blood. I love you, he said under his breath, the words writing the music. He knew she could not hear them. He didn't want her to. Hear. He didn't want her answer to it, not tonight, his night, when everything, even his flawed self, was a victory. Thou wilt be safe now she asked, standing clear of him. Christian made no move closer. 
The ape, here, he told her. Her hands closed. She made a convulsive step toward him. And stopped. The ape, he said. Doctor, from the madhouse. Calvin found them, skulk bastards, among the guests. Her body was tense, her hands white fists against the silver. Gown. He smiled slyly. Arrested now. Trespassers. Thief. Arrested? Her eyes widened in stupefaction. Cousin Edward, thou hadst him arrested as a thief? Chain up, toss in the watch house. His lip curled in satisfaction at the thought. See how they like it. He could see that she wasn't entirely delighted. She was staring at him with an expression he could not interpret. He shrugged. Maybe tomorrow, maybe a week, withdraw the charges. I'm a better man. For you. Let him go. Something in her face altered. The severity left her. She reached for him, embraced him, her hands rising up and pulling him against her as she lifted her mouth to his. Christian made a sound of excitement and pleasure, answering. She came into his arms with a willingness that shocked him, opened her lips and kissed him frantically, as if. She had never done it before and never would again, as if there were no one to see, no one to stare. He forgot the ball and the music, lost himself in the feel of her, her body against his with a new urgency, a promise that he found himself hard-pressed to postpone. Maddie girl, Maddie. He made himself set her away. He felt his own foolish smile, but he couldn't help it. He was so glad, happier than he ever remembered being in his life. She held her lower lip caught in her teeth, watching him intensely. She looked almost ill with the paleness and color naming in her cheeks. Soon, he said, touching her hot face. First, get rid of the king. He ran his finger down her nose and kissed the tip of it. Then only you and me. She lowered her lashes. Without a word, she slipped her hand from his and turned away to descend the stairs. His majesty, damn him, lingered until six. By that time Christian saw it all through a dizzying haze of exhaustion. He was exhilarated almost to euphoria. He didn't trust himself to do anything properly, but somehow, minute by minute, he got through. Maddie amazed him. A hundred times he looked at her and thought she was beautiful. In her silver simplicity, in her sober grace, she anchored him. He was proud of her. She hadn't curtsied before the king. She hadn't given up her integrity. She didn't fail her honesty or herself one inch. She even spent a half hour talking to Wellington, by God no doubt canvassing him on the political disabilities of nonconformists. The two of them were a pair, both so dignified and serious, she made Christian smile. He could look about him and see any number of women he might have had for a wife, but none he could imagine at his side through this. The devil that she could not dance. It only made her more unique. He kept watching for Manning and Stoneham, but never saw them. It didn't matter. It was only that he would have enjoyed seeing their faces. By dawn, when the last of the carriages rolled away from the door in the frigid light, leaving a house that smelled of stale wine and perfume, he wanted only to lie down and let blessed unconsciousness take him. He watched Calvin close the door and stooped to pick up a broken plume from the floor. Maddie had disappeared some time ago, for that he didn't blame her. He could hardly see his own hands, he was so tired. He climbed the stairs, past the salon where the extra staff had already arrived and begun sweeping. Another floor seemed almost too much, but the dressing. Room where he'd been sleeping for the past month was full of chairs and flowers. His valet appeared from the back stairs. Christian shook his head, dismissing the man. He leaned on the newel post and looked up. One more flight. And Maddie would be there, in the guest room. He wanted to lie down with her and go to sleep. Enough of the strange distance between them. That kiss. His pulse warmed. 
tonight. Actually, it was morning. He smiled to himself, pulled his neckcloth free and climbed the stairs. In the upper hall, a fan of early light spread on the rug from the open guest room door. He hesitated outside it, trying to gather his muzzled wits. It seemed suddenly a little embarrassing, after so long, just to walk in upon her. Perhaps he could pretend that he'd forgotten to order two spare rooms, made up. Perhaps he could just kiss her again, arousing thought, just take her down on the bed and kiss her. The spirit was willing, anyway. He heard a soft female murmur from inside. With an effort, he put his body in motion again, pushing away from the wall. Maddie girl? He looked in the doorway, a little sheepish, without excuse or rationale, not precisely one of the proverbial lords of creation. The guest room, fitted up in stylish feminine taste, was all sunny pink chintz undimmed by any use. In a diminutive puff of an upholstered armchair sat a girl Christian had never seen before. She held a baby, the source of the murmurs, that batted with awkward arms at the ribbons on the girl's cap. For a moment he had the odd sensation that he had walked somehow into the wrong house. The room was unfamiliar, the girl a stranger, and the baby. He gazed at them. Damn! he exclaimed, and went two paces into the room. On the bed lay a metallic shimmer of fabric, Maddie's ball gown. With the tiara and a sealed note atop it. He whirled on the girl. What's the meaning, this? The baby stopped babbling at the sound of his voice. The girl, who had not yet moved, moistened her lips and said, The mistress told me to wait here for your grace. She rose, adjusting the child against her shoulder, and curtsied. This is the little girl, sir. Mrs. Sutherland left yesterday, and said I was to bring her to you. Christian grabbed the note and ripped it open. His right hand was awkward, shaking. He tore the paper half down the middle and then couldn't seem to get the parts together. He couldn't make his brain decipher it. He heard himself making distraught noises and swallowed against the panic, leaning over the dressing table, smoothing the page flat, but the words just slid and tilted as he looked at them. Christian. He read his name. He saw letters that said things, things he didn't want to hear. I must leave thee now. It was wrong. Thy world, the wedding, illegal, nullify. Thy daughter. He closed his eyes, hanging his head over the note. All his breath had left him, like a great blow to his chest. Go out, he said. Next room. Away. Go away. Yes, sir. The girl passed him quickly. He heard a door open and close. Maddie, he thought. Maddie, Maddie. Christian yanked the bell rope. He would go after her. Bring her back. Explain. He started out of the room to the stairs, slamming the door behind him. In the other room, the baby instantly began to wail. The sound stopped him dead. He had a wild thought that it was all a mistake, that Maddie must listen to him if he could say that it was a mistake. The baby was eighties, she ought to have taken it, but there'd been this misunderstanding, unfortunate, unfortunate, misunderstanding. He threw open the bedroom door. The girl looked up wildly as the baby's howl burst on him. I'm sorry! She shifted the child in her lap. I won't let her cry. She's very good, your grace. Her look of terror made him halt on the door sill. Just as abruptly, the wail ceased. The girl had the infant supported, sitting halfway up against her, revealing the small face. The baby whimpered. A pair of tear-filled button eyes gazed at Christian, fixing him with anxious concern. It's... Forehead puckered in a tentative question, like some omnibus. Passenger who's just got down and found himself stranded at the wrong stop and with an uncanny sting of recognition, a revelation, Christian saw his own self. Not in the round, featureless infant face, the indistinct thatch of hair, not in the physical shape of it that could have been any baby in any random cradle. 
What he saw was that small worried bafflement, the dawning knowledge that the world was a strange and capricious place, the slightly foolish, helpless sensation of having perhaps just walked into quicksand. He knew it, that feeling. His hand opened. He let go of the door and took a step nearer. The round, unblinking eyes followed his motion with ardent perplexity. The baby gazed at his shirt front and his black coat, regarding him as if he were an object of great but unfathomable importance. She looked up into his face. And then her sudden smile broke out glowing, the way a lover would turn to discover him in a crowd. You're here! The silent message lit her up like a candle, caught him up instantly in it too. At last you're here! The infant arms flailed, and she began to coo excitedly. Christian backed away, shocked at the sensation that seized him. The deuce take you, he said low, and the baby laughed at him. Sir? His valet's voice behind him made him jerk around. With a wrench, Christian focused on the man. Duchess! He realized that he would have to suffer the whole house knowing. Anger rose in him. When she left, find out. Your grace, the cook said that mistress departed through the kitchen two hours ago and forbid anyone to follow her. Christian knew where she'd gone. To her Quakers, the dark thee thou sober sides who'd been here yesterday. Or to Richard Gill. Silent violence exploded inside him. Let her go, then. Let her go. Let him have her. Christian struck the door with his forearm, sending it slamming back to the wall and bouncing off. The baby began to wail again. Hush, hush, the girl urged, and it screamed louder. She stood up and hiked it onto her shoulder. The infant kept howling. She'll quiet when she's put down, the girl said over the wails. If I could just put her down somewhere. I've been carrying her all the night. Put down then. Christian waved at the bed. There. He reached for the bell rope as she obeyed him. This baby, this damnable baby, Richard Gill, Maddie. Maddie, she wouldn't have to put up with the mules by blows, would she? Pious prick, he wouldn't know how to. Christian flushed with rage, thought, and image freezing him. His, she was his wife. He wouldn't suffer Gill to touch her. He yanked the bell pull. My cloak, he snapped at his valet. Call up the carriage. Beneath one of the long arched showrooms of Butterfield's Lambeth Nursery, flanked by rows of potted flowers, Christian stood waiting, his foot propped on the end of a bench. He leaned on his knee, slapping his riding whip lightly against his leg as the Quaker came toward him down the length of the greenhouse. Gill stopped. Christian did not straighten only looked at him sideways. The last echo of the gardener's footsteps died away down the arched cavern. He returned Christian's look with a restrained, slightly questioning expression, no triumph, no defiance, and Christian knew she was not here. He dropped his eyes, his fingers loosening on the whip. With the tip of it, he nudged between the blossoms of the pink and white carnation, staring in silence at the petals. He had a great urge to cut the whip across, snapping the blooms off all the flowers in reach. He did not do it. He put his head down and rubbed his hand over his eyes. She has left thee, Gil said. Between his fingers, Christian saw only the black silk of his full dress against a background of gay peppermint-striped petals. He moved the whip, stirring the foliage. He thought that the scent of humid soil and carnations must make him ache with shame and anger for the rest of his life. She has not come to me, the Quaker said. Does thee know what meeting she attended? Christian shook his head. I can learn, Gil said. I will send thee notice that she is safe, if thou wish it. Christian felt himself left outside a high wall, the gates closing dark-coated sober figures drawing them shut against him. Maddie girl, he thought helplessly. Maddie. She had gone through of her own will and left him here. He could not learn her ways, 
he could never be the man she would esteem. Evidence enough of that wailed at the top of its lungs in his guest room. His life repelled her. It was this serious God-fearing gardener, this plain modest pursuit of virtue that she wanted. He looked at Gill and thought, you will never make her laugh, will you? You'll be kind and constant and wise, wiser than I am, and she'll respect you. Damn you. Damn you. A better man. Christian threw back his cloak and stood straight. He turned away. He stopped as he pushed open the door, holding the whip and his hat in his hand. She's afraid of thunderstorms, he said, something that Gil might never find out for himself. And ghosts, he thought as he stepped into the early frost, but he did not give Richard Gill that hint. Full morning shone through the crack in the guest room. Curtains, casting a bar of bright light across the bed and the pillows that bolstered the baby. Christian leaned one hand on the bedpost. He glanced at the girl sitting in the corner, noticing for the first time how weary she appeared. Eaten? He asked her softly. I nursed her and cleaned her just a half hour ago, sir. He hadn't even thought of that. You. I meant. She said quietly. Last night. The mistress bade me eat when we come in. Go down now. Oh, sir, I can't leave her alone. I'm here. You, sir? In the darkened room, she looked more than a little dubious. Ten minutes, he said. Eat. She dropped a bow and scurried to the door. Christian closed it. He went to the foot of the bed and stood looking down at the infant as it lay in the middle of the bed on its back. He'd wakened it. The small arms waved and a whimper bid fair to become a cry. Arrangements. Scotland. He'd have to write the Sutherlands. It made him tired to think of it, trying to write. It made him tired just to stand up. The girl seemed responsible. Perhaps she could be paid to escort the child. The whining sound it made rose, like a creaky door, and it began to bawl in earnest. He shoved away from the bed and went to the curtains, pulling them closed so that the bar of bright light vanished. In the deeper darkness, the baby still cried, not screams, but a forlorn buying sort of sound, like a sheep out on the hills. It had only the girl's shawl over top it. He thought the room was cold without a fire and shrugged out of his coat. As he laid it over, the button eyes turned toward him. The crying stopped replaced by that pucker of befuddled worry. He stood back, and it began to sob again. Fed clean, warm, he didn't know what the devil more an infant required. Picking up, perhaps, not that he was going that far. He should have called another maid. He wanted to lie down before his body and his brain collapsed in weariness. He thought of leaving it here. It looked safe enough. He could lie down in the bed next door. The girl would be back in a few minutes. It just kept crying, long, fragile, lost soul sobs. He leaned over it again, trying to see if there was something truly wrong or if this were only some female trick that they all knew from the cradle. It looked at him, weeping as if the whole world were just too miserable to bear. The bed gave beneath his weight, and he sank down onto his elbow. The baby closed its mouth, staring at him with hope and small hiccups. Jesus, he said. He lay down on the bed, pulling the pillow under his head, and drew the whole bundle of coat, shawl, and infant up against his shirt. A tiny hand closed tight on the lace. One sob erupted, and then changed mid-breath to a soft sigh. Women, he thought sardonically, sinking in the bedclothes, with sleep revolving and closing in his head. He moved one finger feeling a cheek as soft as down. What's your name? asked the girl. Remember that. Maddie. It was wrong. I must leave thee now. Don't cry. Don't cry, little girl. I'm so tired. I never deserved you, did I? Maddie, but I loved you. I always loved you. Chapter 35 Elias Little had fetched Papa back. 
It was not thought advisable for Maddie to go on the journey or be brought into contact in any way with the world she had left. She submitted herself to the wisdom of meeting, living retired with the Littles in Kensington until the sublease of the Chelsea house should fall in and she and Papa could return home, for it was conspicuously apparent that they would never be welcome with Cousin Edward again now that he'd finally been released from his ignominious imprisonment. Her father was very subdued. In earlier days, Maddie would have thought he was unwell, he was so quiet, but she knew it was the havoc she had made of his life and her own that oppressed him. He did not even speak much to Elias, almost as if they were somehow set at odds after a lifetime of fraternity. When the solicitor came to consult upon a nullification of the marriage, it was Elias and Constance who sat with her through. The Ordeal of Explanation Papa did not even enter the room. The most difficult part was that she could not do as Jervox's brothers-in-law had wished and say that the marriage had not been consummated. The case must rest upon the irregularity of the marriage itself and the fact that neither side would contest the nullification. Maddie was aware that letters were sent and attorneys advised, but she saw none of them. Elias and the elders directed the worldly business. She had only one task, to write her letter of condemnation of her actions. It was the most difficult thing she had ever done in her life. She had not wept. Since the moment she had left Belgrave Square, she had not. But when she sat down with pen and paper, everything went to a blur, and she could not even see to write. She had attempted it several times, waiting until she felt herself more steady, closeting herself in the late afternoon, rising early in the morning. She even went to write it straight from the silent hours of midweek meeting for worship and drenched the paper with the most copious tears of all. At dinner that night, Elias carved the roast. I was visited by the solicitor today, he said, lifting a piece of meat onto Maddie's plate before he passed it back to her. He has received firm word that the Duke of Jervox does not desire to lay any obstacle in the way of cancelling the error. That was how they spoke of it, as the error. Maddie looked down at the food on her plate. No one said anything. Else. She picked up the old steel cutlery with its white horn. Handles and pushed a bite of meat onto her fork. But she could not eat it. The plain life, the simple waiting upon silence and God, she fit into it so easily again, helping Constance with the washing, attending worship, accompanying the older woman on her visits to the sick and the troubled. Everything was simple. It was right to rise early, work hard, speak little, wrong to be lazy, dishonest, creaturely. Wrong to think about him. She felt at home, and yet remote from home. She did not miss the servants, the carriages, the gilt and rich furnishings. She did not even miss the pretty dresses, when she thought of. How ill she became them compared to the bright-plumed ladies who had danced in Belgrave Square. She only missed one thing and that was a part of her soul left behind. In strange irrational moments, she would suddenly find herself imagining that she ought to help him to button his waistcoat, that he would want her to write out his letters, things he hadn't even needed done for him since her arm had healed. She heard footsteps on the stairs and her head lifted, but they were never brisk enough, impatient enough. She pressed her fingers over the filigree ring, a small stolen treasure, her one theft. She walked the hedgerows and stopped and hugged her arms around herself, her face turned upward to the winter sunset and to him, as if he were there, as if she could feel him again, just once again. But he did not desire to lay any obstacle in the way. She took the bite of roast and made herself swallow. He had needed her, and now he did not. For a little while. Their lives had crossed in time and place and gone apart again. He was the Duke of Jervox. She was a scandal in her meeting. She attended under a cloud of censure, one of them and yet not, her name an item of public interest in the newspapers, causing bitter humiliation to the society. She was grateful that Elias and Constance, and some other weighty friends spoke on her behalf, testifying how she had been in fallacy but had turned from it, and would walk henceforth in the light again and everyone awaited her letter of self-condemnation. 
It was not a thing said aloud, but if the words she wrote were strong enough, if it showed a real and absolute longing to clear truth, friends might be convinced to relent in their disfavor and receive her wholly again into the society. How does that work proceed, John? Constance asked Papa. He rubbed his chin. Slowly. It goes slowly in these latter days, Maddie said. Thou hast not wished me to transcribe for thee. I'm not certain that I intend to publish the paper. She turned toward him. Not publish it. Maddie girl, he said quietly, thou knowest that all the credit is not mine to claim. Not all, but, she stopped. Shall I publish with his name connected? I had not thought thou wouldst like it. He smiled his sweet, sad smile. And to tell truth, I have come across a complication in the proof that is beyond my ability alone. She bent her head over her plate. It was not fair. Papa had spent so long and worked so hard. It should not come to naught because of her mistakes. Wilt thou have some of this Savoy, John? Constance. Changed the subject, helping Papa to the dish. Friend Gil brought it to us this morning. He says that the sea kale has come into the market, at a shilling and sixpence the basket. I wish he'll find us some asparagus, Elias said. Or grow it, alongside those flowers of his. Constance made a little smile. Archimedia must ask him. He will do it for her. Now, Constance, Elias reproved her gently. Thou art beforehand. Constance, unrepentant, put some of the Savoy onto Maddie's plate. It will all be settled happily, she said. I feel in my heart that it will. Hast thou continued to write thy paper, Archimedia? Elias asked. Yes, she said, stirring the Savoy aimlessly on her plate, cutting it across and across again. I am not finished. We will pray together tonight, he said. Perhaps that will help guide thee. Yes, Maddie said. The error would be repaired. He did not wish to put any obstacle in the way of it. She remembered him at that last moment. She would never forget him. Sly confidence, brilliance and command, stars and infinity, a world beyond reach. A bon chat bon rat, below the phoenix rising. Self-possessed, audacious, sanguinary in his revenge. Like. The good cat, lazy and playful, powerful and unforgiving, he turned the table and bedeviled his tormentors, tossed them in jail, almost let them free, withdrew and renewed allegations, had them up to face a grand jury before he liberated them again at his whim. Poor cousin Edward, Maddie thought would never be the same plump secure rat again. He was the Duke of Jervalx. He had lovers. He defeated his affliction by his own strength. You come, he had said to her, so many times. She could almost hear his voice. But it slipped away from her even in imagination, the one last thread that tied her to another life. She would write her paper. It was time. With Elias and Constance after supper, she sat in the austere parlor and listened to the elder's deep resonant voice in prayer. She heard all the things that she should write. Afterwards, she wrote them, without tears. Christian sat with the post, flipping invitations one by one into the fire. He paused at a letter from Scotland and set it aside. He sat looking at it unopened on the desk. Then he broke the seal and read it. He rose and went upstairs. In the yellow room, a cradle had the warmest spot, carefully. Screen from the grate. Jilly glanced up from it. Oh, you're. Grace, she's just woke up and all ready to see you. He nodded. The girl curtsied and left, quietly closing the door behind her. Christian did not go up to the crib. Instead he leaned against the bed, watching from a little distance. Diana had not noticed him. She lay on her back, kicking at her long linen shirt and playing with her feet. She now had a white embroidered cap and tiny beribboned slippers, collars and bibs, a silver rattle, 
a soft ivory brush and comb, all the proper equipment, he was informed by Jilly and the various females in the house. Little girl, he said softly. She turned at the sound of his voice, something that she'd only just learned to do. The bewildered frown creased her forehead as she looked for the source. Christian walked to the top of the crib. She began to smile before he got there, breaking into frenzied batting with her arms and legs when he leaned over her upside down. She squealed with delight when he rubbed his nose against hers. Her fists banged his cheek and jaw. He twitched his head and made a sound each time she hit him, a game she seemed to find rousing. He pulled back and stood over her, offering his forefingers. She grabbed them immediately, arching her head back to look at him. Cold in Scotland? He asked her. She puckered up her forehead quizzically. Warm clothes, he promised. I'll send. Dresses. Money. Some pretty things. Toys for her birthday. He wondered if they would give them to her. He would not be able to write her or hear of her. They made that clear. He was to pay for her support, confidentially, and do nothing that would cause the family further embarrassment. It was the best thing, of course. The best thing for her. To stand aside, silent, as he was standing aside for the nullification of his marriage. That, too, the best thing. He seemed to have become something of an embarrassment to everyone. He pulled his fingers from the baby's grip and went to the door. She turned her head, following his motion. The little pucker of uncertain worry clouded her face the best thing. He looked back at her in dumb despair and silently closed the door. Twelfth night came and went, with no cake or games. He found reasons to put off sending Diana, the holiday, the weather, the need for a few more warm clothes. She had a wardrobe that any femme fatale might envy, created by her own modiste, the cook's sister's cousin, in consultation with Cook and Jilly. Calvin had contributed a length of embroidered muslin that had somehow leaped into his basket while he was ordering the spring liveries. Durham brought blue ribbons to match her eyes. Christian drove slowly down Oxford Street at night and made the carriage wait on him as he walked among the gaslights, buying shawls and wool and velvet. He did not want her to be cold. Above all, he did not want her to be cold. When it became obvious even to him that no infant could possibly make use of so many clothes at once, Jilly packed the lengths of fabric away in a trunk. Christian thought he ought to look into arranging for a post-chaise and escort for the journey north, and didn't find the opportunity. On a day in January, Calvin brought an unkempt boy into the library, where he stood chafing at his fingerless mittens while the butler said solemnly, A young person, your grace, from the Lancastrian school, to speak to you. Please, sir, the boy said before Christian had done more than lift his eyebrows. I'm a monitor at the school. Friend Tims teaches us arithmetic. I'm to say from him that, he closed his eyes to recite. I would ask a moment of thy time to scrutinize a problem. May I come to thee? The boy opened his eyes. And if the duke says no, then I'm to beg pardon for friend Tim's and go right away. And if the duke says yes, he may come, then I'm to tell him that friend Tim's teaches on fourth day, that's Wednesday, sir. And friend Tim's can call after that in Belgrave Square at two. That's the only time he can come alone, and the duke will know why. And that's all, sir. He let go of a breath, relaxing his hands. Christian had been doing nothing, just sitting and watching. The blank wall of the garden court. Inside him, a small bittersweet spark came alive. You go the coach house, he said to the boy. Look at the carriage. Remember it. Wednesday at two o'clock, it waits near the school. You find. You take Mr. Timms to it, so it brings to me. Yes, sir. The boy bobbed his head. Christian felt nervous as a girl as Calvin ushered Tims into the library and got him settled. You're well? he asked, standing back aloof when the butler departed. Under the low brim of his beaver hat, 
Tim's turned toward the sound of Christian's voice. I am well in body, he said evenly. Christian could not tell if there was accusation in his tone. He worked the fingers of his right hand. The room seemed to grow heavy with silence. And Maddie? he asked very low. Her father smiled faintly and shook his head. I do not know. Christian walked to the desk where Tim sat and pulled up the chair on the other side. What problem do you want me to look at? Tim's had brought no papers or carved figures. He briefly described an equation so straightforward that Christian didn't even have to write it down. He suggested an obvious redefinition of the problematic variable. Ah. Tim's gave another faint smile, as if the answer were more ironic than pleasing. Of course. Christian waited for the other man to present his real challenge. Tim said nothing. You never came, only for that, Christian said at last. I thought it might take a little longer, Tim said wryly. So Christian would have wished. He asked the paper. Goes otherwise? I have not made progress, Tim said. I fear I was much caught up in thy fine mathematical library at the castle and indulged myself there. Will you stay to dinner? I cannot. My daughter does not know that I am come here. Christian pushed away from the desk suddenly. He walked to the window. She would be angry. Not angry, perhaps. I don't wish to distress her further. Distressed? He closed his eyes. Tomorrow is monthly meeting. She's to read her paper there. Meeting has required that she send a copy also to the newspapers and thy friend Durham, that performed the marriage. Christian turned his head. Her paper, he said. What paper? Tim's rose, his hands resting lightly on the edge of the desk. Come thee to meeting, friend, he said, and thou wilt hear. Maddie walked every morning with Constance to the workhouse, where they took food to the old ladies and the children. She went this morning just like any of the others, though it was the day of her disgrace, when she was to be censured in meeting. Their route was along the back of the village, past fields and nurseries. Across a plot of winter-plowed soil, a strange image. Was visible well before they reached the institution, at the corner where the lane turned into the workhouse court. The Jersey cow was tied to its barren tree, munching at a pile of hay, a daily sight on the spot. But today, in the middle of the dirt lane next to it stood two bewigged footmen in white. Livery, flanking the bizarre apparition of Lady de Marley seated in a gilded chair, her feet placed delicately upon a matching stool. A closed carriage waited beyond, completely blocking the way past. Constance only said, What can this be? and kept walking toward the waiting troop. Maddie's feet went slower and slower. She finally stopped, twenty yards from the barricade. I think I must go back. Constance looked at Maddie, her round, soft face as tranquil as the Jersey cows. It is only worldly persecution, she said, so calm that Maddie took courage. We will simply walk on. They continued, coming closer to Lady de Marley, until Maddie could see the carved jade bottle of salts that lay in the old lady's lap. How very touching! The aged voice rang clear and hard in the empty air. We're going about our little charities, are we? Maddie made no answer. She started to swerve past, but a footman stepped into her path. We will speak, Duchess, Lady de Marley said. Here and now or at another imminent time and place. Maddie moved away from the footman. I am not a duchess. No. Twould appear you are a coward merely. The duke's aunt was wrapped in rich shawls, her lap covered by a fine woolen rug, her hands thrust into a sable muff. Come, Archimedia, Constance said, turning to the side. Why not let her listen? Lady de Marley asked. If I'm the devil come to tempt her, is she not strong enough to resist? Thou art not the devil, but only another trouble to her, Constance said. 
She has trials enough to bear today. No. Maddie was stung by the suggestion that anything Lady de Marley could possibly offer as temptation might be enough to overcome her vocation as a decided friend. Let her speak, then. She has nothing to say that will disturb me. Jervox is not well, Lady de Marley murmured. Maddie turned quickly, her throat closing. Not well? Lady de Marley chuckled. And you say I can't disturb you? Blood prickled in Maddie's cheeks. She felt it rush in her head, a beating fever that was too visible. It is by the grace within her that Archimedia is concerned for the welfare of a fellow creature, Constance said. Is it indeed? Lady de Marley commented, with dry amusement. She leaned forward, adjusting a shawl behind herself in her gilt chair. He's well enough, girl, well enough to. Damn my eyes for a meddler. I had to locate you on my own resources. You know what my interest is. She fixed Maddie with a penetrating eye. Is there any expectation? Maddie understood her. She thought of the parcel, the bundle in the girl's arms, his own blood, left to bide in an alley. But such a child as that would not answer for what Lady de Marley demanded. No, she said briefly. Absolutely. The old woman gazed long at her. Then her mouth pursed, and she sighed. Well then, that is that, I suppose. I am moved to speak truth to thee, Constance said with a firm pitch in her voice. Whilst I earnestly desire that all blessings may come to thee and thine, I would have thee understand that this marriage was an ill-done thing. A terrible thing, to force our comedia to wed out of unity. I would have thee know what courage it has taken, and will take, for her to return to her covenant with God. Ah, yes. Lady de Marley nodded toward their baskets. Carrying your little loaves and fishes to the poor. Thou mockest what thou dost not understand. No doubt you know God's mind better than I. Lady de Marley replied, but I understand your Archimedia pretty well. She's no courageous saint. She looked at Maddie. Are you, girl? Not at all. You're only afraid of the real task that God chose to set on. Your plate. She pulled her hand from her muff and groped for. Her stick, poking it at Maddie's basket. This doesn't take much thought, does it? A kindly gesture, oh yes, but does it put men folk to work? It is for children, and the elderly. I have not the means to put men to work, Maddie said, or I should do it. Oh, you foolish girl. You foolish girl. You don't know what you had. You were too afraid to take your hands down from your eyes and look. She carefully set her feet on the dirt and pushed herself up. The footman moved swiftly forward and supported her to the carriage door. She stopped and turned. Back to Maddie, leaning on her stick. You will feed how many? Ten out of those basins. Think of it, girl. When you might have fed ten thousand, if you'd only had the nerve. Will you go to Brooks's with us? Durham came up the stairs two at a time. He dangled a tiny mirror tied to a string. For the ravishing Diana. He handed it to Christian, following him into the guest room. The ladies like to get an early start on their toilette. What do you say? Feigns to meet me as soon as he's off duty. Christian tried out the mirror on Diana. She burbled and grabbed it. He played tug of war with her. Not today, he said. When? Durham said. He strolled to the window and leaned on it looking out. Someday, do you think? There was a definite you-can't-put-it-off-forever tone under his lightness. Not today, Christian repeated. He looked sideways. Durham, you had a letter from Maddie? His friend ceased the restless tapping of his fist against the shudder. He didn't turn around. Something. Yes, I think I had something he said vaguely. Something? Some sort of letter. I don't know. Certain you don't want to go to Brooks's, old man? 
Tell me what it said. Durham was still looking out the window. A lot of spiritual this and that. Very Quakerly. I didn't really read it too closely. Quakerly? Listen, it was a rubbishing letter. I'm off if you don't think you'll come. She reads it out today to Quakers. And it goes in. Newspapers. Durham turned from the window. Then, old man, I'd heartily advise you not to purchase a paper. His expression belied his flippant tone. Thrusting his hands in his pockets, he walked out of the room. Come along to the club, if you should change your mind. Chapter 36 Christian had let himself in the door hardly knowing what to expect. An inquisition, a tribunal, some silent worshipful gathering. What he found was rather more like a restrained board meeting without a chairman. In the large stark room they sat on benches and took no votes. Anyone appeared welcome to speak. Clumping and shuffling echoed off the floorboards and the roof as members stood up one by one to intonate their feelings. And then at length someone would make a statement that drew general approval and it went down in the record. Christian had not sat, but remained by the door. The row of men on the raised dais across the front of the room had looked askance at him when he'd entered. None moved to evict him, but one continued to stare at him gravely. He recognized the head of the dower group who'd come to see her at his house. Christian stared back, not moving. There was only one female present. She sat alone on one of the forward benches, just below the dais, facing front, a white. Bonnet and shawl over black, anonymous. Finally a lull came in the meeting house, with only the scratch of the secretary's pen as he completed the latest minute. Is our comedia Tims in attendance? A quiet voice asked. Christian felt a sinking scarcity of breath as she rose. He could not see her face, but she was shaking. From where he was, he could tell it. She stood with her head bowed, her back to the room. Archimedia Timms, one of the men in the front gallery intoned, Thou hast been summoned here in the matter of thy marriage by a priest to one of the world, and certain other miscarriages. Friends have asked thee to clear truth by writing a paper of condemnation of thy actions. The congregation made a soft noise of agreement. I ask thee now to read it out, someone said from the pews. Christian took hold of the framing of the door behind him gripping it hard. With her head still down, she lifted the paper in her hands and began reading, her voice trembling and low, unintelligible except for the sound of it, a sound so familiar and sweet that he felt it like a physical ache. Friend, a man in the back complained loudly, thee must turn and speak clear. She was still for a moment. Then she turned to the room. I do not doubt, she said downward, and then, as if determining to face them truly, she lifted her eyes. Over the heads of the congregation, her look came instantly to meet his. Her lips had parted to speak, but she did not. Light from the high round windows fell down on her, white bloodless stillness. He looked at her, defiant. Say it, he thought. Say it to me, if you can say it to them. She seemed to lose the sense of things. Her gaze faltered away from him. She cast an unsteady glance back and forth over the rows between them, a hunted, searching look, as if she thought she would see something, as if she could not recall what she was to do. Archimedia. The large, low-voiced man who'd visited her spoke. Thou must go on. The paper lay in one of her slack hands, resting against her black skirt. She lifted it. It shuddered like a broken bird's wing as she looked down at it blindly. I do not doubt, she said in a shaking voice. She stopped and visibly gathered herself. I do not doubt, it's being right for me to suffer, and I am content that it should be so. She raised her head and her voice came clearer. For it is awful to me, that though I have walked among friends I was not one of them, for if I had been, I would never have done this thing, and if I had taken counsel. Of the Lord or of friends, I would not have done it. She wet. Her lips. 
her words took on a new, higher quaver. When I was in the steeple house before the false minister, I said there that I had received a charge from the Lord to love him, and I called him husband, but that was contrary to truth, and when I was there I said I was his wife, but that was contrary to truth, also. She was gazing now at a back corner of the room, a distant look, away from the paper, away from him. Tears began to slide down her cheeks. I knew when I had done it that I had done a dreadful thing, she said, and that I ought to disown it, and I told him so, but I had not the courage to act even when the light from above seemed to beat upon me. The visitation was strong, but my will was stronger. I, she paused. She was weeping openly, standing before them all, a single lonely figure with the paper slowly disintegrating in her restless hands. She pressed her lips hard together, and her gaze wandered up to the ceiling and down to the floor and everywhere but at anyone who watched her. I went, she said in a slender voice, to his house and lived in it an abandoned woman. Christian made a sound, letting go of the wood and stepping forward, but she did not stop. Among luxuries and selfish, earthly satisfactions and comforts, and even when I knew that I was not married in truth, and was steeped in the sins of fornication and carnal pleasure, still my will was stronger, and I could not and would not comply with gospel order, but ran further into the enemy's snare, and returned to him even as I tried to free myself by withdrawing to my father. Christian was shaking his head. He looked at her, willing. Her to look back at him, shaking and shaking his head no. I have said often in my heart that I loved him, and that it must be truth, but it was an illusion of imagination or the suggestion of Satan and not the blessed influence of the Holy Spirit, she said, going on relentlessly in that high quivering tone. And I know that to be so because I had a sense that I was doing what I should not, and when I saw friends afterward I was ashamed to look on them. She stood with tears streaming. And I am sorry. I am unworthy. I have disowned this thing I did and I beg friends will not cast me off, for I have turned my back on him. She blinked, an empty look at nothing. I feel deeply the weakness of my nature. She bowed her head. And I wish now to sink down in the light and live according to truth. Truth! Christian exclaimed, the word ringing loud in the silence. He made her look at him at last, she and everyone else. He stood square in front of the door, out of place, dressed wrong, angry, humiliated. Only Maddie was as human as he amidst the rows of sober faces. Truth! He shouted, staring at her, a mindless echo of himself, the only word that came. His voice went around and around the bare cavern of the room. Upon the gallery, the low-voiced man rose. Friend, he said to Christian, we feel a tender compassion toward thee, but we must inform thee that thou art out of the divine life and an intruder upon this meeting. Another stood in the pews. It was Richard Gill. We desire thee to depart. Christian gave a wild laugh. He walked down the center aisle and snatched the tattered sheet from Maddie's hands. Who wrote this? He held it before her in his fist. She looked at him as if he were a delusion, as if he spoke in some mad babble that she could not understand. Her expression enraged him. Blank scared pain, stupid weak, not you, not maddy girl, lies lies lies. He glared back with the paper crushed in his hand, felt the Quakers behind him, saw her in front of him, standing there lying false pious speech wrong. Wrong. He had to tell her that. He tried to tell her and hit the wall, the bars, the jacket and chains and words throttled before they ever got to his throat, words imprisoned in his brain. It happened. He lost it. He'd known it would vanish when he most needed it. They were staring. He was a circus freak shrinking shriveling can't talk lunatic Quaker's judgment thee thou stare. But in his furious desperation he held his ground. He stood there pulsating with shame and ferocity breathing like a jungle creature, a miserable mad idiot standing in front of them. Quakers. Quakers' pious Richard Gill. Better! The word slammed through a shout. 
he spread his arms. Look. Me. Can't talk, sinner. His voice battered the bare walls of the room as he pointed at Gil. Think he's... Better? He sneered at the meal. Thank you, so holy. Deserve my wife? Turning his back, he lifted the paper toward the solemn men in the galley. Who wrote this? You. He brandished it at the sober faces. Or you? Not her. Not her, say I'm enemy. Christian shook his head and made a disbelieving groan. Maddie. Fornication? He was halfway between a laugh and tears. I called it love for you. Before God. Love, honor, my wife, cherish all my days. I said it. Still truth, Maddie. Still the truth, in me and always. She stared at him, standing straight and fixed. The tears dripped down her face. Help me! He shouted at her, at the blank weeping facade of her. God, a charge, love. No rule but love. Duchess. Her lips moved. She moistened them. Think not? He demanded. Think you're a meek, mild little Quaker? His reckless laugh at that echoed to the rafters. Stubborn self-will, pride-opinionated liar. Won't curtsy to the king, damn you. Walk in man-man's cell, head up, no fear. I could have killed you, Maddie. Killed you a hundred times. It was an opening, she whispered. It was you, he said. Duchess. You took me out of there. You married Duke. You said, no powder on the footmen. He pointed at the floor. You tell me now, go down on my knees and I will do it. The devil's gift. His mouth curled. Not pearls, flowers, gowns. Something unholy in truth. I give you, selfish, arrogant bastard, what I am and all I can do. I give you, my daughter, because I'll keep her. Because I'll ruin her name to please myself, because only. You, only you, Duchess. Understand why I do it. Because only you can teach her courage enough, teach her not to care, the scorn, what they say. Only you can teach her to be like you. A duchess. He opened his hand and let the paper fall to the floor. A duchess inside. With one sweeping fierce look at the rows of Quakers, he turned away and strode down the aisle. He stopped at the door and looked back. I'll wait outside, five minutes. He snarled. You come! Or never! Across from the meeting house, in the shadows of a small churchyard, a tree and some old graves squeezed between buildings, Christian held to the railing. He was still shaking. The reaction had hit him the instant he'd walked out of the door, wild after effect, outrage and dread coursing through his veins. Traffic bustled in the street. Only the tiny churchyard and the meeting house stood without life and motion, facing one another like islands of hush amid turmoil. He waited much longer than five minutes. He waited, with diminishing hope, for full an hour, and then too, knowing he should go, knowing the futility of issuing stupid ultimatums, finally knowing that, foolishly, he was waiting for a glimpse of her, one glimpse. Just one more before she was gone beyond his reach. Gripping the rail, he watched the traffic press on in a businesslike stream. A canvas-covered wagon lumbered along, drawn by two oxen, in no hurry, but plowing steadily forward. When it had moved past, he saw her standing on the steps of the meeting house. The iron points of the railing made blunt pain against his thumbs. No one else came out. He frowned, unable to be sure of her expression beneath the bonnet, only certain that she was alone. She seemed to search, turning to look up and down the street. He saw her descend the steps and walk toward him. A paralysis seized his limbs. He only watched her. He could not move or speak as she stopped at the curb, waiting for a gig to rattle past. She picked up her skirt and crossed the street. 
He pressed his palms down on the pointed shafts. The wrought iron separated him from her as she stopped on the walkway. She lifted her face. It was marked with tears, but without sadness. In the little dusk of the churchyard, the white brim of her bonnet seemed to catch the light and make her glow. A terrible uncertainty rushed over him. He let go of the railing and walked a few feet away, back into the churchyard. He didn't want to know. He didn't want to hear that the source of that illumination in her was in accord with her Quaker meeting. The child. His voice came out harsh, echoing an alien in the narrow churchyard. Eighties and mine. He looked up at her with a curve of his lips that was not. Humor. That is, what's called, fornication. Yes, she said, standing still on the outside of the railing. He felt a compulsion to tell it all, every skeleton in his cupboard, so that she could not say he was false again. He looked down on the faded lettering of a marble slab. Sutherland, the family knows, she's mine. They don't like it, but they will, take her. He shrugged. She has a pedigree. She does not ever need to know. He smiled fiercely at the gravestone. If I am the unnamed benefactor. He could not look at her. It was too hard. His shame, his mistakes, his sins. He had driven her away with them long before he had ever met her. She was luminous and calm, unworldly. The aura of tranquility about her made him bleed inside. Thou wilt keep her? My daughter, he said bitterly. My bastard daughter. As well brand her, by name. Yes, she said. But thou wilt keep her? He bent his head. An unexpected strangeness gripped his chest. The lichens on the gravestone began to slide into the letters. He blinked and laughed. I just think. She'll be cold, and they won't care. From where he stood the sound of traffic was like a distant grinding, queerly softened, as if from some other world. I didn't know. It would be so hard. He wiped the heels of his hands over his eyes. Maddie. With the jar of the gate latch, she came inside. She walked to. The tree and stood before him, serene and upright, a fine ruthless angel. She would come to tell him, of course. She would not shrink from it or slip away quietly just to save him pain. They will. Have you stay a Quaker? He asked dully. Your paper passed? It was not truth, she said simply. And I have come to thee. The sound of everything still receded, falling away and away from him. To me? He repeated numbly. Her mouth took on a faint wry curve. Thou art my husband and I am thy wife, help meet, with no rule but love between us. She touched his sleeve, lightly, like a schoolteacher's admonishment. I will repeat that last part to thee every morning. He caught her hand, gripped it. The words in him were like birds dashing themselves against glass. If thou wilt have me, she said at last in the silence, diffidently. My paper, I stayed to rewrite it, and read it again, to speak the real truth that we have no resource but our Lord and Master who speaks to our souls by His Spirit, and He alone can determine for us what our service shall be, and when, and where, and how it shall be performed. Her fingers twisted in his. She lifted her eyelashes. It's been longer than thy five minutes. He still had no command of himself, no way to answer but to go down on his knees and press his face against her body. With a groan that was yes and yes and I love you and are you. Sure? He felt her fingers push through his hair. She lowered. Herself, sitting on the marble slab, her hands on either side of his face. Her eyes were level with his. Not Gil? He asked painfully. Not better man. She watched her hands as she smoothed his hair. When she didn't answer... He made a low, miserable growl, shaking her slightly. Thou hast not guessed it yet. She smiled. 
I fear I'm only good enough to be thy duchess. You make me better. Oh, I will try. She played with a lock at his temple. But thou art the duke, a bad wicked man, and I love thee too well to make thee something different. Bad wicked idiot, he said wryly. No, she said. A star that I could only look up and wonder at. Thou perceivest my true covetous nature. I'm glad thou fell, and I can hold thee in my hands. He gave a hoarse laugh. Tinsel, star. He looked down at her lap. Don't deserve you, Maddie, but too reprobate to give you up. There, she said. We are equal in selfish iniquity. He laughed again, ironically. Not quite. Not quite, Maddie girl. He found his fingers locked with hers and the ambush of stinging heat in his chest and eyes. After a little silence, she said, What is thy daughter's name? Diana. He swallowed and cleared his throat. Diana. Leslie Sutherland. The her family christened her. He shook. His head. He was still staring at her lap. Maddie. Do you understand how it will be? They will look down. Talk about her. About you. They will be cruel. She made a little disdainful flick of her fingers. I will teach her how to care for such worldly trifles. He lifted his head. Will you? Oh, yes, she said with a peaceful certainty. A strained laugh escaped him. Upside down, Maddie. You turn my world upside down. She lowered her eyes. Her fingers found his again and slid between them. And thee with me. She held their hands together. I've been afraid of that. That with thy kisses thou canst make me wanton. And jealous and fearful that thou wilt not save them all for me. He looked at her pink cheeks. Her lower lip worried between her teeth and saw that she was serious. He leaned forward, his lips close to hers. Maddie, he whispered. He brushed the corner of her mouth. Her hands gripped his hard. She turned her head and met his kiss with sudden greedy recklessness, unschooled and ardent. He pulled her toward him until their bodies pressed together and her legs enclosed him. He searched deep inside her mouth and felt her respond zealously, just as fervent in her passions as in her virtues, little thee thou duchess. She made him smile, a hard thing to do in the midst of a highly erotic kiss. He had to break away and lower his face. Her back stiffened. Thou art laughing at me, she said, trying to pull her hands free. Loving you? He retained them, grinning at her changing his method to light butterfly touches of his tongue across the soft curve of her chin and cheek beneath her bonnet. Kiss you. He caught the tie and tugged it loose, tossing the stiff cap away. My love. He held her cheeks between his palms. My sweet. Life. Three horses own, two coaches, velvet, chambers. Cushions, bed, my kisses. All my kisses. All to be for thee alone. Epilogue Having missed their Christmas dinner last year, the tenants of Jervalk's castle appeared determined to double their celebration for this one, and the duke full glad to triple it. In the great hall, two days before Christmas, on a wooden floor put down over the stone, it was feasting, drinking, music, dancing, reveling and kissing from noon until half-past midnight. Even Maddie was put up to dance, against her laughing protests, carried bodily onto the floor and left there in the center, with Gervaults facing her. He led her through the stately steps of a quadrille with Durham and Lady de Marley, to music and vast merriment, but it was friendly laughter, growing to a roar when Gervaults took her by the shoulder and the top of the head like a solemn puppet master and rotated her back from a turn the wrong way. At the end of it, he bowed to her. Maddie, with a shy smile, put out her hand to shake his. He accepted it gravely, and then pulled her up to him and kissed her in the middle of the hall. And everyone, 
with frenzied applause and music beating in her ears. A long, hard branding kiss, a hot silence of their own amid the clamor. No, he murmured next to her ear. We make a graceful exit. She kissed her papa, and even got a peck on the cheek from each of the duke's family, his mother, his sisters, and from Lady de Marley a snapping complaint that it was high time the duke and duchess withdrew. Maddie had allowed this nonsense to go on much too long. They left her tapping her stick to the music and leaning over to Papa, informing him that he was old and ought to go to bed. Come with me, Christian said to Maddie, leading her away from the staircase out the other end of the hall. Maddie went gladly. All the passages were lit with flaming torches, smoky and bright until she and Christian came to the quiet apartment set aside as a nursery. He opened the door softly. Jilly sat up in the anteroom with a shielded lamp, all dressed and hopeful. She jumped to her feet and curtsied. Christian nodded at her, and she broke into a grin and curtsied again, hurrying out of the room to join the party. When she was gone, Maddie watched him look through the open door into the darkened bedroom beyond. she tried, in the past year, to live according to the light, even amid the grandeur and luxury, and found in full Lady de Marley's meaning when she'd spoken of nerve and courage. It had not seemed difficult, on a small income, to know what was right to do. She'd kept enough for her and Papa to live upon, and what little was left, and it was little, went to collection and meeting. Now, with so much, it was daily a decision— what was necessary, what was frivolous, one might dismiss half the footmen, but as Jervalks noted dryly, he would then be paying for their support on the parish. It was so much gray, so little black and white, for a year she'd spent more of her time questioning herself and how she lived in truth than she had. Done altogether in her life. She had her own projects, and the ones she had pressed upon Christian, his good works, he called them, winking at her as he wrote the checks, huge stunning checks that were a weight of responsibility she quailed under. But it was not all uncertainty. She had her one confidence, the service that she knew with every fiber of her heart she'd done as it had been meant to be done. Whatever the future, whatever the world might call disgrace, Diana was a gift, and if she grew up seeing what was in Christian's face as he looked in on her asleep, she would always believe it. He pulled the door close to a crack and came back to Maddie. The distracted cast had vanished from his eyes somewhere in the year gone, so gradually that she could not tell when. He was not what he'd been, to his own agonized impatience, meaning, Maddie thought wryly, that what had used to take him a moment to analyze or say or decide now. Took him too, and he could only deal with one topic instead. Of several at a time but he looked at her with full perception. She did not appear to confuse him at all as he carefully released the pearls in her hair and took down the braids. He drew his fingers in a whisper across her cheeks and down her bare arms. I've seen this gown before, he murmured. One ball gown is enough, she said firmly, as he worked at the hooks of the silver dress. But think of the starving seamstresses. Thou shouldst not mock. It's true that many starve. So don't order a new dress, he said into the curve of her shoulder. Just send them, some of my money. She put her hand against his cheek, feeling the hard shape of it. Better that thou shouldst speak to the government, and pass a law to see them fairly paid. He lifted his head. Of course. I'll pass a law. How simple, in the land of free trade. She smiled at him, tracing the faint scratchy groove of muscle from his cheek to his mouth. I have some numbers from. He put his face down against her throat and groaned. We'll speak of it tomorrow, she said. He groaned again, slipping his hands up beneath her breasts, pushing her backward. Jilly's bed was narrow and soft. When he kissed her, she forgot gowns and laws. When he came into her she held him hard and close. This was hers, outside of all worldly concerns. This was sweet unity and kinship, her charge to love, strong and overflowing joy in every part of it. 
In the dawn of Christmas Eve day, the great hall was a disaster of littered benches, burned out candles, fading mistletoe and dragging red ribbons. The yule log still burned in the mammoth fireplace, warming a deserted room. Christian smiled at Maddie's exasperated face when she caught sight of Devil atop the long table, gnawing on a ham hock trapped between his front paws. Cass was demurely lapping at melted ice in the big silver wine cooler that stood in the middle of the floor. He whistled. Cass came, but Devil only looked up at him and went back to work. What dog is that? Maddie asked in surprise. Christian turned. On the hearth lay a huge staghound, its rough gray fur almost lost against the daylit silvery stone. He took her around the waist and guided her toward the staircase. Just a dog. I never saw it before. It doesn't come in often. Oh. She mounted the step, glancing back. I suppose someone let it in last night. It's certainly a large animal. A good dog, he said, following her. Never bites. Loves children. Ah. Maybe when Diana is a little bigger. She yawned. She could have it for a pony. Christian stopped, pulling her against him. He leaned back on the curving wall of the stairwell. As he bent his head to kiss his wife, he could just see beyond her to the hearth. The staghound rose. It stretched and turned to glance at him for a moment. He closed his eyes in the kiss. When he looked up, there was a flash of plumed tail disappearing from view, devil's or. Cass's or imagination, it was impossible to tell. But Christian knew. Maddie stood in his arms, her cheeks flushed, bemused and sleepy-eyed. She leaned her head against his chest and yawned again. He smiled down at her. He knew. A buffle-headed bad wicked man he might be but he could recognize a miracle when he saw one.